episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with that master detective, his old friend Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to tell you about a little present I've got for you. Uh Uh-huh, a present and it's free. It's a swell rebel color and it's good for two years, 1945 and 46. Two loads of swell recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Want to know how to make spare ribs that are out of this world? You want to learn a new way to fix liver and onions. A swell way to make soup more delicious than ever. It's a cinch with this calendar handy in your kitchen to tell you how. In fact, this calendar tells you all you ought to know about wine. And remember, it's free. Just write to Petri Wine. P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. We'll send you your swell recipe calendar immediately. And now for our weekly visit with the genial Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and settle yourself down. Thank you. You're looking particularly comfortable tonight, Doctor. Feet up on the sofa and the puppies asleep on your lap. Yes, my boy. The three of us went for a long walk on the beach this afternoon. Monty and Winnie had a running battle with the seagulls. Ever since we got home. Oh, I hope you're not too tired, Doctor. I'm counting on a new Sherlock Holmes story, you know. No, no, no. I'm all ready for you, Mr. Foreman. In fact... I was going through my notes on the case just before you arrived. Well, last week you told us it concerned a strange society who held their meetings in an underground vault of a furniture warehouse. Yeah, that's right. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. The story really began one stormy November night in 1887. I was married at the time and living away from Baker Street. On this night in question, my wife had already gone to bed and I was nodding in front of the fire over one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. I'd had a very tiring day, I remember. It was about the hour that a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. When suddenly, my front doorbell jangled discordantly. Oh, our servant Edna had gone up to bed, so I crossed to the window and opened it. It was uh, very dark, but I could just see the outline of a figure standing on my doorstep. It looked like a woman... Suddenly, a cultivated voice called up to me. Is the doctor in? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, I'm the doctor. Then please come at once. It's a matter of life and death. I have a carriage waiting. Gracious me. Oh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll be down immediately. I closed the window, scribbled a note to my wife, grabbed my coat and hat and my bag, and a few minutes later, I stepped out of the front door and closed it behind me. A carriage was standing at the curb. But I couldn't see any trace of a lady who'd called me. The only person in sight was an old and repulsive-looking bigger woman, dressed in rags and tatters. After a moment of bewilderment, I spoke. Uh, my good woman, did you see a lady leave here a moment ago? No, Doctor, she didn't leave. She's still waiting for you. Oh, Oh, forgive me, madam, but uh, (laughs) those clothes are yours are... I thought you were a beggar woman. There isn't any time to discuss that now. Please get in this carriage. Mm-hmm. But uh, where, where's the driver? I'm going to drive. Please get in. Very well, very well. It's only business. Uh, are you sure that you can handle those horses, madam? Of course I can. You tell me the way you're, you're driving, ma'am. Please don't ask me any more questions, doctor. You'll find out soon enough. Thank heavens we've finally reached our destination. I've still driven halfway across London. Oh, well, hello, must be somewhere down near the river. No dwelling places here. Nothing but enormous warehouses. So, why have we stopped here, madam? Oh, this is where we're going. Please follow me down these steps. 
I wish you'd tell me where you're taking her. We have a, a club here in the basement. You'll see for yourself in a moment. Hmm, a very solid-looking door. How do you propose to get past it? I'll show you. Oh, it must be a very secret club of yours, madam. It is, Doctor. Who knocks? Number seven. Give the password. To the lanterns. You may enter. Follow me, Doctor. Madam, I do wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. This looks like the entrance to an opium den or a thieves' kitchen. Don't worry, Doctor. You're in no danger. There. Does that look like a thieves' kitchen? Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. A luxuriously furnished room. What a strange collection of people. Some look like beggars. Others in full evening dress. Amazing. Uh, number seven. Who is this man? He's a doctor. I went to fetch him. I thought I said there would have been no strangers inside. Now look here, my good man. I've been extremely patient, but my temper's beginning to wear a little thin. Either let me see your patient at once or show me out. My time's valuable and I don't propose to waste it. I'm sorry, doctor. Where is Julian? He's in the back room. And if you know what's good for you, doctor, whatever you call yourself, you'll forget everything you see in here. Stop threatening me, sir. I'm not the least interested in your blasted club. Just take me to the patient. This is the man we want you to examine, Doctor. Hmm? What happened? He fell down the stairs leading into the club room. Well, why'd you move him? We wanted him to be comfortable. It's the worst thing in the world you could have done. Never, never move a person with an injured skull. Is he? No, madam, I'm afraid he isn't. His neck's broken. He's dead. Huh? Julian, dead. You sure of that, Doctor? Of course I'm sure of it, my good man. I'm afraid you need an undertaker, not a doctor. We must tell the others. Yes. Julian is dead. Ju Julian? Julian dead? Oh, this is terrible. Who is this man? He's a doctor. We'd better get him out of here at once. We don't want any strangers nosing about. That's right, though. No. Shouldn't have brought him here anyway. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't the slightest desire to stay here one moment longer. If you direct me to the door again, madam, I'll try to find a cab myself in this godforsaken district and go home. Show him out and give him his money. Follow me, please. I'm delighted to. Do you mind if I don't drive you home, Doctor? Oh, well, uh, no, I should prefer it. My nerves aren't uh, in the best of shape. You mustn't be angry with me, Doctor, please. Leaving again, number seven. No, but this gentleman is. Will you see if you can find a cab for him? Right. To whom shall I send in my bill, madam? Oh, here's a five-pound note. That should cover your time and trouble, shouldn't it? No, 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 no. It's, it's far too much, madam. No, I, Doctor, I, it's I, late at night, and it has been a very pleasant case for you. Please take it. Oh, it's very kind of you. Very generous indeed. But by the way... Uh, uh, how did you happen to, to come to me in the first place? Well, I was driving about looking for a doctor, and a policeman directed me to your house. Oh, I see. I have found a cab for you. Well, uh, thank you, my man. Thank you. Oh, doctor, may I come round in the morning for a death certificate? Of course, because you remember my address? Yes, but I don't know your name. Uh, Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not, not the Dr. Watson who's associated with Sherlock Holmes. Oh, <laughs> That is that you know of me. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. And please forget about everything you've seen. Well, upon my soul, what an amazing business. Holmes will be interested to hear about this. And that's the way it was, Holmes. One of the most curious adventures I ever had without you. Very interesting, Watson. You say this underground cellar was luxuriously mm. furnished. Yes, and the people there were an amazing mixture. Some were in rags and some in evening dress. Huh. Some in tags and some in both gowns. Oh, exactly. In the feeling that I was taking part in a story out of the Arabian Nights. I must say, though, I was 
pretty angry at the time. However, after a good night's rest, I, I feel quite differently this morning. But I thought I'd just drop round and tell you all about it. Glad you did, my dear fellow. It would be interesting to see if any repercussions of your strange adventure reach us. Oh, I doubt it. The woman seemed frightened to death when I mentioned your name. We shall see. Meanwhile, I'm expecting a client. You're not too busy. Perhaps you can stay. No, I'd like to very much. Uh, who is it? You this know? telegram will tell you much more than I can. Arrived an hour ago. Let's have a look. Be at your lodgings this morning to discuss our problem. Signed AMS. <laughs> Pretty high-handed message. Be at your lodgings. Oh, please. <laughs> what do you suppose AMS stands for? I was just trying with that problem when you arrived. Could it be the uh, American Medical School? No, no, there's no such body. It's the American Medical Association. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The course, imperious yes, yes. Uh, a tone of the message inclines me to believe that the A stands for amateur. Very possibly. Oscar Society. Yes, or uh, the amateur murderers. <laughs> that, uh, that would be a nice thought, wouldn't it? Mm. Ah. They're representative now, no doubt, to save us further guesswork. Holmes, it looks like the same carriage that I drove in last night. The girl standing on your doorstep dressed in the height of fashion. Mrs. Hudson's letting her in. Splendid. It seems that we have not heard the end of your adventure. Go and meet the lady at the top of the stairs, will you? Well, chap, and save Mrs. Hudson's legs. Right, you are, Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. All right, sir. Uh, come in, madam. Want to come in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. Won't you, uh, won't you sit down? I'm Lady Dorothy Brownlee. It's your voice. Last night, uh... Dressed up as a, as a beggar woman. Yes, I am, Dr. Watson. Forgive me for being so mysterious at the time. Doubtless you have come to consult me regarding last night's unfortunate accident at the Amateur Mendicant Society. How did you know what the initials stood for, Mr. Holmes? Well, after hearing Dr. Watson's story of last night's happenings, the uh, connotation seemed obvious. Am I right? Perfectly. <laughs> last night, when Dr. Watson told us Julian was dead, we thought it was an accident. And now you think it is... Uh... Murder. Oh, there must be no more study. Well, I'm afraid it'll be a little hard for you to understand our motives. But a group of people, rather wealthy people, I suppose, will find pleasure in deliberately leading a seamy life disguised as beggars. We use the basement that you were in last night, Doctor, as our headquarters. We keep our beggars clothed there and change out of them before we go home. Mm, what a fantastic idea. What a future of your leisure time, Lady Barney. I suppose it must seem so, Mr. Holmes. But we're curious to learn how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a certain thrill in rubbing shoulders with the police. At least we do some good. Indeed. I should be to learn how. All the money we make as beggars, we give to charity. Oh, do you really? And you feel that this gesture on your part absolves you from any responsibility to the real beggars whose livelihood you're impairing? I hadn't thought of it just like that. No. Then... I suppose you won't want to help us. Oh, that's quite another matter, madam. As a professional detective, I cannot afford to be a moralist. Yes, I will investigate this case for you, though I warn you my fee will be an extremely high one. Money isn't important, Mr. Holmes, as long as we can solve Julian's death without bringing the police into the case. Lady Brownlee, who is the dead man? The man you refer to as Julian? Julian Trevor, the poet. Oh, he was yes. the one who started our society. Mm -hmm, yes, I think I've read some of his work, Decadence. Distinctly decadent. Well, what makes you think that he was murdered, Lady Brown? Well, after you left last night, Dr. Watson, it was a terrible scene. You remember Sidney Holt? Oh, was he the big fellow who was so unpleasant to him? Yes, that's the one. Oh, do I remember him? <laughs> he said that he saw Lord came to the head of the staircase. Oh, Lord Cecil being, uh... Lord Cecil Deerenforth, son of the Earl of Mission. Oh, yes. Yeah. There was a bitter argument. Cecil accused Sidney of doing the same thing. Then they had a dreadful fight. And it ended up with Cecil threatening to go to the police. But well, that's when we decided to send a telegram to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. So the proof of murder depends on such flimsy evidence as to whether the dead man fell or, well, should we say, uh, was pushed? <laughs> what it seems like. Mr. Holmes, even to prove, please help us, won't you? Yes, Lady Brownlee, I will. Then you come back with me now to our headquarters? I shall join you within the hour. In the meantime, my old friend Dr. Watson can go with you. But Holmes... What could I do without you? You know my efforts, old chap. Act accordingly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. But you promise you'll be there? I promise you that I will be there, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. We'll be expecting you. Come on, Doctor. Well, I'll, I'll just get my hat and coat. Doctor, go with her and ask no more questions. I shall join you within the hour. Holmes, there's a glint in your eye. I don't think you, you believe the story. Of 
Of course I don't, Watson. Well, then what? Then go with it, old fellow, and keep your wits about you. The game's afoot. The story of the Amateur Mendicant Society will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to use to remind you that you're really missing something until you try having wine with your dinner. And I mean a Petri wine. Let's say a Petri California Burgundy or a Petri California Sauterne. Both wines are just made to make good food taste better. If you like a red wine, try Petri Burgundy. Try it with hamburger, with stew, with any meat or meat dish. And if you like a delicious white wine, a wine that'll make chicken taste better than ever, try a well-chilled Petri Sauterne. With food, nothing can take the place of a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The Amateur Mendicant Society, a group of wealthy eccentrics who pose as beggars, have come to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson with a problem. One of their members has apparently been murdered, and the famous pair have been asked to investigate the killing. As we rejoin our story, Dr. Watson, still awaiting the arrival of the great detective, is cross-questioning three of the members at the headquarters of this unusual society. This is very convincing. Oh, don't you now? Well, then suppose you stop asking questions until Sherlock Holmes gets here. He's the man we've engaged to settle his business, not services, not those of his assistant. Uh, Mr. Holmes asked me to conduct this preliminary investigation, my good man. I'm perfectly familiar with his methods, so keep us on any more questions till he gets here. Stop, uh, Lord Cecil, you say that you saw Holt deliberately trip the dead man as he came down the stairs last night. Yes, I did. Well, uh, where were you standing, sir? At the head of the staircase. Holt was beside me, and as Julian came by, he deliberately... Excuse me, please, excuse me, number 11, excuse uh, me. What is it? There is a strange man just come in. He is dressed as you when you work, but I do not remember to have seen him here before. He speaks very rough. Mm. Did he give the correct signal? Yes, and the password. Remember. I suppose we'd better see him. Bring him in. Oh, bad time for him to come here, can't I? Oh, this way, please. Stop it. What a nice place you got here. Yeah, what a nice place. You do yourselves proud, don't you? Who are you, and how did you get in here? I'll give the signal and the password, just like Julian told me to. Are you a friend of Julian? Of course I am. You got me to meet him here today. Who are you, really? Are we all friends here? Yes, you can talk freely. And permit me to introduce myself. I am Don Luis Jose Fernando de las Torres at your service. Why? Why do you want to join us? When Julian tickled my, how you say, uh, my funny bone? <laughs> it is a so charming idea to see another those of mendicancy. <laughs> I suppose he's all right. Of course I'm all right. Now, where is Julian, please? He will uh, vouch for me. He's in the other room. That an accident. An accident? Not a bad one, I hope. A very bad one. Dr. Watson, you better take him in there and break the news to him. Uh, well, well uh, follow me, sir. This is terrible. Please, tell me what happened, Doctor. I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for a shock, sir. Your friend is dead. His neck was broken last night in some brawl. Yes, except that I do believe it was an accident, Watson. Holmes! Chiquado, Chiquado. But not quietly enough, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Come on, come back to the others and let all take a look at you. Come on, get moving, both of you. This isn't a pop gun in my hands. Sorry, Holmes, I gave the whole thing away. That's all right, old chap. Oh, Cecil, Dorothy, come here. I want you to take a look at the great Sherlock Holmes. Walked into our trap just like any stupid policeman. No, I had to dress up to do it, though, Mr. Holmes. We were waiting for you here anyway, you know. Oh, I was well aware of that, Mr. Holt. You see, I knew I was walking into a trap. How did you know that, Mr. Holmes? Lady Brownlee, the story you brought to us today was so obviously a false one. Just as there is no amateur mendicant society. Yes, Why should I tell you what you already know? Go on, talk, if you know what's good for you. Oh, you're so persuasive, aren't you, Mr. Holt? Very well. Undoubtedly, Julian Trevor's death last night was an accident. You fetched the doctor, Lady Brownlee, a very natural move, and later discovered that the doctor in question was the old friend of Sherlock Holmes. Mm. You were all afraid that I would become interested in your unusual society, and so you invented that very thin story about the accident being a murder. You wanted to lure me here so that I could be disposed of, and you could all continue your nefarious works without hindrance. Well, now aren't we clever? What is our nefarious work, may I ask? Your password gave me a clue. For the lanterns. 
fire the French revolutionists. They strung the aristocrats up on the lampposts. Then again, the combination of curious costumes and a luxurious establishment in a low-class area posed another question. What political belief provides a common meeting ground for misguided aristocrats and dangerous commoners? And how did you answer that question? Oh, very simple, my dear sir. One word. Nihilism. It's doctrine of assassination and overthrow of government would find every chance of being put into practice by all of you at the forthcoming jubilee celebrations to be held here in London. And also would account uh, for your beggar's clothes. A beggar would have greater freedom of movement in a crowd than an ordinary person. You're a clever man, Mr. Holmes. Too bad you'll have to die. I'll get the rope. What are you going to do with him? Do? Give him a first-hand taste of nihilism, of course. He can't live. They know too much. You can't possibly do this, you know. The police will track us here. By the time the police get here, you and your friend Holmes will be blown to kingdom come. Mr. Ross, Oh, Rod. Hands together, Mr. Holmes. That's it. Ah! Oh, mind that bandit wrist of mine, will you? It's confoundedly sore. Oh, isn't that a shame now? Is this any better? Ooh. Tie up the doctor, Cecil, while I bind Holmes' legs. With pleasure. I can't go through with this. What do you mean, Dorothy? You can't go through with it. I just can't stand by and see two innocent men murdered. Don't be a fool, Dorothy. We can't let them live. They know too much. I don't care. If you go on with this, I'm going out for the police. Are you fool. Oh. Tie her up as well. Leave me alone. Sit down there beside him. Go on. You're a devil. Oh, <laughs> shut up. Now, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to fetch a little invention. A little invention I'm sure you'll be interested in. Mr. Holmes, it's a pity you and your friend didn't learn to mind your own business. I'm afraid it's too late to teach an old dog new tricks. It's too late now, at any rate. Dr. Watson. Don't you speak to me, sir. You're a filthy traitor to your country. You're rubbish. Here we are. Example of Mikhail Petrov's mechanical genius. I'll blow the entire building sky high. And the three of you with it. Now, I wind the time clock so, and we'll set the fuse to go off in in five minutes. It'll give us plenty of time to get away. So, come on, Sydney, let's get out of here. Right, <laughs> charming picture. Three of you bound hand and foot, sitting beside each other on the sofa. <laughs> well, ta-da, Dorothy. Think of our cause during the five minutes. <laughs> and as for you, Mr. Holmes, and your friend, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> well, Holmes, this looks like the end. Quite so, old chap. <laughs> I blame myself. If I hadn't been so infernally noisy when I recognized you, we wouldn't be in this mess. Wasn't your fault, old fellow. I think they suspected me anyway. Well, I must say, it seemed to me a deal more than was necessary about your suspicions. Surely you could pretend it ignorant. Oh, I suppose I could have done. I can't die yet. I'm not ready to Courage, die. Courage, Mr. Brownlee. Courage. And by the way, was I right in assuming that your associates are nihilists? Of course they are. They're planning to assassinate the Prime Minister during the Jubilee celebration. Prime Minister, great heavens, Holmes, we've got to get free. Assuming some miracle happened, we did get free and your former associates were arraigned in court, would you testify against them? Oh, of course I would. But what chance is there of that? Why doesn't it? <laughs> it bothers you that much, Lady Brownlee. I'll stop it for you. Holmes, your hands are free. Of course they are, my dear fellow. The bandaged wrist I mentioned just now concealed a razor-edged blade. I cut through the ropes almost before our friends had left the room. Then why did you keep us in the suspense, Mr. Holmes? I wanted to be quite sure that you'd testify in the forthcoming trial, madam. There we are. That renders sprung the trap that I set to your associates, Lady Brownlee. It's lucky for you that you uh, had a change of heart and prevented you from leaving us. Oh, Mr. Holmes, how could I ever thank you? Holmes, you had the place surrounded with police when you came in here. Of course I did, my dear fellow. Yeah, let me undo your ropes. No wonder you were so calm. <laughs> no wonder you told them so much. You wanted them to show their hands. Precisely, old fellow. And they obliged me most satisfactorily. They attempted our triple murder. They are self-confessed anarchists. And with the evidence of Lady Brownlee... I'm sure that we can put them where they all belong. Considering it's uh, barely noon, I think you'll agree, Watson. That is a very comprehensive morning's work. Doctor, tell the truth. Were you scared waiting for that time bomb to go off? Scared, my boy? I was so scared that to this day I can't stand being in the same room with a, a loud ticking clock. Tick to the clock. Seems to speak to me. Seems to say, Tick tock, this is the end. Tick tock, this is the end. 
the clock ever speak to you like that? Well, yes, Doctor. How did you know? What? What the clock said to you? Tick tock. Petri took time to bring you good wine. Petri took time to... <laughs> you listen to your clock and I'll listen to mine. Gosh, Doctor, can I help it if I like to hear about Petri wine? After all, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine. And it's no wonder. They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you just can't beat the Petri family. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take time to pee calendar. It's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Dr. Watson, what adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a story of old Vienna. The Vienna of sparkling lights, beautiful women... And lilting music. And of an extraordinary murder that takes place to the accompaniment of a Mozart sonata. Boy, that sounds like a thriller. I'll see you for sure next week. Oh, uh, oh just a minute. Before I go, Mr. Foreman, I want to urge every registered nurse listening in to get all the facts about the army nurse. The army needs you, nurses, needs you desperately. They'll make you an officer at once and give you every chance to further your post-war careers. So if you're a registered nurse under 45... Call at your local Red Cross chapter and get all the details. Or wire collect to the Surgeon General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. And if you can't qualify for the nurse's call, see if you can't get into essential civilian nursing so that you can release a nurse who does qualify. But do something about it first thing tomorrow, won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, 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 wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair, reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting, like being a truck driver. With the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holliday? I went down to Star Times office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 
13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling ten-cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. Sell 5,000 packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, Kara, Box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny. Tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? <laughs> you interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. <laughs> Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. I was on page five. Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. Police announced they've recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is... John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old DA just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. I bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but... I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I... I... bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holliday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? 
story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. The district attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but what could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, the stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while the detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with a hold of men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write the need of the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. i got to earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. Small boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny. There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. You know him? Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. And he's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny! Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. 
But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. Oh, I feel terrible about it just the same. And now Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, um, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps he'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Well, thanks. I... Did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling holiday. Waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holiday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, she's long and skinny. No, no, she's short. Short and fat. Holiday. Holiday, get up on your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right? Anson? Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One... How do you feel, Mr. Holliday? I... I... I can't... can't make it. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holliday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better. Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with a district attorney. I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was the hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago. The victim of a hit-and-run driver. And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holiday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. Mm. 
I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holliday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you weren't to do too much talking. So, just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holliday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny, did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, and then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? Well, only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, well, yes. Yes, he was. Uh... Was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no. He never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room. But it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? Dub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Hardy. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Uh -huh. I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight, I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. You like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? Hey, you're not twins, are you? No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where are you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into the department house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Joe! No. It's Holiday. Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here 
Here we are. Aren't we? Then you reply, Miss Joe. What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willie? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to her? Shut up, you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before? How do... How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only one admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You had me set up this whole deal. Had me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Had me frame the business of picking up my watch. I timed it out perfect for you. What do you do? You got dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now, what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Hey, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. Well, this is the last chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy ending. But Johnny Moran's father is free. The district attorney has Grace Willard. Joe Coakley and the stolen jewelry and Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped too when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this kid, but, uh... Did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think he needed money that bad. Uh, yeah. Needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee. Gosh, I guess I'm rich. Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I... I don't know. I... M Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the... Oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susie. I just invited Mr. Holliday out to have a drink. He can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Well... She will. Thanks a lot, Susie. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 
13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. He looked deeply into her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? Huh. As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holiday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared. Somebody's been following me. With those legs? Why not? I, I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister like Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click Cluck? Oh, Mr. Holiday, he followed me all the way from Box 13. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. Somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom. Except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well, uh, uh, nerves of steel, heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girlie. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lumps. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flit? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes. I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted. Will go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flit. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, cluck, click, cluck? <laughs> oh, that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flitt, what? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. <laughs> just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job? Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. Fifty dollars. I should have been a detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. I got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little uh, bloodshed. Well, well, well. This holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, Holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. 
And you've never met this Baldus having the party? No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, at Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes. On account of the way his father died, uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. Hmm, we must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. Yeah? Well, Fred, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flip, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house. A beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. Would you come in? And you are... Uh, George Flip. You say you are George Flip? That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now, let's go in and find Gilbert Bolton, Mr. Flip. <laughs> Holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of, of Terry and the pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, cloying, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm hmm. Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolton, this is George Flitt. George, how do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective? Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I pictured you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Fulton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. The way this man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating. With piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. He could be one of two men. A man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. Just as Gilbert Fulton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Come on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. And here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a boy, huh? Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, uh, Mr. Flitt. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? 
Oh, I see. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. That suits me. In the garden. The garden, it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm-hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it. Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yeah? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. That was lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Well, yes and no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you. No. No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothered you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. It is an old friend of the family. She's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute, I want to buy some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. Oh, I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, better case the joint before you go inside. There. There's the window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him, and there's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He set another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? No, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Cliff? Here, I haven't touched this one. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flitter a fresh drink. I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Here, what's it? My drink. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Flit, you... You awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flit, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by hors d'oeuvres. Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flynn? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. Well, you'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flynn. Oh, good. What's the address? Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Flitt. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flitt. To keep him in company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per- perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that know, but... won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Uh, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you've, maybe you've become a little touched. Time's a waste on holiday. Get to a phone. Huh. There it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Max on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. Star Times reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holiday. Ah, oh, Danny. What can I do you for? Say, so you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> Clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. Well, what about Bolton? Poison himself. Left all his dough to his son, name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. Kid was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. <laughs> Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with the Bolton. He's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. 
Uh, where are we going? To a pot house, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Now, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden, and I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? He got insulting. Then all of a sudden he suggested going to his penthouse. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down for that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holiday. Okay. Are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now... Back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, 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 next time I want such a close shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Gosh, Mr. Holliday, I thought I could handle this hot rod, but the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Uh, that train must be a mile long. By the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of this penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is it overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop. Well, George, Green Hill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have print houses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how'd you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Oh, yes, yes, of course, but uh, you've earned your money. You can, well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Maud, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm. He looks for another door. Like that one. He tries it. It's open. It leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The service entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. Here's some gambler holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Quiet holiday. Ah, oh, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. I'll get your ear up, Holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? 
Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth. I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Oh, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now, look over there, Kenneth. Uncle Gil! Kenneth, let's get away from that rail! Don't flip you. Don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. Ignore him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle plant it in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Well, you must be crazy, Uncle Gil. And you knew I was Dan Holiday all along, huh? Of course. I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. You, you, my uncle. What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. Don't move, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide, I'm going to shoot you. Oh, fine. Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? But what about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bowen. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion? Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. Wouldn't he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're uh, taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. <laughs> That doesn't help, Holiday. Forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. I'm such a fantasy. I know. 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 I now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith & Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Come in. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Hello, Susie. Ah, uh, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the R, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho whatchamacallit at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. 
Yes, George, you can say that again. H- how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flint? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod, rod hot, red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holiday? Hmm? Even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager with an original story by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. FBI and Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS four weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a promise you make to yourself in some dismal part of your life, or it's a name you say like a curse. It's a place of golden women in mirrors of chrome, or it's a beggar who will tear off a piece of his soul for a cup of coffee. It's anything you want, any time you want it. And it's my beat. By nine o'clock, police headquarters had settled down to its nighttime routine. So far, business was slow. I was sitting in my office straightening out the detail sheets that always accumulated on my desk. Lieutenant Clover. Good evening, sir. Well, Dr. McClure. Dr. Robbie McClure. It's a pleasure to see you. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lieutenant. Hey, what's the matter? What's the matter, Doctor? You look pale. Well, I could give you all the clinical reasons for the way I look. Now, <coughs> now, Lieutenant... Let me get you something, Doctor. I'll no, be no, right... No, no, wait, Lieutenant. Last month, there was a shooting. It, it, it's not that I want to confess to. It's the thing of, about... <coughs> you should know about... Last month, the murder that the police never solved. Daddy, I, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't uh, want... Doctor that... McClure... Uh, Dr. McClure. Sergeant Sartaglia. Yeah, Danny. Come here. Yeah. Well, what's the trouble, Danny? Close the door. Well, what's all... Well, Danny, what's the matter with Dr. McClure? He's dead. What? Flip his coat aside. You'll see why. Oh, Danny. From the size of the wound, I'd say it was from a twenty-two fired from up close. Sartaglia. Yeah. Call downstairs and tell him about Dr. McClure. Then get a detail to find out everything you can about the doctor. Friends, relatives, bank account, everything. Right. And in the morning, I want the files on every murder that happened about 30 days ago. Unsolved murders. On my desk in the morning. Right. Good. I'll see you. Now, where are you going, Danny? I'm going to wind back McClure's life. I'm going to find out why he had to die. The great buildings of the city lean against the night in crazy, tilted angles, like lighted toys deserted by a sleepy giant. And there's the feeling that unless you walk carefully, you'll upset their insane balance. But Dr. Robbie McClure's office building was different. It sat square and solid on its haunches, and when you pressed the night buzzer, it growled at you. (laughs) 
Well, sure, my mare, but ain't any clover the torpid. Canter in, me boy, canter in. Oh, same old pepper. No, not the same, Danny. There are bald spots in me fetlock, and I ain't so quick to break from the starting gate like I used to. From a dashing mounted policeman to, to a flabby night watchman. Ah, that's a bitter pasture, Danny, me boy, a bitter pasture. Well, maybe you're wrong, Pippet. Maybe it's sweet pasture and you don't know it. Pippet, you know Dr. Robbie McClure, don't you? Sure, sure I do. A great surgeon. But ah, what a waste, what a waste. How do you mean? Sure he, sure he was a genius. Sure, sure, sure he'd been a veterinarian. What else could I mean, Danny? What else, of course. You know what time he left his office tonight? I have, I do. I have it right here in my book. Now, will I take a look? Oh, yeah. Here it is. 8.40 in the P.M. Was he alone? No, no. He was in the company of the sleekest, prettiest, racist looking filly. It's been my pleasure since I cavorted the devoted police. Did you have her signature? Oh, no. She was the doctor's patient. Or guest, or, or, or best bet for tomorrow. Night watchmen are discreet, Danny. Some ladies, they don't ask to sign out. Well, ask them from now on, Pippet. Huh? I mean it. Have you got any idea where they went? No, Danny, but they took a cab from that hack stand out there in front. Did you see whose cab they took? Yes, I did. I did. I opened the door for them. They took Irv Newman's cab. If you want Irv, you'll probably find him at his home. I know those hackish scooters, you know. Well, thanks, Pivot. If you get a lump of sugar in the mail, it's from me. What do you want? Hey, it's Danny. Hi, Irv. <laughs> hey, Rose, it's Danny. Who? Danny, Danny Clover of New York's finest. Uh, so he's going to help me wash the dishes already? Mm, pay no attention to Rose, Danny. She's moody tonight. Come on in, come on in. Thanks, Irv. Now, sit down, Danny, sit down. Uh, Irv, I... Uh... I offer you something, a glass of tea, a cold beer. I got it. How about one of Rose's blintzes, huh? Hey, Rose. Uh, never mind, Irv. Don't bother, Rose. What's the bother? Even if she's moody, she can't rass you up a blink. Oh, I'm here on business, Irv, so some other time. Oh, business? Hey, Rose! Huh? Come here. Huh? Cut off Caruso. Huh? Make quiet Caruso. Put you, Caruso. Caruso. Now we'll talk, Danny. What kind of business brings you down here to Orchard Street, the land of the Knish and the Bagel? Now, Pippet told me you drove Dr. McClure somewhere tonight, Irv. Where, where'd you drive him? Uh, Park Avenue. Yeah, here's the address, Danny. I was just making out my records. Oh, thanks. Was he alone? At first, no. Uh, later, yes. Translation? First, he is with a doll. Oh. Uh, lean over, Danny. Rose shouldn't hear. A zoftic type doll. You know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Then he is without the doll. Around 50, she opens the door of the hack and slips out into the traffic. McClure tells me to keep going. I think they had an argument. What about him? Danny. I'm the type to eavesdrop, especially when they shut that glass panel. The address Irv Newman gave me was a study in millionaire respectability, Scrub Park Avenue Brownstone. The butler took my hat and sighed and told me it was all right to go down the corridor into the living room if I tiptoed. I did. Then all of a sudden it hit me, the light from a couple hundred bulbs set in a crystal chandelier. And when I finally squinted through it, I couldn't quite believe it. It wasn't the size of the room. That was only about a hundred yards long. It was the walls, from ceiling to floor and all the way, the walls were decked with murals. Mother Goose murals. Paintings of every fairy tale and nursery rhyme character in the book. And on the floor, smack dab between Marjorie Dawn or Seesaw and Jack and his beanstalk, sat a man. He was wearing three things. A goatee, a full dress, and a beanie. Three propeller type. Well, hello there. And a hello to you. My butler said your name was Danny Clover. But my butler lies. Uh, what is your name, sir? Uh, Danny Clover. Uh, you see what I mean? Uh, grab a toy out of the toy box, sir, and sit down. Uh, Mr. Fletcher... Here, I... here, here, take my latest product. Child psychologists claim it's remarkable for improving the coordination and tactile responses of a four-year-old. Really? Has it helped you? Immeasurably. We place the ball in the cup, so. Uh-huh. Then we squeeze this lever, so. Yep. Then we catch the ball. Oops, we missed. Oh, I guess we overestimated ourselves. Now, Mr. Fletcher... Oh, go call me Fletch. Don't stand on ceremony just because I'm the president. Oh, does Margaret know? Huh? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I mean the president of the Fletcher Toy Company. 
I make toys for children, sir. I bring gay bits of sunshine into their otherwise drab little lives. And, as you see, I test my products before I market them. Incidentally, sir, what is your business? Police. Police? Police! Uh, stop here screaming. You'll wake up Snow White over there. Sir, what right have you to be in my house? Well, technically none, Mr. Fletcher, but there's a little matter of... A matter of invasion of privacy. What do you want? Was well, Dr. McClure here this evening? Dr. Robin McClure? In a word, yes. Why was he here? I'm his patient. Is that a good medicinal reason? Simply sterile. Uh, are you a sick man, Mr. Fletcher? You don't look sick? Dr. McClure says I'm a hypochondriac. But he gives me pills. I take them. They make me feel better. Ergo, I must have been sick before I took the pills. One more thing, Mr. Fletcher. Who was with Dr. McClure? I beg your pardon? Or maybe she stayed in the cab that brought him here. Who was she, Mr. Fletcher? Oh, oh, oh that one. <laughs> yes. I peeked out the window and saw her waiting in the cab. Oh, beautiful, isn't she? Oh, striking. One of the most striking women I ever saw. <laughs> I blew at the top propeller in Fletcher's beanie, and then the butler came in and ushered me out in the downdraft. Lying must have been one of the little games they played in that million-dollar house. Fletch said the butler lied. Then Fletcher lied about a girl he hadn't seen, a girl who was a question mark or an answer in the murder of Dr. Robbie McClure. If I was going to wind back McClure's life, I needed some sleep. All that got wound up were the sheets in my bed. And in the morning, I started it all over again in the good doctor's office. You're early. The doctor hasn't come in yet. You'll have to wait. Everything about her was anonymous. The white shoes, the white stockings, the starched white uniform, the starched white face, and the mouth, scarlet and thin, that she wore like a ribbon of merit. You're a new patient? Fill out this card, please. Mm, not a patient. The police. Lieutenant Danny Clover, Broadway Special Detail. Oh, did Dr. McClure ask you to come here? Well, you could say it that way. I'm here to investigate his death. What? You mean something happened to him? He died in my office. He was murdered. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Oh, I'm sorry you had to be told like that, but we don't always have time to be gentle. You were his nurse, Miss... Elliot. Jim Elliot. I had an agglutination test to make on some RH negative blood, Lieutenant. May I do that while you investigate? Mm, go right ahead. Where do I find the doctor's patient records? In that metal file box. You've been with the doctor long, Miss Elliot? Three years. Pardon me, Lieutenant. I need that slide. That's the usual question. Did he have any enemies? You knew him. What do you think, Lieutenant? Doesn't matter what I think. He was a fine man. Generous and kind. I'll need that microscope. Oh, sorry. Hmm. Uh, this is strange. In the patient's file? What strange, Lieutenant? This card has a name and a date. All the other cards are filled with case histories. All this has is a name and a date. Dorothy Rivers, June 29th. Isn't that strange, Miss Elliot? The files were the doctor's responsibility. He had his own way of keeping. But you don't know anything about a patient named Dorothy Rivers or this date. Nothing, Lieutenant. May I take this with me? You're the police. You do anything you like. I'll have to turn the lights out now, Lieutenant, for the test. Go ahead, Miss Elliot. Go ahead. Uh, this will do for now. And thank you, Miss Elliot. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Miss Rivers, Miss Dorothy Rivers, Dr. McClure's office. We advise a rest, a long rest in a quiet place. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. If murder should suddenly explode in your face, you'd know how Casey, crime photographer, feels tonight in the drama titled Sellout. That's exactly what happens to Casey. 
A routine newspaper case suddenly erupts into a savage murder mystery which requires the sharpest thinking and fastest action of the crime photographer to solve. Crime Photographer is yours for the listening every Thursday evening, as is the other thriller, Escape. Tonight, Escape brings you Leiningen versus the Ant, a top story of harrowing adventure on a top program. Remember Escape and Crime Photographer tonight over most of these same CBS stations. Now, back to Broadway's My Beat. <laughs> There's this thing about Broadway. It can tickle you under the chin and make clucking noises, or it can slap you hard across the mouth and laugh. Either way, you get hurt. Right now, the receiving end of the slap was the police department for various and sundry unsolved murders. And the laugh, the big laugh, the cold laugh was that a man named Dr. Robbie McClure had come to my office to die, and I didn't know who'd killed him. I sat at my desk at headquarters tearing the tabloids into a noose of paper dolls when... Sergeant Tartaglia opened the door and with a fine Italian flourish lay a thick paper-bound file in front of me. For you, my lieutenant. Your memoir, Sergeant? What is it? It's only what you ask for. A file on one of our more recent unsolved murders. Get it out of here. Get it out of my sight. Huh? Hey, Danny, you sick or something? Oh, all right. All right, leave it. I also have here in my pocket the dope you wanted on Dr. Robbie McClure. Here, read it. Uh, talk it to me, something. I'm sick of reading. Well, there's some interesting items, Danny, about the good doctor. Item. Friends, numerous and friendly, all with alibis. Item. Relatives, none. Uh, the doctor was a lonesome man. How are your wife and kids, Tartaglia? Oh, great, Danny, just great. Hey, you should see the latest, little Christina. I bet she's a doll. Go on with the items. Huh? Oh, yeah. Item. And this is the one I think will interest you, Danny. On June 30th, Dr. Robbie McClure made a deposit in the Corn Exchange Bank in Bronxville. 10,000 crisp, cool, clean dollars. June 30th, huh? Now you can talk to me about the recent unsolved murder. As follows. A man named Martin James was murdered in his Sutton Place penthouse apartment at a party, night of June 29th. Yeah? He was asked to step outside and he was murdered. Martin had a gun. He fired one shot. The bullet from Martin James' gun was never found. Uh, we figured it took off across First Avenue. But, Taglia, there's a doctor's patient card over on the table over there. Tell me what it says on it. Sure, Danny, sure. It says Dorothy Rivers, June 29th. See a name like that on the James guest list? Yeah, uh, wait a minute, Danny. Yeah, hey, here it is, Danny. Dorothy Rivers, in an alphabetical list with a lot of other girls. Is your address there? Well, all the girls have the same address. What? Say that again. They all have the same address. The Tony Seville Model Agency. Tartaglia, here's a fin. Buy your doll, Christina, a doll or something. Oh, thanks, Danny, thanks. But there's something I think you should know. About Christina? About Dorothy Rivers. The records say she never showed up at that party. She was never there at all. Tony Seville paid rent for his model agency in the Empire State Building. For this, he received the privilege of maintaining a ten-room suite on the 40th floor and decorating it with orchids and genuine neutrils. The other decorations were too numerous to mention. Delicate shadings of blonde and brunette. When they crossed their legs, the silk whispered. I started to whisper back, but a scented haze with magenta fingertips beckoned me into an inner office. She closed the door behind her, and all I was left with was a pork barrel in a double-breasted pinstripe named Tony Seville. My secretary whispered you are a policeman. How have I trespassed? I parked my car incorrectly, perhaps. I forgot to curb my dog. Let's stop rubbing noses, huh? I beg your pardon? Let's put it this way, simple and blunt. There's some questions I want you to answer for me. You must have a dull profession, asking questions. Very well. Ask a question. Mr. Seville, your agency supplied a half dozen models to a party at the home of Martin James. Said party a little over a month ago, June 29th. Said home, a penthouse on Sutton Place, right? Possibly right. However, don't underline your details with a sneer. My agency furnishes models as decorative baubles to any social function. One of your decorations on the evening I'm interested in was named Dorothy Rivers. How do I get in touch with her? You're a detective. Detective. What's her address, Seville? May I suggest a dragnet detective? 
or any of the numerous machinations you police are oh so adept at. Her address, Sibyl. Where do I find her? You should be told we only give a model's address to an approved client. I don't approve of you. Look, kid, sometimes I can forget I'm a cop. I can forget right now. I, I think you mean it. Yeah, try being cozy for one more second. I don't know where Dorothy Rivers is. I haven't seen her a month. You can do better than that. The uh, day after the party, she phoned. She said she was going on a vacation. She... Uh, You're doing fine, Seville. Keep it up. There's nothing more. I tried to get in touch with her several times since. She checked out of the hotel. She left no forwarding address. You're telling the truth, aren't you, Seville? The truth is this. As far as I know and care, Dorothy Rivers could be dead. Beginning at the 40th floor, I picked petals off a tired daisy. At the 38th, Dorothy Rivers was dead. 37th, she wasn't dead. 36th, dead. 35th, not dead. I don't remember how it came out, because when I got off at the ground floor and walked into the yellow heat of 34th Street, a character stopped me by tapping me lightly on the leg with the front bumper of his cab. The character was the character named Irv Newman. Don't look so scared, Danny. Brakes I got. I could stop this cab on a thin latke. Latke schmatke, so long as I got my hell. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> you're charming, Danny. Absolutely charming. Hey, told me at headquarters I'd find you around here. I got something for you. One of Rose's blenders? Maybe better than that yet. You know that girl he was asking me about? The one I picked up with Dr. McClure, the professional man? What about her? I spotted her for you, Danny. Where? Tell me where. So let me tell you. Happens I got a friend, Danny, a truck driver. He's a teacher of a fellow. His name is Clem. Every morning gives me a push with the truck so I can start this lousy hat. Where did you spot the girl there? So I'm telling you. While Clem is pushing me with his truck and I'm gliding along in my hack like in a gondola, I see this girl coming out of building. What building? 6 West 23rd Street. So I turn around, I wave to Clem. He should stop already, yeah? Uh, Danny! Danny, didn't let me finish! Yes, who is it? Miss Rivers? are you? I want to talk to you, Miss Rivers. By what right? I don't know you. Get away from here. Get away. Let's go inside, Miss Rivers. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Danny Clover. I'm a police detective, Miss Rivers. Been through a lot to get to you. We get along a lot better if you just settle down. Why do you want to see me? I've read somewhere that grief can make a woman even more lovely. You look like you've been grieving. Don't be clever with me. I'm sick of clever men. Maybe I can help you. You? A policeman. Me, a policeman. Oh. Well, it's all over now, isn't it, Mr. Clover? Mm, just about. You want to know what happened at Martin James' party, isn't that it? The guest list said you were invited, but you weren't checked off. That mean you weren't there? I was there. Through the back entrance, Mr. Clover, because... Because he said that was the way it should be done. Who? What should have been done that way? Look, look, Mr. Clover, I'll tell you what happened. I owe it to myself to tell you what happened. I'm tired of pain, pain, pain. That's it, huh? Blackman. Let me tell you from the beginning what happened. Perhaps you'll even believe me. You'd be surprised, Miss Rivers. Policemen can believe the truth. Martin James is a man who made investments in all sorts of deals. A kind of silent partner. One of the partners was a man named Fletcher. Man with a goatee? He manufactured toys, Mr. Clover. I went to the party with him... Mr. Clover. What's the matter? Mr. Clover! The window! He's gone. Who was it? Who did you see? I... Uh, uh... Oh, maybe you should have told me his name, Miss Rivers. Now you don't owe anybody anything. Uh, even as a coroner, I say it's a shame, Danny. Such a beautiful girl. Shame. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. What I've been waiting for is your report. Well, <clears throat> Dorothy Rivers. Age about 24. Bullet ended left sternum, pierced pericardium. That's the heart, Danny. Hmm. Dead on arrival. Dead all? This girl was shot once before. She's got a healing wound that... Well, it looks mighty like a bullet wound. It's right here, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, that makes it all add up. That makes it add up just fine, Corner. Neat. Real, real neat. Hello, Fletcher. 
There's a friend, Fletcher. The payoff goes on just the same. Tonight, kid, nine o'clock. So long, Fletcher. It took me ten minutes to get to the Park Avenue palace that Fletcher had built out of psychological toys for kids. Across the street, I took a plant behind a fat, uniformed doorman who kept looking at me out of the corner of his fat eyes as if he were terribly sorry a thing like me had ever happened under his gilt-fringed canopy. At 8.30, the lights in Fletcher's crystal chandelier began to go out in sections. In five minutes, he was on the street, hailing a cab. I tossed a nickel to my fat doorman, hailed a cab of my own, and tailed Fletcher to an office building I'd been in once before. I watched him slip Pip at a bill and then walk down the corridor to a self-service elevator. I thought it'd be nice if he had company on his lonesome ride. He didn't. Police! Why am I constantly surrounded by police? Maybe because you bring sunshine into my drab life, Fletcher. You know how to work this thing? Well, of course. It's nothing but a toy. Uh, allow me, anyway. It's the fourth floor you want, isn't it? Well, no, 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 not at all. Humor me, Fletcher. Let's make it four. Right down this hall, 438, Dr. McClure's office. That's where you want to go, isn't it, Mr. Fletcher? Yeah, there are obviously some titillating gyrations going on in that mechanical policeman's brain of yours. You will reveal them to me, please? I was waiting for you to ask me that in just that way. Uh, here we are. After you, Mr. Fletcher. Oh, thank you. Now I reveal the payoff money, Fletcher. Give it to me. Ah, of course. I see. I see. I thought it was curious that I should have to keep paying blackmail to a dead man. Dr. McClure is dead, isn't he? The money, Mr. Fletcher. It's hard for me to say please. Well, here you are. Thousand uh, dollars. You want it weekly, I presume, just as I paid it before? That's cheap, isn't it, Fletcher, to buy off the electric chair? That's quite a toy, too, I hear. Yes, yes, quite, quite. Uh, then you know, of course, that Dorothy Rivers and I murdered Martin James. Uh -huh. Oh, he deserved it, you know. He swindled me out of a good deal of money. What was Dorothy Rivers to you? Uh, now, nah, now, nah. you're talking like a policeman again. Dorothy Rivers was a toy, expensive and fragile. It made her all the more desirable. That and the fact that I could make her do anything I liked. Could you bring her back to life? What? Hey. No, don't get up, gentlemen. As long as I was eavesdropping, it makes me less of a lady. Uh, that gun's not becoming either, Nurse Elliot. Put it away, put it away, my dear. Uh, toys like that make me nervous. I prefer this pose. Now, what were you saying, Lieutenant? Now that you're here, I've got even more to say. As a nurse, I'm a humanitarian, Lieutenant. You've got a minute more saying time. A man should never lie under the circumstances, huh? And if I told you this, if I told you that you were the blackmailer instead of Dr. McClure, what would you say? I'd say you were telling the truth. What? Then I've been paying all that money to this... this temper, this, this. temper, Mr. Well, Dr. McClure took the initial 10000 all right, but the nurse here kept right on blackmailing you and Miss Rivers in the doctor's name. McClure flounded out, so he had to die. All through, Lieutenant. Not quite, nurse. After the blackmail, you had to kill Miss Rivers because she was about to talk to me. Now, Lieutenant... One more thing. If you kill me, the payoff stops. Consider it, Miss Elliot. I got $1,000 in my pocket. Half yours, half mine. It could go on and on. We could still make Fletcher pay. Think about it, Miss Elliot. Put the money on the table, Lieutenant. Half yours, half mine. All right. On the table. Thanks. I'll take mine, Lieutenant. Now. Yeah, no, no, Miss Elliot. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Oh, put you your arm, arm. Arm. Drop it, drop oh, the gun. You're uh, yeah, thanks. I'll lift it up for you, Lieutenant. I'll get the gun. I'll lift this, Fletcher. <laughs> Got any smelling salts for Fletcher, nurse? It took three police officers to carry Nurse Elliot away. She tore at their faces and screamed in a language she hadn't picked up in medical books. Fletcher? He was different. He settled himself in the Black Mariah, pulled out a solid gold yo-yo, and played with it all the way down to headquarters. Broadway's happy now. It's got on the carnival clothes it wears every night, and the midway boils with roustabouts and yokels and hurdy-gurdy sounds. It's a jack-in-the-box, and it's a clown. It's a shining girl on horseback, or it's a geek with no arms, no legs, and no heart. It's Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs>
Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. America can be proud. America is proud of the young men of our armed forces. Painstakingly trained as specialists in many fields, these servicemen will be the leaders in tomorrow's civilian life. Educational advantages open to today's servicemen are unparalleled if you can qualify. Look into the volunteer enlistment program now. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The FBI in Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS two weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where you can take a bus ride into the summer evening and make believe it's a dreamboat. Then, Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as carousel music. But if you walk, you can get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Then you can't make believe anymore. But either way, it's Broadway. My beat. Danny! Danny, come in here! The big voice that boomed through the afternoon heat belonged to Silks Bergen. Him, the heat couldn't bother. There wasn't enough of it. Silks was a jockey, about five hands high, and with a wet saddle, he might have scaled 110. He waved to me from the doorway of a haberdashery store. In here, Danny. In the store. Yeah, Silk, sure. I've been waiting. <clears throat> I said I've uh, been waiting for you to pass by, Danny. What's the matter with your voice, Silks? You're down to a whisper. Laryngitis. Had it for a week. Hey, uh, Danny, I want that you should meet a friend of mine. Joe Murdoch. Yeah. Say some hello to Danny Clover, Joe. Hello, Mr. Clover. Joe. Joe's six foot six and speaks like a tenor. <laughs> You should know about things like that, Danny. Is it possible? I... Joe, uh, go buy me a shade over there. I got to talk to Danny. Sure, Silks. Uh, The lavender and the polka dots. The dots, Joe, the dots. Can you hear me good, Danny? My voice has got so far to go from down here from me to up there to you. I'll listen close. What's on your mind? I want you to... I, I said, I said, do me a favor, huh? About the key. Why didn't I think of it myself, about the key? What key, Silks? Well, I'm riding a race down to Maryland tomorrow, you see. I don't know how long I'll be gone. Now, you understand? Oh, that key. What key, Silks? The key for the locker at the LaGuardia plane terminal. Oh, now I know. That key for that locker. Huh? I got a parcel check there. I ain't got time to run down for it now. It begins to dawn, Silks. Yeah, sure. So if I ain't back tomorrow night, how about having one of your boys who's on duty down there pick it up, huh? Yeah. And you hold it for me. Yeah. That'll save me rental, and it'll make us even for them riding lessons I give you in Central Park. <laughs> okay, Socks. Give me the key. Uh, thanks, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, now, now, don't lose. Uh, don't worry about him. I'll put it right here on my ring. By the way, what's in the parcel? <laughs> Just some of my riding silks, Danny. <laughs> what else does a jockey own? <laughs> Patted silks on the head, bit him a fond yikes, and mushed back into the tropical heat of Broadway. Tropical was an illusion that wasn't hard to believe. The crushed pineapple and papaya stands, the coconut milk in real whiskered coconuts, the sly grinning beat of the native drums heard through wilting loudspeakers, 
The girls. The luminous girls in their grass sandals and 14th Street sarongs. And then one whose lips looked as if they'd been painted with wild strawberries stopped me and kept me from my appointed rounds. I didn't mind. I'm so honest. I don't have the price of a dream and I'm honest. Here, you dropped this. What? This hundred dollar bill. You dropped it. Take it before it burns through my hand. A oh, hundred dollars. Wasn't I the careless one? Must have been in that Cracker Jack box I just threw away. Never throw anything away, Mr. Clover. There can be a prize in each and every packet. That's a hard thing to remember. Will you help me try to remember, Miss... Uh... Ames. Bell Ames. Oh. You haven't need any help, Mr. Clover. Ring for Bell Ames. That's cute. Very cute. Now maybe I can do something for you, Bell. Maybe give you back all this money you said I dropped. <laughs> all right. So I lied. All you have to do is believe you dropped that money and listen. See how easy it is? A hundred dollars and no pain. For a hundred, you can throw in a little pain. Who do I listen to? It's written on the bill. Marty wants to see you. Oh? Marty says it's easier to talk to people who have money. He likes people with money. He says they listen better that way. I'm a fool for psychology, Bell. Let's go listen to Marty. Not me, Mr. Clover. You. It's you he wants to listen. Hey, come back here. Bell, Bell, come back here. The heat melted her into the crowd and then into a cab. And I was left standing there with the after scent of a perfume I'd never smelled before and a hundred dollar bill I'd never held before. I inhaled both of them. They added up to the acrid odor of a bribe. I had to find out why. 42nd Street, the address on the bill said. I decided to walk. Somewhere between Broadway and the number I was looking for, the honky-tonk started. And at the corner where women's high heels clack more slowly and the handouts become more frequent, I took a right turn into limbo. Two blocks down was what I was looking for. The last paddock hotel, room 16. Your name, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, that's my name. And these are my boys, Tinker and Dolly. Say a uh, greeting to the police, boys. Police? Gee. Police? Golly day. Yeah, boys are from out of town police like me. The word don't impress us. You gonna give me some more money, Marty? Maybe. Maybe money, maybe trouble. Guy has a hard time figuring which is which these days. What's you trying to buy, Marty? Talk. I'm buying words like I'm an editor. <laughs> uh, Marty, the kick, Katie, Tinker, the regular comedian. Your floor show stinks. Well, they ain't really working, police. So let's stop playing footsie, huh? We got business, me and you. Mm. About an hour ago, police, a little guy hailed you into a haberdashery shop. He's got a message for you. What kind of message did he have? You should have heard. All you need, Marty, is a long, thin ear. Hey, hey, the police is a kick, too, Dolly. A jolly boy, real jolly. What did Silksburg and tell you, police? Who? Now, look, I got time. Time, patience. Let's do it again. Silksburg and what did he tell you? You looking for a tip on the horses? I got a tip. You're it. Only you look sad for a win. You look like hardly anything at all. Show him the gun, will you, Dolly? Yeah. Look, Mr. Police, this is a gun. Golly day. Let me have it, darling. Yeah. Here, Marty. Now, what did Silksburg and Teddy Police? Marty, you go to movies to see how guns will act in this kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, in a movie. Now, how did you know? Darling. Yeah? Show the police the second reel. Yeah, pleasure. A great big pleasure. <laughs> You know the language better than that, police. You might say something. Your two muscles and your gun make me bashful. State's right, huh? <laughs> Dolly. Yeah. Hey, Tinker. This is fun. Yeah. You can play too, Tinker. Yeah. Such a jolly guy. <laughs> Playing movies with a jolly guy. <laughs> a jolly, jolly guy. <laughs> Somewhere a light going on and off made a big noise and a bigger hurt just in back of my eyeballs. It screamed at me from across the street and through a window hung with grease-stained drapes. And I knew I was still in Marty's hotel room. I knew that hours had been torn out of my life and thrown away. 
Then the light screamed again, and this time there were words. Big thousand-watt words that said, Pearl Club, delicious dancing girls. First one, then the other. And in between, there was the creaking sound of a rocking chair. Then the rocking chair made words, too. Don't hurry. It's rather pleasant here, sitting rocking in the dark with that brazen sign throwing its naked, intermittent light. This gum gives me the right to introduce myself. I'm Gil Sherry. Oh, should I know you? Perhaps. I believe I'm in the class book of one of our more venerated colleges. That's my identity. A thesis on Gil Sherry would make lurid reading for the boys with the old school tie, don't you think? I wouldn't know. Read me a chapter. I'm delighted. Chapter one begins. Early in life, I learned to love money. It was a symbol of the sordid life into which I'd fallen. Now, sitting in a bleak, villainous hotel room, my comrades, a detective and a corpse. The corpse and the detective. Is that all me? <laughs> Not quite. You're the detective, true. And the corpse is the true corpse lying in the corner. Huh? And I believe he's a friend of yours, Mr. Clover. Silks. Silks. A rather fancifully named, don't you think? Silks Bergen. Proud, colorful name. But pride and color seem to have drained out of him. Maybe he's ashamed of wearing bullet holes where his polka dots ought to be. He was a neat little guy. So? And he'll be pleased with death. Death is so precise. Closes your mouth, too. That wasn't smart of Marty. Marty realizes that. That's why I'm to keep watch over you. Until you open yours and tell us what Silks had to tell you, huh? Oh, by the way, here are your meager belongings. Yeah. Your wallet... A key ring, your badge, and a hundred dollar bill. Marty's orders. That's good of him. They're all there? Yeah, yeah. You said a hundred dollars like there were words that hurt you. As I suggested, money is beautiful, Mr. Clover. Money buys money. Money is an ecstasy of an exquisite pain. Oh, uh, Gil, I dropped the bill. Huh? If you pick it up for me, I'll let you hold it for as long as you want. Go on. Touch it, Gil. Feel it. Oh, oh I'll get it. Yeah, Gil. Get it. And get this! <laughs> I'm not going to send my boys to college. Their noses break too easy. Took 15 minutes for the riot squad to clean up room 16. I booked Gil Sherry as an accomplice to murder. And the morgue booked Silks Bergen. The thing I had to do now was break a promise to a dead man. I couldn't wait until tomorrow to use Silks' key. The key that Marty didn't even notice. A half hour later, I was in the big waiting room at LaGuardia Field. American Airlines DC-6 leaving at gate 5 for Chicago and Los Angeles. Loading at gate 4. Hiya, Lieutenant Clover. What brings you down here? You know an officer? Had any trouble? Uh, locker thieves? No, only trouble was a three-year-old kid in a $400 cowboy suit screaming because he lost his nurse and chauffeur at the same time. Where's locker 147? 147? Uh, uh, right over here, sir. Let's go. Now, let's try this key. A suitcase, Lieutenant. Yeah, pretty heavy. Something you're looking for? Hold on a second. Since I get this open. Holy! All that dough! Tens and fifties and hundreds. Yeah. What could be bought with that? It's been bought, officer. A lot of blood, bought and paid for. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Practically all of Casey, crime photographer's adventures are summed up in the title of tonight's show, Big Danger. If you haven't met this ace newspaper cameraman, his pretty assistant, and Ethelbert, the merry bartender, if you're looking for a top-rating thrill show, be sure to hear this latest of crime photographer's adventures. Along with Escape, which tonight will present Irvin S. Cobb's Snake Doctor, crime photographer is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. <laughs> Thank you. 
Broadway is an animal that feeds on hot tips, a tip on a horse or a chopped liver sandwich. There are even touts who will hawk you a scratch sheet giving odds on Broadway's being wiped off the face of the earth. And sometimes the tips pay off, like the one not to put your two bucks on Jockey Silk's Bergen because Silk's was dead and his handicap was a chest full of bullets. Or maybe his handicap was a heavy $100,000 left in a pasteboard suitcase in a public locker. It didn't make sense for Silks to have that kind of money. Even to sane, sensible, sensitive Sergeant Tartaglia, it didn't make sense. It don't make sense, Danny. Silks with a hundred grand left kicking around. Ah, that's not like him. Yeah. Uh, got a cigarette, Tartaglia? I put a carton in this desk drawer a week ago, and I haven't been able to open it since. Oh, here, let me try, Danny. It's stuck, Tartaglia. Just give me a cigarette. Danny, my wife, Mrs. Tartaglia, says I am the best opener of stuck drawers she ever saw. Just give me a cigarette. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, here, Danny. Hey, and how about some circus peanuts to munch while we're thinking? When do you have time to go to circus, Sergeant? Oh, not me. Not me, Danny. Wasn't me. It was my kid. Yeah, there was a street carnival on Mulberry Street, so it was my kid. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, you know, for a minute there, Danny, I thought you were munching me out. All right. Playtime's over, Sergeant. We had any reports that anyone is shy a hundred grand? No, Danny. The money has been reported neither lost, stolen, nor strayed. Did you check whether Silks made any bets that would have got him that kind of money? Yeah, Danny. The word from our stoolies is that no bookies is out that kind of dough. Not out the Silks, anyway. The word also is that Silks didn't have a wrinkle deuce to bet on his own name. Yeah. yeah what do we got on the man they call Marty? Ah, not a thing. Aside from his autographed hundred dollar bill... No, we can't find him, Danny. We can't trace him from no place to no place. Hmm? Uh, Danny, you feel all right from that beating? I've had it better. Uh, Sergeant, what's on Bell Ames? Ah, uh, likewise. It's an empty day with a hole in it, isn't it, Tartaglia? Yeah, it... Huh? If you want me, I'll be in Gil Sherry's cell. There must be somebody who can tell me something. Anything. <laughs> There's no need to humiliate me further, Mr. Clover. Being forced to talk to you is humiliation enough. Murder doesn't bother you, huh? As long as it's not mine. Dying can come to a man a lot of ways, Sherry. You could die as an accessory to Silk's murder. And there are so many things to prove, though, before I die, aren't there, Detective Clover? If you told us some secrets, you could maybe keep on living. That's as good as money sometimes. True, true. That's why I keep my mouth shut. I'll breathe longer that way. You mean Marty will kill you if you talk to us? I'm not brilliant like you, Sherry, but it seems to me you'll lose either way. Man has few choices, but the destiny of Gil Sherry will spin itself out as Gil Cherry chooses. That's what my class book said about me. Yeah, real profits, your classmates, real profits. Here's the envelope with Sherry's belongings you asked for, Danny. Yeah, uh, thanks. I return your meager possessions, Sherry. Your cigarettes, an empty wallet, a fraternity pin, and... Hmm. This is interesting. Roll of tickets to Pelagus Shooting Gallery. You know Pelagus, Sherry? Pelagus, the ex-bookie? You shoot at his shooting gallery? Yeah, that's what I thought. Happy destiny, Sherry. Happy destiny. <laughs> Hello, Pelagus. Keeping in trim? Pardon me, Danny. You're in my way. Oh, uh, sorry. Nice shot. You angry at somebody? What's on your mind? Guy named Marty. Ah, you like that shot? Makes me quiver with excitement. You think I hit that duck twice before it sinks? I doubt it. <laughs> See what I mean? You still booking races, Pelagus? I got caught once. You still booking? Uh-uh. You're in my way again. Try getting used to it, Pelagus. Try this. Where would Silks Bergen get a hundred grand? Yeah. Where? From you? Oh, yeah, from me. From Pelagus. I give people hundred grand, eh? That's why I'm running this thing shooting gallery, because I give such big prices. You hit that duck, Lieutenant. I give you a hundred grand prize. Is that what you mean? Oh, hold on. Hold on. No, I tell you, Thales. Tony Vrani, Joe Murdoch, Nessus, Topotami. Petty Manos. Oh, Petty Manos. Joe Murdoch. 
Joe Murdoch, Silk's friend, the big guy with silks in the haberdashery. Pelagos, what's he saying about Joe Murdoch? It's hard to explain. Hard, huh? Like this. Uh, Joe Murdoch was fist out of this river. Murdered. A visit on us a good day. Don't spare me that last either. What did you say? May he rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, See you around, Pelagos. Pure scene of those. Danny Clover. A fist at on us a good day. thought I had to think that pal Joey Murdoch was dead for the same reason that Silks was. I checked headquarters, found out that Murdoch's last known address was the last paddock hotel. He shared a room there with Silks. The environment made its own possibilities. The lobby of the last paddock had a new embellishment. Above the clerk's desk was an embroidered wreath. To Silks, it said, you finally beat the bookies. The clerk didn't sound funereal at all. Sorry, mister, you gotta come recommend it. The last paddock don't rent rooms to just any fink that asks. I didn't mention room. The sign under your chin says information. I'll take that. Ah, you don't look like you carry that much dough. I got it sewn under my lapel. Here, take a look. A cop? A shaman? Real friendly policeman, mister. Come on, the information. Now, look, I'm a new boy here. You ring that bell, I give you the register. You sign it, you got a room. That's how it works. That's all I know. Yeah. Say, that's, uh... Pretty big safe over there. Why such a big safe for such a small flea bag? New, too. Yeah, new. How come? How come such a big new safe? Look, like I said, I'm a new boy. Look, friendly, we got laws about new boys who get close to new murders. Put your out-to-lunch sign on the counter. We're going uptown. No, 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 wait a minute. Uh, uh, Wait a minute. Uh, About that new safe. See, we had an old one. What happened to it? Well, yesterday the boys opened the old safe and... All it gave back was an empty stare. The boys did. What boys? The boys, the guys that live here, the bookies. Oh, they kept their money in a safe, huh? Well, sure, it's much safer than a bank. No peeping team in that way, eh? That way the bookies don't pay income tax. That way if their money gets stolen, they can't run to the police. Yeah, yeah, and that's all I know. You can take me uptown and that's still all I know. Yeah, don't go away, friendly. Maybe soon you'll be able to tell your story to an audience. Get in the car, Clover. Well, uh, Marty. Good seeing you, Marty. I've been looking all over for you. Get in the car, Clover. Dolly's looking at you with a gun pointed to where your badge might be. Now just get in the car. Hey, Tinker. Hey. It's the police again. Maybe we'll get to play some more movies. After I take a gun. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Golly day. You'll play later, boys. Wait out here. Oh, Marty. Wait. This way, police. In that house. Two murders, eh, Marty? How does a guy feel when he's murdered two men? A good feeling. I like it. Open the door. Yeah. There's someone I want you to meet again, Clover. In here. Mr. Clover. Mr. Danny Clover. You mind if I blush with joy? You can still think of a reason to blush, Belle. <laughs> Such pretty words for a man who's nearly dead. You got one chance, Clover. The dough. The hundred grand. Where is it? First, I'm going to tell you something about Marty, Bill. He had that money and he didn't know it. What? What's he saying, Marty? You tell us, Clover. Bill, when Marty had me worked over, he should have taken a look at my key ring. One of the keys was for a locker. Locker, money. Marty, how could you be so stupid? Answer the policeman, Marty. So, so I made a mistake, Bell. Don't worry. We got the police. We'll get the dough. A hundred thousand dollars, Marty, like that, right under your nose. Oh, <laughs> Bell, you picked yourself a dull playmate. You can't afford a playmate who makes mistakes, Bell. Marty, you fool. You stupid fool. <laughs> Bell. I've got to ask you, too, Bell. How does it feel to kill a man? 
Where's the money, Mr. Clover? At police headquarters, in my office. Get on that phone, Mr. Clover. Get on that phone and have one of your flunkies bring it over. No tricks, Mr. Clover. Just tell them... hard to kill from up close, huh, Bell? Palagos. It's me. Palagos, the Palagos shooting gallery. You see, Clover, how well they learn from Palagos? You always teach them with a gun in your hand? <laughs> yeah, one needs something to wrap one's pupil across the knuckles when she is bad. No, Bell? Bell deserves it, Pelagos. She tried to double-cross you. That makes two, Bell and Marty. Didn't know you were so much alike, Bell. You and Marty. <laughs> Don't listen to the policeman, Pelagos. No, it's just, it's just you and me. Nobody else. It's, it's you and me and a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, sounds good. To me, that sounds good. How does it sound to you, Clover? Speaking strictly from a personal point of view, I wouldn't believe it. Uh, from a personal point of view, that is. Uh-huh, but Pelagos point his view different. Then it's all right, Pelagos. It's all right, isn't oh, it? Oh, it couldn't be better. Just show me you mean to throw away your gun. Huh? On the floor, Bill, throw away. Oh, sure, sure, anything you say. Ah, you're a good girl, Bill. Nice, good girl. Yes, 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 yes. Belle was a nice girl. She had nice, good ideas, Clover. How did she say? Get on the phone and have a flunky bring money over. No tricks. That's how she said. The flunky comes along, Clover. I tell you in English, not in Greek, so you understand. He comes alone in 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, Taglia, this is Danny. Silk's dough. Yeah, the hundred grand. Bring it here to me. Yeah, to 8 West 63rd. In my desk drawer, Tartaglia. It's in my lower left-hand drawer. Yeah. Yeah, right away. Come alone, Tartaglia. Alone. You did good, Clover. Nice good. Now we wait. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, the man said. Just Pelagos and me. There was no one to play him off against. No Marty, no Bell. Just me. The fall guys I'd set up, Marty and Bell, all gone. It all belonged to Pelagos now. Two new fall guys, Tartaglia and me. A few more minutes, the man said. Mostly, the man watched the clock. Ah, sir. You're lucky, Clover. In two minutes, you could have died. Open the door. Hiya, Danny. Well, here it is. I brought the dough just like you said. Hey, you know, it's good to get away from the office. Put a suitcase on the table. Huh? Hey, it's Belagos. Hey, and he's got a gun. Hey, Danny, what Give the man the suitcase, Tartaglia. Well, whatever you say, Danny. <laughs> ah, Clover. You're a nice, good fool. I get the money, you still die, huh? You and the flunky. Huh? Talk to us before we die, Belagos. I like to talk. What do we talk about? That was your money. Silk stole it from the safe at the last paddock. Thought he could get away with it. He thought you couldn't do anything about it. But you crossed him. You had Marty kill him and his friend Murdoch. You talk all by yourself, Clover. You didn't let me say a word. <laughs> now fold your hands behind your head and stand facing the wall. You both. Good. That's nice, good. Now I want to look once more on my money. It's too long since I looked on the money. Here's my money. The money. Something wrong, Pelagos? This money is... It's what, Pelagos? It's nothing but paper. Lousy torn up strips of dirty loose paper. Paper is nothing but... Hit the floor, Tartaglia. I'll take him. Oh. Nice good, huh, Pelagos? Ah. Yeah. Nice good. First, I kissed Tartaglia on the top of his bald head, because today that's where his brain was. My lower left-hand desk drawer had been stuck for a week, and he'd gotten the cue. Dolly and Tinker, they were sitting outside, just like Marty told them, right in the middle of a police net, just like Tartaglia had arranged. So I kissed him again. So he invited me to a spaghetti dinner. 
Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's crowd and it's laughter, and it's a trumpet that screams. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid, the voice that whispers from the doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The FBI and Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS one week from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a swamp that'll drag you breath by breath into its shadowed pools, or it's a meadow shining with golden light. It's a place and a time and a loneliness that reaches out for you, then beckons you into an airless room and locks the door. You get out or you don't. Either way, it's Broadway, My Beat. A man dies in silence and in dark, and the city sets up a shrieking clamor, and you're part of it. You ride a scream through the crowded, heat-heavy streets, and then you hit a dead end. And it's a building, and a room at the top of the building, and it's a man lying in the center of the room while other men take notes on the history of his dying. All right, Joe, get one from this angle, huh? Yeah, hold the light while I focus, will you? Hiya, Danny. Okay, that's good. Got it. Now get a shot of all that food. Oh, what a banquet this guy hey, Danny, laid out from Danny, come over here. This will interest you. It never interests me, Doc. What have you got? Al Dane, the novelist. Ever read any of his stuff? No. Neither do I. The wife does, though. Says she's mad about him. But she went mad over Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, let's have tea some other time, huh, Doc? Tell me about Dane. Hey, yeah, well... Hey, first tell him about me, huh, Doc? Tell him about me. Oh, uh, yeah. Danny, this is Clem, Clem Picasso. Pic- yeah, that's who I am. Picasso. Picasso. Haven't I heard your name someplace? Sure you have. Clem Picasso, the painter. I paint flagpoles. That's where it was. You were painting a portrait of a flagpole for Dane, is that it? No, you don't understand. I'm the real article. Let me tell you about me. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even know Dane was dead. Tell me more about yourself. Well, I was painting a flagpole on top of this building, see? All of a sudden came a gust of wind. I grabbed hold of the pole, dropped my pail of paint right through that skylight there, see? I look for spilled paint, I find a dead man. That is the experience that happened today to Clem Picasso, flagpole painter. Unforgettable. Uh, It'll live in my memory, too. Uh, You got anything to add to that, Doc? (laughs) Only this, Danny. This room is a fortress. Dane must have built it on top of his penthouse for a retreat. It's ventilated by an air conditioning system. The only source of outside light is that skylight, and that's at least 30 feet from the floor. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, and the room was locked and bolted from the outside. Dane couldn't get out. This place is bare. No writing materials, nothing. Yeah, like a tomb. Maybe he needed this kind of atmosphere to think. Maybe. All the boys found when they broke in here was Dane and that table, loaded with food, all jarred. Fruits, chicken, all sorts of good things to eat. What's the matter, Doc? You hungry? Just tell me how Dane died. He died of starvation, Danny. Huh? Yeah, all that food, and he died of starvation. Curious man, this Val Dane. Huh, Danny? I could have dropped it right there. Val Dane, I told myself, had committed suicide by starving himself to death, thereby obtaining new material for his next novel. That's what I told myself. That's how much sense it made. That's why I couldn't drop it. In New York, hardly anybody dies in a vacuum. A man as famous as Val Dane never does. There has to be a close friend or relative to break the news to, and in a case like this, to question. 
It wasn't tough to find out that Val Dane had a wife, now divorced, and his city directory said she lived on West 79th Street. It was apartment 105. As simple as that. Yes, what is it? You're Mrs. Dane? Well, only approximately. Mr. Dane and I are divorced. I've kept his name for my son's sake. Uh, you're... Uh, Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Oh, how interesting. We've never had a caller here from the police. Won't you come in? Thank you. I do hope you'll stay until Jimmy comes home. Jimmy is my son, Mr. Clover. I'm sure he'd love to hear the experiences you'd have to tell him. Uh, in here, the living room. That's quite a collection of glass toys there on the floor. Clowns, building sets, animals, and all in glass. Jimmy must be an unusual boy. Oh, yes, he is. That's all I have left in life, Mr. Clover. To make him happy. Uh, there's something I have to tell you that might make you quite sad. About Jimmy? No, it's about your former husband, Val Dane. He's dead. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I mean, I'm relieved. I was afraid with Jimmy being on the streets... Then it might... doesn't affect you, Mr. Dane's death? I think I should be more sad if I read in the papers that a man I never met had died at the age of 93. I see. No, you don't, really. How could I feel sorrow for Val Dane? He was a miserable ten years thrust into my life. Why do you say that? Because he was a talented egoist. He cared nothing for Jimmy. Cared even less for me. We lived for him. He lived for Val Dane. Well, when did you see him last? Two years ago. In that horrible cabin in the Adirondacks. He, he forced us to go there so he could write. And one more thing, Mr. Clover. Yes? When you write your report about me, put this down. Put down... Joanne Dane, Val Dane's ex-wife. She's glad he's dead. I didn't bother to tell Joanne Dane that her former husband had starved to death. I had a feeling she would have enjoyed that too much, and death doesn't need laughing at. But when I hit Broadway again, death was screaming at me in big black letters. Val Dane had become public property for a nickel a copy. You got the funny papers, too. I called headquarters and asked Sergeant Tartaglia if anything new had turned up. Something new had. Get back to your office right away, the sergeant said. There's a guy who wants to see you. He's hysterical. The sergeant wasn't kidding. Something in my office makes you laugh like that? The pollen, maybe? I can't help it. It's rich. It's the richest one I've ever heard. Okay, okay, come out of it. Who are you? Uh, my name's my name's Brooks, Lyle Brooks. <laughs> Lyle Brooks, huh? Tell me gently, what's so rich? Oh, if I think of it again, Lieutenant, I shall roll in your floor in continued convulsions of hilarity. And think of something real sad, like a right to the jaw, and tell me what's in your mind. Why, why, Val Dane starved to death. Don't you think that's funny? No? Well, I think it's funny. What tickles you about a man's death, Brooks? About Val's death? He was such a pig. And he starved to death. Well, that lieutenant is humor. Category ironic humor. What's your interest in Val Dane's death? I'm his ghost. Ghost, huh? Battaglia! Yeah, Danny. Now, what do you want? Book this guy for impersonating a human. Hey, that's a serious... Right huh? now. Tartaglia, book him. Well, sure. For impersonating a human, huh? Come on, you. Policemen have a sense of jest, too, I see. Come on, you. So I'll explain. I am Val Dane's ghost. You're doing it again, Brooks. His ghost writer. I did much of the writing which is credited to our so literary Mr. Dane. That's why I came to give myself up. To give yourself up? Huh? Did you have anything to do with this dying? Assuredly not. But you might think so. I hated him. Val Dane cheated me time and again. But this time was the biggest cheat of all. Uh, what's he talking about, Danny? I'm talking about the great fake. Val Dane's latest book. I wrote at least half of it, you know. Got no credit. Val said I would get credit. What are you trying to tell us? Just this. If Val Dane met with foul play in any way, I should head your list of suspects. Me and Cynthia, of course. We mustn't forget Cynthia. Oh, we can't forget her. Cynthia who? Cynthia Troy. Why, everybody knows she's the woman in the great fake. Heavens! Do you mean to say you haven't read the book, Mr. Clover? <laughs> Mr. Clover hadn't, but Mr. Clover did. The Great Fake, new novel by Val Dane, available at your favorite bookstore, $3 the copy. 
I bought it, noted it carefully on my expense account, and went home and curled up with three dollars worth of vitriol. Because that's what the novel was. A book of hate, a sneering book, a book without humor. There wasn't a person in it, only caricatures dipped in acid. And the leading woman of the novel had been dipped deepest of all. It tweaked me. The next morning, I just had to see her. Mm. I'd been expecting a call from the police, Mr. Clover. Drink? Uh, no, thanks, Miss Drunk. Then you won't mind if I do. Uh, no. I realize it's before noon, but then I haven't had my breakfast yet. You sure you won't have a drink? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, just why had you been expecting a call from the police, Miss Troy? <laughs> because I have no doubt about your intelligence. One thing you must know in my business is never to underestimate anybody. Do you mind if I ask what your business is? The same as in Val's novel. I give parties, Mr. Clover. I arrange that the unfortunate rich be impressed by their leisure and their wealth. By opulent and clever parties, Mr. Clover. For an opulent price, Mr. Clover. Now the question, Miss Troy. Why was Why I... Why were you expected, Mr. Clover? Hmm. The answer is a question. How do you get a man to starve to death? I've been asking myself that. Do you think somebody got Val Dane to starve? Undoubtedly. Val Dane was a man whose only love was Val Dane. He was too jealous of his love to kill himself. He would never commit suicide. Then do you think he was murdered? I uh, believe I implied that, don't you? Did you kill him? <laughs> the idea titillates me. Yes, it's a rare thought. <laughs> Ask me that again, Mr. Clover. Look, Miss Troy, the social graces aren't one of my, uh, social graces. Uh, In your circle, how do you tell a lady to quit stalling? By telling her. Then let's quit stalling, huh? Very well. You've uh, read Val's novel, yes? It made a fool of me, didn't it? Is that why you killed him? Locked him in that room and starved him to death? I should like to have done that, Mr. Clover. The idea... Yeah, I know. It titillates you. Uh, you've started a train of thought, Mr. Clover. I should like to have locked him in that room and spent days of ecstatic joy watching Val Dane starve. I went back to the clean, almost domestic air of the police laboratory and waited while the lab boys checked and rechecked the coroner's report. No matter how you shook it, it came out that Val Dane had died of starvation. Then it caught up with me what Cynthia Troy had said. It would have given her days of ecstatic joy to watch Dane starve. There was only one place anyone could have done that. That was from the roof and through the skylight of Dane's death room. I took a uniformed officer with me because maybe that kind of ecstasy leaves a clue. Danny, I've been over every inch of this roof. There ain't a particle of it that ain't intimate and familiar to me. I'm also sick of the sight of it under my nose. Uh, okay, officer, you can get up off your hands and knees now. Uh, thanks, Danny. You know, Danny, maybe it'd help if you told me what it is we're looking for. I don't know. Thread of cloth, a cigarette butt, the smell of hate. The smell... Huh? Hey, Danny, you dizzy from the altitude or something? <laughs> no, no. You can go now, officer. I won't need you anymore. Okay. Hey, you know, it's kind of pretty up here. Huh? All the lights of the city. Gee, that reminds me. I think I'll take my wife to the top of the Empire State Building. It'll be like a second honeymoon. Well, so long, Danny. Don't stay too long in the night air. Yeah. There has to be something. Something. Hmm. Didn't make sense what I saw. A piece of scotch tape stuck to one of the panes of the skylight. I leaned down to examine it. And then there was something that did make sense. The sound of someone moving toward me. And then I... I whipped out my gun and ducked behind the jet of the skylight. And then it found me. A sickly dawn spread itself over the roof and over me. I took inventory and found I was missing two items. A valuable hunk of skin from my right temple and a piece of scotch tape. Just that. Scotch tape. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
A thrill a minute. High tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum, the great mystery show that's another of CBS top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots on your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater returns next Monday, August 29th, for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum, Lux Radio Theater, every Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Morning on Broadway is like any other August morning on a thousand other main drags. People are caught up in a salary to be earned, baseball scores, and the heat. You keep moving and do the best you can. The best I could do was to try to push my way through a brick wall. Progress was practically at a standstill. But by now, one thing was obvious. I had a murder on my hands. Valdane had been found starved to death in a locked room with a banquet spread before him. That in itself was something to nick the curiosity. But when I got too curious, somebody had taken a shot at me. Draw a line and add that up and you get a six-letter word meaning foul play. At headquarters, after I had my head bandaged, Sergeant Tartaglia was terse and intelligent about the whole thing. I can't figure it, Danny. Now, don't try, Tartaglia. If you could figure it, you'd become invaluable to the department. You'd never get your pension. Did you get what I told you to? Yeah, one piece of frosted glass, just like you said. Thanks. Where'd you get it? Now, Danny, where would you get a piece of frosted glass at police headquarters? Out of the men's powder room. Uh, you better hurry up with it. Yeah. Now, we'll tear off a piece of scotch tape. Now, we'll paste it over the glass like this. Uh, what are you doing, Danny? Pasting scotch tape on frosted glass. It's the latest craze. Now, we hold it up to the light. Look through it, Tartaglia. Get up close and look through it. Hey, hey you can see right through it. The part of the glass with the scotch tape on it, you can see right through. Hey, that's a neat trick, Danny. It's also a clue, Sergeant. The skylight to Val Dane's retreat was frosted glass. Somebody stuck that missing piece of tape on the glass so they could watch Val Dane die. Uh-huh. Tartaglia, suppose you were locked in a room loaded with food and you were starving to death. What would you do? I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Unless nothing, Danny. I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Danny, I said I'd eat the food unless it was poi... Unless it was poison, Danny. You're so right. Tartaglia, I want all the food found in Valdane's room transferred to the technical lab right away. I want every piece of it analyzed for poison. I want the analysis on my desk as soon as possible. Right. Now, wait a minute. Please. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Plain closed Meshikov, sir, assigned to follow Cynthia Troy. Oh, uh, okay, Meshikov, what do you got? At 9 a.m. this morning, Cynthia Troy entered the Fifth Avenue apartment of one Michael Green. Who? Uh, I mean, Cream. Michael Cream. C R E A M. Cream. You know, like in Cream. So I took a plant in the hall. At 9.15, I heard loud voices, which at 9.20 become a heated argument. Who's this Merkel Cream? Oh, him I checked. He's a yogi. A yogi, huh? Oh, that's interesting. These guys go on starvation diets to get next to their souls. Uh, thanks, Machikov. Stick with Cynthia. Hey, Tataglia. Yeah, Danny. Get my bed of nails. I'm calling on a yogi. The yogi with the homogenized name, Merkel Cream, lived in a rich, creamy Fifth Avenue mansion with a high money fat content. The outside stairs were covered with a thick layer of perfumed oriental carpet. When you rang, a girl made of copper with bells on the ankles of her bare feet and a jewel stuck in the middle of her forehead opened the door with a scented arm motioned you into the presence. The presence was a muscular man with the body of a professional football player, wearing a plumed turban and an imported English tweed loincloth. He sat in the middle of the floor, bathed in the celestial glow of a baby pink spotlight. And then the presence spake. You have come. Yeah, Mr. Cream, I... Speak not when I speak. You have come. You said that. You have come to attune yourself to the eternal harmony that lies six fathoms deep in the cosmic sea. You will go into the cleansing room. Huh? You will go into the cleansing room and there cleanse yourself and attire yourself in a loincloth. You will find a suitable array hanging from pegs. The, uh, panther skin for you, I think. Look, Mr. Have Cream... Have no I... fear. They are sterilized after each use. Now go, tortured one, go. Look, Cream, I'm not here to cross your palm with How silver. How dare you speak to Merkel Cream thus? 
How dare you, Savage? That's me. Look into your crystal ball and tell me why you should scream at a tortured one named Cynthia Troy and vice versa. How did you know this? Don't answer. I will answer for you. You are omniscient, clairvoyant, like the me that is the true me. Like the me that is Danny Clover, New York police. I got a hunk of protoplasm named Meshikov who floats under windows and soaks up things like a fishwife's brawl between you and Cynthia. But you are clairvoyant. The Cynthia underneath Cynthia is a fishwife. She pays you to tell her that? Cynthia Troy is a disciple. Disciple fall out sometimes, as you know. I've heard. And Val Dane, he, he was a disciple too. What did you do to Dane, Yogi? Put him on a starvation diet for his eternal harmony? Then you've read his book. Yeah, he gave you a paragraph. Let's see if I can remember the exact words. The Yogi, a vicious parasite, a jeweled vampire... A stinking phony. Did I quote the exact words exactly, Yogi Cream? Dane died in a way that pleases me. He died in an agony of hunger. What does it matter if his exact words are remembered? To him or to me, what does it matter? Yeah. Get up, Cream. You're coming with me. I got a feeling you can give me better answers with your pants on. You believe that I'm a fake? You believe what Dane said of me? To put it bluntly, Cream, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Maybe Dane killed your lush racket with his bestseller. Maybe you knew it would. Maybe you arranged for him to die. Let's go. Help me up, Mr. Clover. Uh, cosmic harmony makes you weak. All right. You know I can't afford to go to jail. It would ruin me. Let go of me. If you move, Mr. Clover, I'll break your back as if it were a stick of wood. Let go of me. A little trick I learned from a man on Amsterdam Avenue. Ten judo lessons for 20 bucks. Worth it, don't you think? Don't you think? I got my lessons for free. <laughs> well, send them back. They're no good. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. <laughs> now, my way, Cream. Let's do it my way. <laughs> oh. Well, what do you know? The yogi found cosmic harmony. Has to be a phone in this dump. Yeah. Tartaglia speaking. Tartaglia, this is Danny. Send a stretcher to pick up Yogi. Mr. Merkel Cream? Yeah, he spilled out of his bottle. One stretcher coming up. Hey, Danny, we got a report on that food. Yeah? Give it to me. Well, I was about to, Danny. You know, it is very interesting. Tartaglia, if you don't talk fast, order a stretcher for yourself, too. What about that food? Well, that's what I'm telling you. So interesting. It was not poison, Danny. Baldane's food was not poison. <laughs> Until the yogi was in condition to talk to me, I had to talk to myself. What kind of man was Val Dane? That was the big question, the important question. Locked in a room long enough to starve to death and he refused to touch the food, the unpoisoned food at his fingertips. Why? What was the mentality of the man? Once, long ago, he had been human enough to marry, to have a family. Maybe that was the clue. Once somebody loved him. Maybe his ex-wife, Joanne Dane, would be calmer now. Maybe she could divorce her memory from ugliness. Yes? Who are you? I'm Danny Clover, police detective. Who are you? I'm the landlady. What can I do for you? I want to see Joanne Dane. Joanne's not in any trouble. She's a fine girl. What kind of trouble would she be in? No, no, I didn't say she was in any trouble. I just wanted to talk to her. Well, she ain't in. Where is she? Oh, Joanne's out for a walk. With Jimmy? Jimmy? What are you talking about? Her son, Jimmy. Mister, you got the wrong address. Joanne's got no son. Nobody lives here by the name of Jimmy. Say, what kind of a detective are you anyway? Yeah. What kind, Clover? Let's go find out. <laughs> Here are the vital statistics he asked for, Danny. Yeah? Hey, when are you going to take me to see South Pacific, Danny? Oh, any day now, doll. I'm just waiting for that inheritance. Oh, Danny, stop pulling my leg. Here. Know the vital statistics, Danny. <laughs> Read it to me, doll, because your voice is like honey. Read it to me. <laughs> Get him. James Dane, age four, son of Val and Joanne Dane. Died June 22nd, 1947. Cause of death, accidental poisoning. 
death spasms took four hours. Remoteness of cabin and Adirondacks made it impossible to reach Boy in time to help. Signed, Dr. James Robeson. Hey, hey, Danny, where are you going? I haven't finished. Danny, come back here. I've got some things to settle. I was out when you called before, Mr. Clue. Yeah, I know. Joanne, your landlady said you'd gone for a walk. With Jimmy. Jimmy loves to walk on a sunny day like this. Where's Jimmy now? Hot plane. Joanne, I asked you before. Now, don't lie. When was the last time you saw Valdane? I won't lie. A few weeks ago, as I told you. A few weeks ago, yeah. Another question. Why did you go to see him? To ask him for money. I hated myself for it, but Jimmy needs clothes. You see, he'll be going to school this fall, and... I see. Joanne, did you take anything with you, anything that you gave to Val? Well, I, I don't think so. I can't remember that I did. Food? Why... Uh, food in jars, chicken, preserves, things like that? Well, now that you mention it, Mr. Clover, I... Yes, I think I... Yes, Joanne, you told Val that food was poison, didn't you? Just before you left, just before you closed the door behind you. You told Val it was poison, didn't you, Joanne? What are you talking about? Just before you locked the door and bolted it behind you, you told him that. You pointed a gun at him and told him that. Why should I do that? Joanne. Joanne, listen to me. Jimmy is dead, isn't he? Jimmy dead? (laughs) Jimmy dead? Jimmy died two years ago. You know that, Joanne. No, what? I don't know what you're saying. The Adirondacks, one summer two years ago. Jimmy took some poison by mistake. There was no way to get help soon enough. You and Val had to watch him die. You're making all that up. You blamed it on your husband. You blamed him for bringing you there because it was so remote. No, no, no. It wasn't that way at all. Yes, it was. You left that food with your husband, Joanne. You told him it was poisoned. You knew he'd never have courage to taste that food after seeing the way Jimmy died. Your husband took his chances with starvation rather than suffer the way Jimmy did. Jimmy suffer? Jimmy dead? Yes, Joanne, he's dead. These glass toys are only a lie that you're making yourself Put believe. Put them down. They're Jimmy's toys. Your final revenge, Joanne. You had to watch Val die. Yes. You came back each night to look through the skylight. Yes. And finally, when he was dead, you came back to remove that tape. That's when you saw me. Yes. And I wanted to kill you because I was frightened of you, Mr. Clover. That's the only reason. I didn't hate you then. You've got to believe me. I didn't hate you. Joanne. But I hate you now. And I've got to kill you now, Mr. Clover. I've got to... Joanne, put down that gun. I'll kill you. (laughs) You you broke Jimmy's toys. You broke them. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, all your beautiful toys broken, broken. All your toys. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. How can you forgive me, son? I'm sorry. Hello. Give me the police department. This is Danny Clover. No, I don't want a riot squad. I want an ambulance. The doctor. It took 15 minutes for them to come, and in that time I watched the shadow soak up the remnants of her mind. How do you tell a woman her life is done? How do you fill it in reports? How do you make statistics out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write sorrow as a number? How? Broadway's really living now. It's got a creamy yogi back in circulation. Cynthia is throwing a marvelous party for Patrolman Mishikev. And the ghost, Lyle Brooks, he's haunting another author. Broadway's jaunty now, and it wears a chip on its shoulder. It's flexing its muscles and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll tear itself apart and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, was directed tonight by Cliff Howell with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. That man is coming back again. Yes, Arthur Godfrey is returning from his vacation, 
and he'll be helping some promising young performers up the ladder of success when Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts return to the air next Monday night over most of these same CBS network stations. Along with the Talent Scouts, you can hear such great shows as My Friend Irma, Inner Sanctum, The Lux Radio Theater, and The Bob Hawk Show, all on Monday nights and all on CBS. Stay tuned now for Mr. Keene, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you hear Lux Radio Theater every Monday, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice. Dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. See, it's time for another Let George Do It adventure. Now, this story has to do with a worry wart by the name of Shorty McGowan, who runs a pub over on the east side. Shorty's the type of fella who, if he hasn't got a problem, he goes out and finds one. Right now, he's just returned from a most successful hunting trip. And boy, has he got a beaut. Dear Mr. Valentine, what's become of Terry Cable? Terrence J. Cable, sweetest man ever blew foam across the woodwork in my place. Now, I suppose you could say it's none of my business why a good customer and friend like that should just up and disappear. But then again, what kind of a human being would that make you? Yeah, suppose he's in trouble. Sup- suppose he needs help. Well, Mr. Valentine, I found something yesterday in a hawk shop that scares the daylights out of me. Oh, Terry Cable's in trouble, all right. Believe you me. So get down here, will you? Give me a hand. Everybody knows where Shorty McGowan's place is. Here on East Commercial. And Shorty McGowan? Well, that's me. The guy with the towel in his hand. Watch? Just a watch? Yeah. Terry's watch. Here it is. And that's what you found in the hawk shop, right? uh, You know those ones down by the railroad station? Well... I was coming back from Mayville yesterday, uh, took a couple days rest, and walked along the street that this thing in a window just up and hit me in the eye. Terry's watch, I said. That's Terry's. Let's see. Terrence J. Cable, first place, 100-yard dash, Tri-State Conference, 1927. Sure, yeah, that's how I knew. <laughs> he liked to show it off. Something he won in high school. You know him since high school? No, 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 just the last year or so. But he come in all the time, know what I mean? Uh, he had a philosophical turn like I do. I tell you, he's the sweetest Okay, night. okay, but uh, just out of curiosity, how'd you get the watch out of the hawk shop without a ticket? Well, it hadn't been claimed. That's what I mean. I just bought it. Uh-huh. So it must have been hawked at least 30, or is it 60 days ago? Wait a minute. Why does just finding his watch in a hawk shop mean that he's in danger? I don't know. In the first what... place, young lady, he wouldn't hawk that watch. He wasn't the type. In the second place, he's not the type to just walk out of here six months ago and never come back. But I'll say goodbye, you know what I mean? And in the third place, or fourth, whichever it is, Terry Cable was expecting a check. A big, big check. Mola. 50000 he said. Okay, so what? Check from where? Well, how should I know? Rich Uncle Dudley, maybe? Uncle Sam? <laughs> Search me. But, but a man wouldn't disappear without waiting to get it, would he? And only if he got it, then why hawk the watch? See what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Maybe see why you're so interested in finding him, too. Oh, no, you don't. Not me. No, no, I'm more one of them uh, ultras, you understand? Yeah, to me, he's just a fellow human being. <laughs> I'm no more interested in his money than I was in his gun. His gun? Oh, this gets better all the time. Oh, sure, sure. He had a gun, all right. Yeah, I saw it once when he dropped something out of his pocket. <laughs> don't ask me why. A fellow's got a gun? You don't ask questions. That's what I always figure. Very considerate. Shorty, tell me some more about this cable, where he lived, his family. Now, listen, listen. It might be something, but it might not. Don't you understand? I 
tried to ask him questions like that once in a while, but he'd just laugh and go on talking about the baseball games or religious aspects, things of that type. You see, I, I don't even know where he lived or who his other friends were. All I know is, for a while, he had a job over at Fat Williams Warehouse, a load checker. Fat Williams? And also, I know this is the kind of neighborhood when things happen, you don't meddle. Me, I'm staying out of it. Only, what's become of him? It's driving me nuts. What's become of Terry Cable? You know, I think I know what's wrong with Shorty. His needle is stuck. But George will figure that out sooner or later. And while he does, let's take a minute for this. Now let's get back to the old question. What's become of Terry Cable? Cable? Never heard of. They call you Fat Williams, don't they? Call me a lot of things. So what? In the warehouse business, Sunday, not lost and found. But we were told that you Who would... told you? Who sent you around here to bother me when I'm trying to take a day off for a game of golf? Never mind who sent us. I'm just looking for Terry Cable, that's all. He worked here as a load checker once. I uh, saw a couple of hundred other bums. See out that window there? Don't see any streets for three blocks, do you? All warehouse, all mine. Got a keg of nails, I'll store it. Sure, sure. Got a hot car, you'll store that. What's that? Oh, I've heard your name before, that's all. Just take it easy. <laughs> Sonny, I thought you wanted help, not a button through your collarbone. Skip it, I said. Your place burned down here about a year ago, didn't it? I didn't realize you were still around, that's all. You mean you wanted me to know you were a real hep character? So any information I got, I better give you. Oh, these eager beavers. I can pester your employees to find out about cable. But it'd be so much easier to get information by just saying please. Now there, See? Terrence J. Cable. No home address, worked here three months, paid $52 a week. Where did he go when he left here? Fired for spending too much time in the gambling joints. Like Lou Sprinkle's place. And that's all, huh? That's all you got to say. Well, for the love of dog food, yes. What do you think I am, Sonny, a day nursery? What do I care what happened to some jerk I never even... What's that? His watch. Why'd you say so in the first place? <laughs> You want to find this guy and tell him what time it is? Oh, get out of here, will you? I got a game of golf. Sprinkle. Lou Sprinkle. Well, this is about where I thought his gambling joint was, but... Huh. Yeah. It's all new construction. Anyway, George... How would a man who earned $52 a week be able to afford such gambling? Oh, I don't know, Angel. This Terry Cable doesn't sound like a very straight character so far, does he? No. Carried a gun, expected some big money, fired from one job that we know of. You know, I'm not even sure why we're looking for him. Well, we're not going to find it behind a board fence, Angel. You're just as curious as I am why Shorty thinks it's important to find this. Oh. Hello. Admiring the building? It's going to be nice, isn't it? Good land. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you work on it? No, no, just watching. Watch every day. Going to be 115 offices in that building, mister, and all mine. Every one of the mine. Yes, sir, I own it. Oh, well, congratulations. Wait a minute. Uh, you must know this neighborhood, huh? Sure do. Been located here 15 years. B.B. Manx is my name, in case you're looking for a place to get situated. Good transportation here, you know. Central heating, each office... Oh, no, no. I'm just looking for a joint. A joint? Well, uh, Lou Sprinkle had a gambling place around oh, here. Oh, him, sure. He's got a new place across town. Real fans, they tell me. He used to be here all right, but he moved out after the fire. Well, what's the address of the... What fire? Well, the same one burned the old Manx building down. My place it was in the newspapers ten months ago. George. Mr. Manx, you're giving me an idea. Did you ever happen to know a man by the name of Terence J. Cable? Cable? Yeah. I'm searching. Hey, wait a minute. They call him Terry? Yeah, that's the one. He was a foreman, I think. Boss the cleanup gang after my fire here. Why? Never mind. You don't know what's become of him, do you? No, no. Search me. You're looking for him, huh? No. No, not anymore. George. I think I know all I need to know about him. Come on, Angel, let's play a fast hunch. Don't you get it? Terry Cable wasn't a crook at all. Just the opposite. Well, 
Uh, yes, Mr. Valentine. Terrence Cable has been with us for years. Fire insurance underwriters, George, you're right. Yeah. Every place I looked, I seemed to run into a fire. Any guy who once in a while carried a gun and who so gratuitously could wrangle jobs in places that had burned... He had money to spend in a third place that burned. Had to either have an angle or an expense account, Mr. Everett. What is Terry, a fire investigator? Uh, yeah, yes, that's right. So if that answers your question... Well, it solves the riddle. Yes, Mr. Everett. But what did he find? We can't help being curious. That fat Williams warehouse had a lot of valuable furs stored in it when it burned. And... The furs were never definitely linked with the fire. We looked them up in the newspapers. This B.B. Manx collected quite a bit on his fire, too. And as for Lou Sprinkle, knowing the kind of guy he's supposed to we be... We investigated the fires naturally. That was Terry Cable's job. But now if you'll excuse me, Mr. Valentine... But he didn't find anything wrong, is that it? He was just pulled off the case, and that's why he disappeared from that part of town. Uh, yes, yes, that's the idea. So there's really no mystery now, is there? You can go home and forget about it. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Yes? Why don't you tell us the rest of it? Where's Terry Gable now? What's become of him? Are you asking for a client or for yourself? Well, what difference would that make? Mr. Valentine, it wouldn't make any difference one way or another. You see, Terry doesn't work for us anymore. I really haven't the slightest idea where you could find him. Oh, you mean you won't tell me? Or you don't want me to look? I mean those cases are closed. Besides, Cable doesn't have anything to do with investigations anymore, so what business is it of yours? But he disappeared so quickly, we thought... Well, I don't know what became of him. Left town, I think. Now, really, Mr. Valentine... You're lying, friend. But okay, if that's the way you want it. But I'll be back. What? You don't want me nosing around because you know what's become of Terry Cable. Well, maybe your closed case will be reopened as soon as I find out why my client was so anxious to reopen it. George, I still don't understand Brooksy, why... Brooksy, that... it's simple. Look, don't you see why the insurance companies that want to protect their own good name? But what did Terry Cable have to do with Angel, their... Angel, now look, think back. It's all there. The kind of a guy Cable was, what he did, and why he disappeared. Hey, Shorty! No customers. Oh, out and back, I guess. Hey, Shorty! George! Yeah, Brooksy. I guess the explanation of Terry Cable will have to wait a while. The guy who hired us seems to be dead. Someone must have gotten tired of hearing him spout that same old question and shoved a bar rag down his throat. Well, uh, maybe it wasn't quite like that, but we'll find out all the gruesome details in just a minute. To George Valentine. The man who hired you is dead. Shorty McGowan. He's been shot. Well, if your name is George Valentine, then the mystery of what's become of Terry Cable is now more important than ever. No, Brooksy, Lieutenant Johnson said there weren't any witnesses to our friend Shorty's death. And it happened just a few minutes before we got here? Yeah, that's what the doc says. Somebody stepped in from the street and shot him, and that's it. But, George, why? He was such a friendly little man. Yeah, but it seems he's been mixed up in a few things, too. Oh, what kind of thing? Oh, petty theft, hold up once. But what's important? Never arson. Arson? Yeah, come on, Angel. Where are we going? To get a new client. The insurance underwriters. All right, you're hired. I thought I would be. Only you understand, I'd just assume the police... Sure, didn't... sure, sure. Protect your office's reputation. I understand, Mr. Robert. I'm rather new here. I'm only pinch-hitting for the regular man who runs this office, and but I... But what do you have to hide? Brooksy, Terry Cable worked for this office. He was a bonded, trusted employee. He was in charge of investigating all those fires. Yeah, worked hard, I guess. Got jobs with the guys whose buildings had burned. We and... thought he had to do it that way. There wasn't any superficial evidence of fire setting. The companies had to pay off, but we thought in time... You hoped he'd discover something about them anyway. Yes. He was convinced there was something phony about the fires. Each case resulted in actual profit as far as the owners were concerned. Okay, then let's lay the cards on the table, shall we, Mr. Everett? 
Terry Cable found some new evidence and then disappeared with it, right? Yes. He was bought off. I'm afraid so. There was plenty of proof that he left town, all right, and to show that he had destroyed his own investigation records. Some of the best men in the country have worked on it without finding But he left of his own free will. There wasn't any force. That's right, Miss Brooks. Here, this is the only concrete thing we turned up. B.B. Manx. Huh? The day before Cable disappeared, this man Manx drew $12,500 out of the bank. In cash. Nothing we can do about it because we can't prove how he spent it. But neither can he. Cash to pay off Terry Cable. But now that there's been a murder, maybe you can legally force Mr. Manx to... I called him before you came back just now. Mr. Manx seems to have disappeared, too. Oh, yeah, sure. He looked like the type. Play it safe. You might try looking for him. No, no, skip it. I've got a different way to figure out what happened a long time ago. And maybe why Shorty was murdered today. Yeah. I'm going to throw a few dice at a gambler named Lou Sprinkle. And what is this proposition, Mr. Valentine? Very simple, Mr. Sprinkle. I want some money. Does that make you a man from Mars? Who doesn't? No, I come from closer home. From Terry Cable. Is that so? Yeah, I think you've done business with Terry in the past. Yes, yes, I remember. But I don't think the nature of the business would concern you. It was gambling, of course. If you say so. (laughs) Maybe it was gambling on your part to think Terry wouldn't want to do some more business. Merely because I don't choose to make a definite statement doesn't mean that you can. All right, all right, here goes. I come from Terry right now. Terry sent me. He wants some more money. I don't think I heard you correctly, Mr. Valentine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm a very busy... And because you might not believe me, he gave me his watch to show you. Here, take a look. How much does Terry want? Oh, $10,000 that keep him quiet, I think. That's ridiculous. He said he still has testimony regarding a few fires, just in case you tried to rub any sticks together. I'd have to see this man myself or through my own representative. Do you mind? No, no, but you are willing to... I couldn't discuss it with you at all. I'm sorry. Here. What's this? Present for your trouble. A thousand dollar bill? Show it to Terry. He'll understand my good faith. So will I. Cautious, but faithful. So long, Mr. Sprinkle. George, what did you find? Made money in a hurry, Angel. I know. The hock shops are the next stop. Down by the railroad station, remember? Brooksy, what I may have found is the answer to this case. So you were going to find the answer, huh? (laughs) You can't even find the hock shop. Yeah. Looks like Shorty McGowan wasn't telling the truth even on that one, was he? Well, there's not a single pawn shop where they remember ever having that watch of Terry's. Uh Uh-huh. So from here on, the answer is one, two, three. What could have happened, Angel? So I'm going to try a trip to Maryville. To where? It's not far, and that wasn't a lie. Shorty just let that one slip. The place he'd been for a couple of days, remember? You know what I'm going to look for in Maryville? Terry Cable himself. Hey there, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, right here. My name's Duncan. Chief of Police asked me to meet you. Thought you might be driving. No, no, no. The train's a couple of hours faster. Only maybe you figure in this kind of a case, speed isn't important. Well, I wouldn't say that. Of course, we do things a little differently out here. Let me have your bag there. Okay, thanks. Did you get the description? Oh, yes, yes. We got that all right. Miss Brooks phoned it up. They sent the wire photo fingerprints and all that fancy sort of stuff. But, you see, we really haven't gotten around to your case yet. Ah, yeah. Well, as soon as you do... We're a little understaffed here, and we've been pretty busy with something else. Here's the car, up you. Okay. You figure this Terry Cable may be living around here. Huh? Well, it's not such a long shot. A man named Shorty McGowan apparently came up here and then returned with Terry's watch. Of course, that doesn't mean Terry would still be using his same name. Yes, or yes, yes, I understand all that. Do you? Not quite sure I do. <laughs> well, let me tell you some of our problems. and It'll take your mind off it. You see, there's a county graveyard out here and doesn't have a care to Yeah, well, look, or... Duncan, I'm only interested in... And a couple of days ago, there's been some digging where there shouldn't have been. What? Don't mind if we go out and take a little look, do you? That's why I couldn't get right on your case, you see. The county inspector claims there's one too many bodies out there. Since when? 
<laughs> See, I thought you might be interested. It's nothing recent. In fact, it's uh, since maybe six months ago. About the time Cable disappeared. Now, I guess you don't mind a little side trip, do you? Got a man over there working on it now. The guy with the shovel, huh? Yes. You see, what happened was somebody noticed the earth had been turned up since the last rain. Only when we take a look, it wasn't a new body thrown in. It was just an old one. It had been put there three months ago. How do you know it was originally put there about the same time Cable disappeared? Well, that's the easiest time to do it, isn't it? <laughs> Not a bad way to get rid of a body. Just add him in when the grave is fresh. I mean, the time to do it was exactly six all months. All right, all right. Only let's get rid of that guy with the shovel quick, huh? Why, it's getting dark. I want to get back to something. No, no, listen to me. The extra body, if it's Terry Cable, was put in there months ago, right? And what happened two or three days ago was just that the ground got disturbed. But that's right. Only... Like disturbed by somebody looking for a watch. Look, I got a complete file on Cable. Now, the thing for us to do, if we want to identify him once and for all, is to get him out no, of No, no, get that workman of yours out of here. I don't catch you. Look, I told you, the train's a lot faster than a car, so it's getting dark. That's all the better. The thing for us to do, friend, is miss our supper. Why? Because maybe I got here first. Okay, so here I'll be, digging. Be careful you don't strain yourself on the train. Quiet, will you? You're just supposed to be watching. You know, I watched a digging scene once in Hamlet. That's by Shakespeare. You don't say. The grave digger, he worked just about as slow as you do. Come across the skull, as I remember, just when... Hey, shh, wait a minute. Automobile. Yeah, but no headlights. You know. You sure make a pretty target out there in the moonlight. You sure make lousy jokes sitting there in that... Oh, hold it. Automobile stop. Yeah. Somebody's getting out. Okay, stay out of sight and wish me luck, friend. Right. Back to work. Hey! Hey, you! Yeah? Come in. Who is it? Tom Tyne. Come in. Oh. Oh, you know me, huh? Been watching me all day, I guess, the way you watch Shorty. How'd you get out of here? Oh, don't worry, I'm alone. I saw the body, though. Yeah, it's Terry Cable, all right. Pretty neat place to get rid of him six months ago. So Nietzsche didn't even have to bother to take his watch. But Shorty did. He finally figured it out, didn't he, huh? Came up here, found Terry's body in the watch. And then hired me to put a little fear into you so he could shake you down the way you shook him. Go on, talk all you like. Only be careful coming through that fence. Yeah, sure, I'll be careful. You don't want another body out here to explain. Because that's what happened, isn't it, mister? You guys had fraudulent fires and then bought the investigator off, huh? 12500 each. Only Cable was expecting 50000 as I remember. So that'd probably mean four of you instead of three, wouldn't it? Fat Williams, B.B. Manx, Lou Sprinkle, and who? Shorty McGowan himself? Was he the fourth? He have a fire, too? <laughs> Put down the shovel and get into the car. No, no, wait a minute. I know who you are, all right, only... Do you? Sure, sure. How's your game of golf? I guess the minute I left your office, you knew who'd sent me, and you headed right over to kill Shorty. To shut him up before he could go any farther. You've gone far enough, too. Fat Williams, the big shot. But a big secret, right? Something that Lou Sprinkle, for instance, didn't seem to know. That Terry Cable was really dead. That you killed him. Yeah. You're smart, too, aren't you? Well, it's fairly simple. You didn't pay Terry off. You just killed him. In six months' time, Shorty finally caught on to it. Yeah, Shorty was smart. He stole some furs. Did he tell you that? Furs? Oh, yeah, sure, from your warehouse. So that's what tied him in, huh? He worked with us. He was the fourth one. Look where it got him. Buster, don't try to tie the others in with you like that. Manx and Sprinkle may have been worried about their fires, but they paid off in cash. I suppose Shorty paid off, too. Only Terry was expecting a check. One check. He was smart. He'd want it that way. Yeah. So one of you must have collected the payoff dough from the others, one like you. Only instead of a payoff, you kept the dough yourself and killed the investigator. Yeah, that's all that happened. That's all that Shorty found out. Shut up and get in the car. By tomorrow, Sonny, nobody will even know we've been here. Hey, what? The gun hasn't paid. You... That's all. 
Pretty fancy shooting for nighttime, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, sure. You'll get a medal. You missed him a mile. Hey, what? But thanks for spoiling his aim. I hit him with a shovel. Now there's irony for you. The great George Valentine saved by a spade. Get it? Spade? Sam Spade? Okay, sue me. But first, give a listen to this. Don't you understand, Angel? Apparently, Terry Cable wasn't even crooked. Six months ago, Fat Williams just persuaded the others that Cable was... Then he pocketed their dough and killed Cable. The insurance people and his family and everybody will be awfully glad that you cleared his name. Only, George, I still don't understand how you knew it had to be Fat Williams. Well, you remember, Angel, he's the only one I showed that watch to before Shorty's death. So he's the only one who could have known that Cable's body had actually been found. In other words, that Shorty's nosing around had finally made it necessary for him to be killed. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Wow. No, I mean it. Your powers of observation, your logic. Wow. You know, George... While you were up in Maryville, I did some shopping. I found a real bargain on kitchenware, so being a girl who plans ahead, I bought some. Kitchenware, Angel? Mm-hmm. For your one-room apartment? What in heaven's name for? Well, like I said, planning ahead. You'll find out. You have just heard What Became of Terry Cable, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and the music was by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, did you ever hear of a fearless clown... Well, just in case you haven't, that's the title of our Let George Do It adventure. Now, you're probably wondering what a clown has to fear in the first place, unless maybe it's a nasty elephant. And in the second place, how would you know when he's behind a couple of inches of grease paint? Well, all I know is that a very nervous girl is most concerned about a certain clown, and she's telling George Valentine all about it. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm sure you've heard of Fofo, the fearless clown. Maybe you've already seen his circus before, but it's here in town, opening tonight with an all-new show. And if he's ever scared you with a snake or or made you laugh with his crazy tumbling, and I'll bet, like everybody else, you must have thought he's a wonderful person. But I know that he's not. In fact, if Fofo should happen to die, I am the person who killed him. What I mean is, Mr. Valentine, I've already practically confessed to his murder. It's your job to keep the most horrible man in the world alive. Sincerely, Relita. P.S. I'm the girl in the strawberry collared tights. Hey, there she is. Riding the lead elephant. How could you miss her? 
Oh, you spotted her before, this Relita? The tight starring. Oh. Or didn't you notice them? Foolish question. <laughs> Opening parade. She said we could catch her after the performance. That's a good idea. It'd take a stepladder to get down off that elephant any other way, wouldn't it? Brooksy, I'll tell you a secret. Hmm? You don't get down off an elephant. You get it off a duck. Oh, George. <laughs> George! Oh, no, take it easy, Angel. That's the star of the piece, that's all. Go for himself. You know, he's about the only performer who's ever worked up to owning his own circus. Must be quite George, a guy. he's got a snake. It came right out of his suitcase. Sure, sure. It's a good act to lead the parade with. But look at it. George, it's a cobra. Oh. Take it easy, take it easy. Putty nose and the calm rig is what makes it look so exciting. He's jumping rope with it. Brooksy, I'll tell you something. The fearless little man with his snakes. Hey, look, he's turning somersaults now in front of the elephant. But he's the man you're supposed to keep alive. Don't worry, I told you. For your information, there's not one snake in this circus that doesn't eat with false teeth. What? Yeah, sure. It just looks dangerous, that's all. That guy's not crazy. All his snakes are a fraud. Maybe he is, too. I don't know. <laughs> well, I should have known, but... Hey, the elephant. We'll eat his own. He's charging. But Fofo's turning somersaults right in front of him. Oh, George! Come on, get through the crowd. I'm sure ended in a hurry. That elephant just went crazy. Fofo didn't even see him coming. You didn't even have a chance to keep him alive. Look, see, what I want to find out was in the first part of Relita's letter. Maybe it was the elephant who trampled him, but remember? She said, if Fofo should happen to die, I'm the person who killed him. Looks like poor old Fofo has gone bye-bye. And you know what? They'll probably blame it all on that nice elephant. We'll find out what's going on behind the scene in just a minute. But first, let's take time out for this. Now let's get back to George and Brooksy. Right now, they're backstage at the circus. George. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Doctor says he's still alive. They got him into the ambulance as fast as possible. He's on his way to the hospital right now. Mr. Valentine, it was... It was an accident, wasn't it? Well? George, you saw it yourself. That elephant just went crazy or something, didn't you see? He charged straight ahead. If Fofo hadn't been so close sure, to Sure, sure, I saw it, all right. Relita, I think you'd better tell me about yourself in a hurry. Yes, of course. I, well, it's, it's really quite simple. I, I, I'm new with the circus. I, uh, I do a little acrobatic dancing. I, I used to be with an act in nightclubs. Well, it's, it's rather hard to say this. I, I'm married, you see, and, oh, Mr. Valentine, Fofo's death was an accident. That's all it could have been. Relita, we do need to know your story, but maybe not all of it. Well, it, it's, Fofo is very attractive and charming, and, well, anyway, he saw me, he saw me act, and I, I met him. He wanted me to come with the circus. Now I have to stay with the circus. What do you mean? I think he must have enjoyed being in danger. I I got mixed up with him. What do you think I okay, mean? Okay, okay. Emotional blackmail. Does that make it simpler for you? I wrote exactly why I was going to kill him. And Well, don't look like that. I didn't give him the letter or, or go out and buy a gun. In fact, I just tore it up. Or no, what I mean is I put it in my wastebasket. I, I'd worked on my scheme, I guess. Anyway, I wrote everything to my husband instead, and I mailed that, and he understands. Well, why were you so frightened? Why did you want me? After the show that night, I came back to my dressing room, and, and the note I wrote to Fofo was gone, disappeared. Somebody had taken it out of my wastebasket. Uh-huh. You wanted me to find out who and get the letter back, huh? Yes, whoever had that note could murder Fofo and use it to put the blame on you. And I don't know who that could be. I don't know the people around here yet, but... Oh, was so popular. I can't imagine anyone else wanting to use that letter. I to... would kill him any day of the week. What? Otto. Uh, the show must go on. But somebody else can lead the band. Eh? I wanted to find you, my child. Lolita, she will be all upset, I said to myself. Otto, what did you mean? You said you'd kill Fofo? Who are these people? Oh, uh, Miss Brooks. Mr. Valentine, he's, he's sort of a detective. Well, naturally, I would expect that. Relita was just telling us that she doesn't have many friends around the circus yet. So? She has me and my brother, too. The boy, Freddy. Have you seen where he is, Relita? No, I haven't, but what did you mean Sure, when... come on, let's have it. Why would you kill Fofo? 
Everybody knows that. My foot, you see? I didn't always toodle on an oboe and wave batons in a striped coat. I was on the wire. Otto the Magnificent. <laughs> yeah. So one day I fell and was injured. But Fofo, you think he would help pay my two years of hospital bills, the way the law says? Then why did you come back to his circus? Why not? Perhaps to kill Fofo. I don't know. But neither does Fofo. That's what makes it interesting. Oh, Otto, stop it. You shouldn't say things like that. You are very mixed up, my child. And very innocent. Uh Uh-huh. And you're trying to tell her that nobody likes Fofo, check? Light. Past tense. He was popular because he always liked to have around him the people who hated him. If this makes no sense, why try to understand that he's dead, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, practically. Killed by an elephant. Otto, is that true? That there were others besides me? Then then that letter I wrote is, isn't so important at all, is it, Mr. Valentine? Everybody hated him. Even my little brother, Freddy. The sweetest boy in the world. And a good entertainer, too, but out of a job. You think Fofo would give him work? No, no, Fofo laughs. He thinks it is funny I should have to support my brother. Skip it, Otto. What about the man who was with the elephant? What? The the one walking alongside when it happened in there. Trainer, whatever he is. Mm, His name is Boxer. Well, I don't know. But he probably hates Fofo, too. Okay, thanks. You've covered up enough for Alita. What, George? Where are you going? Well, I'll start with the snakes, I guess. Down this way, I guess. You sure that snake is locked up tight in that box? Well, Susie here? <laughs> Don't you worry about her, mister. Not a fang in the circus, didn't you know that? Harmless is a ten-foot piece of garden hose or a, a goddess snake. Yeah, well, never mind showing me. Just keep the lid shut, huh, will you? Sure, all right. <laughs> Some people don't like snakes, I guess. Me, I kept him in my bathtub at home ever since I was a kid. Me, I... Is that him over there? Yeah, yeah, there he is. Got them all chained up separate. Well, that's the sheriff's work. Poor old Emir. You know that elephant's been with us almost five oh, years. Him? Oh, hello, Boxer. Me is all it's him. I'm George Valentine. Oh, uh, yeah. Sheriff sent word. Snooping, huh? No, not exactly. Boy, look at the chains they got on him. No, what's the matter, baby? They got you. All right, all right. Show them the snakes. That's what you come down here for, ain't sure, it? Oh, sure, Boxer. Take it easy. All right, there we go, Susie. Don't eat up all his hay now. Wait a minute now. Better not let that snake get so close to his trunk, had you? Look, Mr. Valentine, the Amy here wouldn't care if a snake crawled up his trunk. Okay, okay. Hey, look, get her out of here, will you? That's good, thanks. You're welcome. All right, Susie, off we go. Back to bed, that's your bed. So it wasn't the snake, huh? Come here, Mr. Valentine. Ah, uh, don't be afraid. The ammo won't step on you. Ah, uh, no, boy. Give me your rear, boy. Ah, uh, that's it. Here, look. What's that? Bunch of brands? Same idea, only you mark the ear. See? Double X, that's one circus. Triangle, that's another. Crossed lances, little crown. That, that's for digging trees up for some Maharaja. Yeah, a whole string of them. In other words, the Amy has been through the wars, huh? He's older than you or I or anybody else around here. Been everywhere and done everything. And Mr. Valentine never once has he caused a bit of trouble. A freight train couldn't make him nervous or jumpy. Then what did? I don't know. Suppose somebody put a lighted cigarette to his ear. Well... Suppose that stick you carry just happened to poke him at the right time. There was only me and the girl on top near him. Nobody did nothing like that. Well, if he's such a peaceful elephant, then how do you explain his actions? Maybe you don't explain it. Animals are funny, Mr. Valentine. Sure, sure, I know. An elephant never forgets. So maybe he didn't like Fofo either, huh? Don't be ridiculous. All right, then what happened? Something sent the aimer off. George. Yeah, Brooksy, out here. I'm just trying Come to... Here. quick. Huh? Here. Over here, George. What's happened? You here from the hospital? Yes, but... Here he is. Yes, well, this is Mr. Valentine. Now, that's right. Who are you? George, it's Fofo. Yes, of course it's me. <laughs> a quick recovery, wasn't it? I think I have nine lives. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Fofo! What happened? 
What are you doing here? Now, hello, Otto. Relika? Well, don't all stand there as though I were a ghost or something. I've been down to the hospital. I was in town. I heard on the radio what happened. George, he died. The sheriff just called. Wait. Wait. I don't understand. Oh, I get it. Somebody else was doing your act for you. All that clown makeup and costume, yes, somebody... Yes, yes. Ah, but Otto, I'm so terribly sorry. Only you yourself kept asking me to give Freddy a chance. Freddy! <gasps> Otto! <coughs> Poor fellow. He loved his younger brother a great deal. And he wanted him to work so badly. It's really his fault, I suppose, that Freddy is dead, no? Well, it couldn't be anyone else's fault, could it? Return to our adventure with George Valentine in just a moment. Now, back to George Valentine. Fofo, the fearless clown, seems to be a man with nine lives because it never occurred to you or the other thousand people who saw an elephant suddenly run berserk and trample him that the man under all that makeup wasn't Fofo. No, it was really a boy named Freddy who only wanted a job with Fofo's circus. Well, now Freddy is dead. And if your name is George Valentine, you go down to the hospital to make sure of your facts this time. Of course it was Freddy. Who else would it be? He spoke to them, the doctor said. Did you hear what that doctor with the glasses said? Freddy didn't say anything, Otto. He couldn't help any. No. No. How could a poor boy know who killed him? Oh, Otto, Otto, snap out of it, will you please? I know how much you love your brother. But what's done is done. Yes, yes. Besides, what do you mean, know who killed him? Did I say that? Well, why not? Fofo killed him. How do you figure that? Look, closing time. All around us people going home. But for the circus, time off, that's all. Two hours between afternoon and night performances. Freddy liked the night performance best. Look, Otto, I asked you why Fofo would kill your brother. I don't know. You mean because Fofo so gratuitously took this afternoon off? So, accidentally put your brother in his place? It was a new performance. Yeah, yeah, that's what the big man told Miss Brooks. New lights, new costumes, new music, the works. Fofo wanted to drag some publicity men from downtown, to watch with him from out front for a change. That's what he told Miss Brooks. You think it's a lie? Everything he does is a lie. Okay, prove it. I... I can't. And, Mr. Valentine, you will waste your time forever if you try to. You can't always win... So... All right, wait a minute. Come on, hop in. I'll drive you back to the grounds. No, no, it is closing time for me to... Well, where are you going? I will walk back through the park, I think. Go, oh, I'll see you later. I'm not young enough to just walk out on a job. All I mean is for me, it is awful. I will stop trying to say Fofo is evil. I will let you waste your time. <laughs> This is dressing room? In the railroad car, George. It's the drawing room. Oh, yeah. Nice way to live. Sure he's gone? It's through the office part, they said. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Keep out. Private. Do not disturb. <laughs> nice, friendly sort of guy. George, wait. Well, Mr. Valentine. You're snooping, huh? Perhaps you came to steal something, huh? Yeah, maybe I did, Fofo. A letter. Uh-huh. A letter? <laughs> Let me see. You represent Relita, don't you? So, I guess I might as well start looking, huh? Where is it, the desk? You know, I like you. You are very shrewd. Now, look, Buster, she wrote a letter. It explained what kind of a guy you are. And why she would like to kill me. So the letter disappears. Somebody stole it. It doesn't take much shrewdness to figure you're the boy who took it. Relita's very young. She needed to be taught a lesson. She's already learned it. Stay away from clowns. 
Bon, I suppose you got a lot of fun out of scaring her to death. Now, here. You may have it. It has served its purpose. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Fofo, you enjoy things like this, don't you? <laughs> what this guy Otto says about you is true. I think we can skip the psychoanalysis, yeah? Otto's stupid. He would never be able to do anything about the way he feels. I might. Sit down, Valentine. You know, you advertise for danger. You're the kind of man I've always wanted to meet. Oh, no thanks, Buster. My job's finished. Huh? Yeah, the reason I was hired, at least. So now the coast's clear to solve a murder, isn't it? And right now, I'd rather hear what Boxer has to say. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Here, hold a flashlight a minute. Well, maybe Fofo let it slip, but he mentioned you were claiming the aim here wasn't to blame. I know, I know. And earlier I said I couldn't see how anybody could have made the aim or do it. I still don't. But you say one of the men heard someone out here. That's right, Miss Brooks. Two nights ago. Roustabout says the aimer was snorting around. Sure. Of course, I told Fofo. But you think he'd be interested if it was murder? You think he'd do anything but laugh over it? All right, skip it, Boxer. Just what happened two nights ago? Well, this roustabout was waked up by the aimer. Came over to see what was the matter. Sure, there was a man here. But he disappeared before he could get a look. Didn't report it. Didn't think it was important until today. George, look. Hmm. It's a sliver. Thin little sliver of wood. Huh? Uh-huh. Looks like a chip from the sawdust. Let's see what it looks no, like. No, wait a minute. Look out. It's broken already. Polished white wood. That's not sawdust. Well, maybe it's sharp. But that's nothing you're going to hurt an elephant with either. Here, I'll show you how tough the aimer's skin is. Don't poke him. If you think that was what was riling him up, when you got another thing oh, coming. Hold it. Now, you listen to me. Boxer, what would happen if you took the elephant here back into the main tent? The way he was when he tore loose this afternoon when the accident happened. I don't get you. But you guarantee to the sheriff to have enough chains or enough men to keep him under control? I sure are. All right, the tent's empty now. It's between shows. Everybody's available. Yeah. George, what do you want to do? A little reconstruction, Brooksy. It just occurred to me that the only one who can solve this crime in a hurry is the aimer himself. You all set, Otto? You want everything the same. All right, all right. Start your silliness. Old Salpus himself. Where have you been? <laughs> I'm back, aren't I? I guess, Mr. Valentine, I've been thinking about what Fofo should think about. How you can't always win. That you will never teach him. What do you mean? All right, let's get this parade going. Come on, you know, the sour pussy plays bad music anyway. Why aren't you ready to walk through this thing, Fofo? Haven't even brought your snake box in yet. Haven't even started a somersault. No, I will do my part. Don't worry, I'm not afraid. Oh, skip it. It's because you know I don't need to go through with it, isn't it? Is it? Sure. It's because you know I've already got the answer. Have you? Yeah. Yeah, on the way back from the hospital, I stopped to pick up a book on elephants. Take the aimer here. He's been through the wars, hasn't he? No, that, that band is making so much noise. Oh, you're I... with me, all right. But here, look. The brand marks on the aimer's ear. Boxer! Give me the stick there. Well, don't you want me to lead him around like I did? No, I take him. I can handle him. Well, give it to me, I said. Well, sure, boss. Never mind, never mind. Here, take a look. Three X's. That's a circus. A crown. Boxer says he must have pulled up trees for a Maharaja once. Cross lances. Well, in India, that was the best job an elephant could get, wasn't it? Only goes to the biggest and finest. Battle elephant. You are the expert, not me. I suppose the lances might mean that. What are you driving at? The aimer's memory. Something way back in his training. Something he'd do on the right command automatically, fast as lightning. Practically a reflex action. Yeah, well, go on. What's up, Valentine? Oh, let's get this over with, Sheriff. I don't like it. Otto, stop that music. Hey, Otto, stop it. What's the matter? Okay, now. Play the same tune you played this afternoon. What? But I have told you, everything is the same Opening as Opening performance was... of the new show was this afternoon. Sure, that's right. Everything was new, even costumes and music. So play that same march. Sure, I told you it was different, Otto. Yes, go on, Otto. You write the music, play it. Mr. Valentine wants everything the same. Unless you are afraid to. Be quiet, would you? Otto, your instrument, I remember, is an oboe, a reed instrument. Well, is this white sliver of wood yours? It's a broken reed. What? 
Somebody dropped it the other night doing something that made the aimer get all excited. Playing softly in his ear, maybe. Testing a composition, maybe. I, I, I don't understand at all. I... Yes, you do. You're wasting time. Come on, boys. You don't need a leader. Play out those same arrangement you did this afternoon. Wait! Let her go! Here we are, Valentine. The Emir and I. What's the matter, Otto? The Emir here is really harmless. But if a man were turning somersaults in front of him and suddenly some horn started blaring out. Wait! No, Mr. Valentine. Wait, boys! I don't know the notes, but something deep in the elephant's memory, maybe. Battle elephant. And I suppose there must be a call for charge. At least that's what they use battle elephants for. Stop it! Stop that music! Stop it! Stop it! All right. I am the one you want. Imagine trying to kill me? <laughs> He's tried it before, but that's what his scheme was. Oh, he had good enough reason, I guess. No, but the irony of it, Mr. Valentine, he worked up such a beautiful way to kill me. I always told him he was never smart, no. <laughs> and then his plan backfired so tragically. No wonder he fainted when I told him his brother had taken my place. Uh-huh. Well, I just talked to Otto back there. He won't say anything. But how can he? Because he can't really prove that you'd caught on to what his plan was, that you had his brother take your place on purpose... <laughs> well, and uh, can you prove it? No, of course not. So why talk about it then, huh? Yeah, that's right. Why talk about it? George, let's get out of here. Oh, leave me alone for a minute, will you, Angel? Don't you see? Fofo's right. I can't prove it. We will return to our adventure with George Valentine in just a moment. Well, the aimer won't have to be shot now. That's one good thing come out of it. Oh, sure, sure, Boxer. And you can go right on having trouble with your boss, and Relita can still be practically blackmailed by the guy who's still got his eye on Oh, George, stop beating yourself. There's mm. nothing you can do about it. You said so yourself. Yeah, sure. In fact, Otto told me that earlier, before he stumbled off to walk in the park. Said I'd waste my time forever if I tried to get back at Fofo. You can't always win, he said. Oh, poor Otto wasn't bright enough to get rid of Fofo. And I came along, so he never got another chance at him. Uh, maybe I don't mean that. I don't know. Well, on with the show. Sure. Listen to them in there. In a couple of minutes, the fearless fraud will come galloping in with his little suitcase, opening the parade. And the people will scream and clap their hands for him and the snake with false teeth and his somersaults in front of the Amir. So we don't like the way it ends, Brooksy. Hey, there's a police car come back to meet us, I guess. Come on, let's go. Only. What's the matter? Otto said a couple of funny things. It was odd his not being willing to talk about anything after he confessed. What? In fact, it was funny he didn't confess earlier. The shock of finding he'd been responsible for killing his brother and all. What are you talking about? That policeman getting out of the car as a funny cab. Made me remember Otto's wanting to go to the park, that's all, then Mr. showing Mr. up later. Mr. Valentine, this guy's from the park. Yeah, so I noticed. City Park Zoo. We need help fast. Along about closing time, somebody broke into the snake house at the zoo. And, buddy, our snakes aren't amateurs. Our biggest cobra is missing. You have just heard The Fearless Clown, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and the music was by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it.
Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Are you all set for another visit with Valentine? I hope so. Because, as always, we have what I think is a real peachy little bit of mayhem in store for you. It's a little thing called Sucker Stunt, which will give you a rough idea as to what is about to take place. In case you want the gaps filled in, why don't you forget about me and watch how George handles the situation on Let George Do It. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, I'll be back around 10.30 and then we'll get the guy. What? Go on. Well, that's all it says, George. Just a note shoved under the door. I found it when I opened up. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'll be back around 10.30 and then we'll get the guy. There's no time or signature. Hello. What's the matter? You waited for me, didn't you? Oh, I'm Tim McGean. Is that supposed to mean something? Well, sure, I'm the guy who... Yeah, I know, I know. You wrote this note. But you didn't sign it. I what? What? How do you like that? Uh, I'm so wound up, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, sure, Tim again, that's my name. Sit down, you look worn out. Been up all night? Uh, working. Here, let me unload. Huh? I'm a photographer, see? Yeah, so I notice. Work up the north side of town. You know, weekly newspaper, that kind of stuff. I'm doing all right, see? I could support her myself. That's what gets me. That's what I don't understand. Her? I thought it was a guy you were out to get. Oh, well, sure. His name is Florio. Uh... I think you'd better start at the beginning. What happened? Did somebody steal your girl? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. It's my kid's sister, see? She's only 18, lives with an aunt, but I feel sort of responsible. But you know how girls that age are. She won't listen to anything. She mixed up with this guy? I'm afraid she'll marry him. This address is down here. What's wrong with him? Why do you need me? Look, Mr. Valentine, I'm just an ordinary dull jerk. My sister won't listen to me. But I want you to see this guy. All this romantic European stuff, there's something fishy with it. Look, I still don't get it. What's fishy about it? Look, he's never told her what his business is. And he won't tell her. He's a good 20 years older than her. I I phoned him once. You know, trying to meet him, have a beer or something. But you know what he said? It was none of my business. Had to stay away from him or I'd get a nosebleed. Ah, Nice guy. Okay, Tim, you got his address. Let's go take a look at Florio's nose. Uh, just for size. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a minute. Now back to George Valentine and Let George Do It. Are you married? Oh, I used to be, but she wasn't much. It was no good. We're sort of separated. Maybe that's it. I've been a sucker Wait a myself. Hold you, uh, you said 412, didn't you? Florio's. We buy and sell. Looks more like a bookie joint. Jewelry, leather goods, exchange, musical instruments. Well, that must be him right there in the window, that dark boy with the light teeth. <laughs> Busy as a beaver. Okay, I'll go inside and take a look. No, but what are you going to say? You'll spoil everything if you, if you tell him. Don't you worry, don't worry. I'll think of something. Look, if you can strike up a conversation, make him spend a little time, maybe you could... Wait a minute, here. Here, take this. Huh? Sell it to him. Your camera? Yeah, sure. It's got a couple scratches. Anyway, I got another. I get him wholesale. Well, from the looks of the place, you'll probably get clipped. <laughs> That's what I mean. It'd be worth the price even to have that much on him. Here, ask for 175 That's what it was, wholesale. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's another sucker stunt, but okay. I'll wait for you. Good morning. Hello. You, Florio? You the boss? Also the cook and bottle washer. You have business? Uh, yeah. Of course, Mr. Valentine. It's a pleasure. Oh, you know me? Oh, yes. I have been in this neighborhood 15 years. But is it the camera? Yeah. Sell or loan? Well, see what it's worth. Mm-hmm. 
Don't think I've ever stopped in your shop here before. Pretty good business? Pretty good taxes. How is your business, Mr. Valentine? You must get a great many strange cases. Oh, I do. Well, a Jefferson Mini, eh? Two nine lens. Yeah, good condition. Practically new. Oh, it seems a shame to sell. Uh, do you have a little time? Why? Oh, not about the camera. I just thought you might have lunch. You see, if <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, my wife is a great admirer of yours. Your uh, wife, Florio? My boss. My bed is three quarters. Not beautiful, but <laughs> then so am I. And such a wonderful... Uh, Florio, let me see huh? that camera a second, will you? All the scratches I didn't even notice. No, neither did I. Nice compact camera, though. Mm-hmm. Fits in my pocket without it even being noticed. Yes, why sell it? But if you wish, I give you a loan. But this is not important. It is lunch with me and my wife and children. I'd love to, and... Florio, but uh, some other time, okay? Uh-huh. Right now, I gotta straighten out a sucker. Hey, but what did he say? What did he Here's t- the money. Twenty-five bucks. Twenty-five? What's the matter? Not enough? Oh, sure, but. All right, come on back to the office. I want you to sign a receipt. But, well, Mr. Valentine, I got work to Look, do today. If a I... guy's crooked, you want him nailed legally. Well, come on, come on, let's get going. Mr. Valentine, what is this? You've been driving almost three hours now. Mr. Valentine doesn't like to talk while he drives. But even when you went back up to the office, you didn't explain. I had some phone calls to make, that's all. I think he telephoned your sister, Tim. Oh, is that nice, Angel? Hmm? He knows he hasn't got a sister. Now, look. Just like he knows that the first time he saw Florio was probably when he walked by the shop this morning. Took a look at Florio so he could describe him to me. Look, I I don't understand you at all. I don't know. Okay. If I'd known that you weren't going to believe anything I said, I'd have gone someplace else. Holy smoke, look at the time. I got work to do. What do you think you're taking me anyway? My wife will be worried if I don't phone her. Oh, I thought you said you were separated from your wife, that she was no good. Well, well, well yeah. How could you phone her if she doesn't have a number? What? I checked that. While George was talking to the police. To the police? Well, well, sure, sure. I really got a wife, but she don't live in the city. We don't even speak. What is this, Apple Junction? Don't you know? No, no. Never been out this way before. Oh. May I read him the early morning newspaper, George? It's just a little item, not very important. Um, Mr. Ben Roberts, a salesman for the Fruit Growers Equipment Company, said that he picked up the hitchhiker about 100 miles north of Apple Junction shortly after midnight and that the man held him up and left him after traveling south only a few miles. The man was described as ordinary in appearance, about 35 years old, about 5 feet 9 inches in height, wearing overcoat and hat. Well, I, I guess that could be almost anybody, couldn't it? Hmm. Uh, taken from Mr. Roberts was $112 in cash, including a $50 bill, a good luck Canadian dollar, and a brand new camera, Jefferson Miniature, with an F-29 lens. Hey, that's a coincidence. Yeah, isn't it? Doesn't say anything about scratches, does it, Angel? Where the camera serial number should have been? No, George. Now listen, both of you... Oh, Tim, it's as old as the hills, that gag. You want to fence a stolen item, but you see a newspaper story about it, so you want to be careful. You get somebody like me, who's known in the neighborhood, to make the sale for you. After I'd handed you the money, you'd have made up another bright story and disappeared. That's not true. I didn't say it was. I haven't accused you of anything. But, brother, you used the word sucker a little too loosely. Oh, I know I, I stick my neck out putting an ad like mine in the paper. And all too often, bright boys like you try to take advantage George, of George, turn right. There's the sheriff's office. Yeah. No, let me out. Please let me out. I'll, I'll explain everything. For once, Buster, I'm going to make a sucker out of the guy who tried to make me a sucker. No, please. Please keep going. I, I didn't do it. i never even been this town before, honest. Well, well, look who's here. If it ain't Tim again. Been away? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, sucker. Now I start enjoying myself. <laughs> Well, Tim here has never really been in any trouble before, Mr. Valentine, but he sure fits the description. Yeah, I'll say he does. Oh, be quiet, will you? What are you doing here anyway, Ames? He's the hired hand out of my wife's place, Mr. Valentine. Nobody believes him. I sent for him just a few minutes ago. Well, day off. I guess I can do anything I want, can't I? Ben, 
Oh, Ben. Uh, right here, Sheriff. Just admiring the calendars in your office. Better than the ones in the barber shop. <laughs> oh, excuse me, lady. Ben Roberts, Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Roberts, the uh, one who was robbed at midnight last night? First time in 17 years on this road. Let me tell you, Mac, I've picked up hitchhikers all my life, and not a single one of them has ever held me up. Give it. Is this the guy, Ben? Of course not. Of course I'm not. Is he? Well, it was night. Uh, I don't want to just come right Here's out. Here's the camera. He scratched off the serial number. He hasn't been searched yet for the money, but... I'll do it right now. Let go. I'll make Here. it your hands off. Here, here's his wallet. It's your pen, ain't it, Ben? Me? Sure, with a trick flashlight. You showed it to me once, remember? Yeah. Look, I found it, I tell you. I found it someplace yesterday. I, I oh, don't stop know... stop trying so hard, Tim. Here's a $50 bill in the wallet. You don't see them very often. George, look, a Canadian dollar. Oh, cut it out. I don't have to see all that stuff. You don't have to be a nice guy, Mr. Roberts. Yeah. Who's kidding who? I recognize him. Sorry, sucker. Okay, Sheriff, that's it. So long, Tim. I'll get even with you, Valentine. Hold on a minute, Valentine. Mm. You're not leaving. While you were out driving with this bird, I got another case. What do you mean? Well, apparently sometime around midnight last night, about 50 miles south of here, that's where Tim McGeehan's wife lived, well, that's when the doctor says she was murdered. What's that? What'd you say? My wife? Oh, no, she can't be. And at the same time, Tim was committing a robbery 100 miles north of town. That's what I mean, Valentine. I really need your help. Tim's the only good suspect. But since you proved he couldn't do it, I mean, well, now you've given him a perfect alibi. Okay, okay, Sheriff, don't rub it in. And all I wanted was to keep from being played for a sucker. Oh, brother. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a minute. And now back to George Valentine. If your name is George Valentine, you don't enjoy being played for a sucker. And so when Tim McGean comes into your office with a weak-kneed story, you waste no time in turning the tables on him. You take him out to Apple Junction, where you prove that he committed the hitchhike robbery of a salesman north of town. Oh, no, you're no sucker. Not much. Because now you find that at exactly the same time, Tim's wife was being murdered south of town. Ben, you you could have made a mistake, couldn't you? Well, I might have, George. Uh, that's your name, isn't it, George? We had a sales manager once whose name... Yeah, was... well, I mean, uh, when you identified that guy, he's strictly a medium-sized, medium-everything character. You can say that again. Well, uh, you you hesitated. Yeah, I remember you hesitated. Uh, that's right, George. So I did. A man hates that point of finger, and another man to say, put him in jail. Yeah, I know how you feel. But, uh... Maybe you were wrong. Well, huh? now, a man's a fool if he don't say he's wrong once in a while. At least that's what the milkman said to the prize by his wife. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, it was late at night. Maybe you were out with some of the boys earlier. Uh, don't remember too well. Tell you a funny thing about me, George. I like a good time as well as the next fellow, but not when I'm working. See that? You don't get solid gold watches in my outfit for just flirting with waitresses. No, sir. Last night, I might have been tired, but I was wide awake and alert. Anyway, how do you explain all that stuff of mine? He had it, to me. Okay, Ben, okay, Skipper. His uh, wife was quite a dish, I understand. Search me. But she owned an orchard, the sheriff says. Yeah, that's what bothers me most. Tim McGean's the only one to benefit from her death. And he's got a perfect alibi. <laughs> take it so hard, Valentine. We haven't even got a fingerprint crew from the city out there yet. Apparently it wasn't just a cold-blooded murder. No, no. She was strangled and slugged over the head. Crime of passion. 
It's all it could be where a woman like Doris McGeehan was concerned. So if it wasn't done for a money motive, then I don't see why you think it had to be Tim McGeehan. Angel, I'm going to throw a curve back at that guy if it's the last thing I do. Come on, let's go see where it happened. Okay. Hey, you, Ames. Yeah? Come on with us. Ames? Yeah, McGeehan's hired hand. He can show us around. Nice orchard. Not a bad-looking little place. Yeah, careful of the loose board there. Hey, get off the porch. Who is it? Hello, Joe. My deputy. Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Oh, come in, folks. You weren't here yesterday, Mr. James? Oh, no, ma'am, not me. Day off. I always go fishing on my day off. Spend the night in the hills. Here you are, Mr. Valentine. Here's where the body was. Uh -huh. Who found it? Joe here. Come out to ask a couple questions about Tim after you phoned, saying you had him. Well, it certainly was a fight here, wasn't there? You'll see. Table knocked over and rug kicked up. Yeah, and the front door was open just the way it is now. George, where are you going? Back door. Through here, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Valentine. Yeah. Locked. Hey, what are you doing? I want to shut the front door, that's all. Uh-huh. Latch was on this one, too, wasn't it? What are you driving at? Oh, simple type crime, Sheriff. Uh, Ames, uh, where did you say you were last night? Yeah, well, well, up in the hills, I told sure, you. Sure, I know, but, uh, where are the fish you caught? Well, I only got one. I had it. Now, look here. You notice the two glasses there on the table, Sheriff? Yeah? You say Mrs. McGeehan had no particular friends well, or anybody? Well, there's a couple of fellas, but it only took about two seconds to cross them off fast. One was up in San Francisco, the other was a party. Never mind. Of the... I think I know how to wrap this crime up for you fast. And I'll enjoy doing it, too. George, what are you talking about? We're not far from the highway, Valentine. Almost any tranche in her bum could have wandered All over All right, look at the evidence, Sheriff. Mrs. McGean was alone, right? Yeah. Then someone came, a man. But he couldn't have just broken in because both doors were locked. Well, that's true, but If he'd been a stranger, there's a telephone. She could have called for help. Besides, whoever it was, she gave him a drink. Well, you got to break Tim McGean's alibi. He hated her, I tell you. They fought lots of times. I've seen him. Ames, I know it'd be nice if we could hang it onto him. But we can't. So who's left but you? Well, now, wait a minute, Sheriff. He paid no attention to her, only worked well, for you. I told you it was a simple crime. Just because you know him, stop shutting your eyes to the obvious. Well, let go, let go of me. I didn't Ames, do it. Ames, come back. I, I didn't. I'm not going to get railroaded. Look no. out, George. Oh, no, you don't. Bust it. Holy smoke. He's such a nice guy. All right, you got your murderer, Sheriff. Lock him up. <laughs> Valentine, I know you're sore at me. All right, if I use your one chair, Tim? Oh, sure, sure. Not a very fancy cell, I'm afraid. Tim, now listen to me. I was sore at you, sure. That camera deal, you played me for a sucker. Well, I, I never pulled a robbery before. For a while, I thought maybe you'd sucker me into helping you with a gratuitous alibi. Mr. Valentine. All right, forget it. Relax, would you? Sheriff will be here in a minute. He's got Ames, all right. What? Yeah, so I, uh, I thought I'd better be a nice guy and warn you what the penalty is for armed holdup. Robbing a man of several hundred bucks worth of stuff. But what did you say about Ames? You'd better worry about yourself for a change, Tim. What? Of course, first offense could be heavy. You might be out in a couple of years, but... Uh... Look, what are you driving at? I, I know what a dumb thing I did. Oh, no, no. Maybe it was smart. This man, Ben Roberts, got held up last night up north and reported it as soon as he got into town. The early morning papers printed the story. Well, that was quite a break. Good piece of luck. A piece of what? Look, you're getting me all mixed up. You didn't up. come to see me until after the banks had opened. Ten thirty, remember? So you'd have had a chance to go get some money, pick up a Canadian dollar and a new camera. After all, the newspaper told you what kind to buy. No, that's not true. I don't know what you're talking about. Then, what, what's that you said about Ames being? Let go of me, will you? Let go of me. Cut it out, Ames. Get in there. Go Sheriff, on. listen. Get me a lawyer. Get the lawyer's not going to do you any get, good. Get me a lawyer. Well, I'll be. A... So that's it. He did it. Ames did it. He killed Doris. Now, you see what I mean about thinking of yourself? The penalty for robbery, Tim, could easily be five years. You sent for me, George? Mm. Oh, yeah, Ben. Stick around. Uh, you too, Sheriff. I can't get over it. Ames. He never even noticed Doris. Just a hired hand. I, I ran. I didn't even think of looking for him. What did you say? I, I, I mean that... Five years, Tim. So how about it? I understand what kind of a spot you were in. The only big suspect for her death. 
She played around and you hated her, even if you didn't live there anymore. Mr. Valentine, I don't know what... I gave you a start a minute ago, huh? You read about Ben's robbery in the newspaper. You knew nobody would ever believe you unless you had a foolproof alibi. You figured it was better to take a lesser rap in order to make sure of dodging the gas chamber. Hey, hey, what's all this, George? Oh, well, you gave me the idea, Ben. You wouldn't have described the hitchhiker in such general terms unless you really hadn't got too good a look at him. But he had my camera. Well, he was running. He was in the city. He saw a list of what was stolen in the newspaper. He realized he'd fit the vague description. So, he went around and bought the stuff, filed the serial number off the camera so you couldn't check it. And also so I'd be sure to see through his story and nail him. In fact, he hired me to nail him. Holy smoke. Oh, uh, Sheriff, ask the other guy to step in here, will you please? Sure. You, come in here. That's all right. Just stand there in the door. Uh-huh. Medium-sized, about 35. Wearing hat and overcoat. What about it, Ben? What do you mean? Could that guy be the one who held me up? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Who is he? Cop. I dressed up. Okay, thanks, Joe. <laughs> don't that beat all? You know, I'll grant you, it is pretty hard to identify a man. Never when... mind, never mind. I'll tell the truth. Well, now you're getting smart, Tim. Only what happened that made you so sure you had to pull all this? Yes, what did you mean a second ago when you said you ran? You didn't even think of looking for Ames. Well, I, I was there after it happened at the All right, go on. They'll need your testimony. Well, I went down to see Doris last night. I was good and sore. She'd been playing around with guys on the QT. Even if we are separated, it doesn't mean that you can... Well, anyway, my fingerprints are probably all over the house. When I got there, the door was open. She was lying there, dead. I ran, hopped a truck to the city, but... I had to make up something, didn't I? And a robbery north of town was the golden opportunity, sure. Brooks, you get all that done? I've got it all, George. What? Sure as that does it... You can turn Ames loose now. I've broken the sucker's alibi. Boy, you dirty... Oh, no. George! Cut it out. Cut it out. All right, now take it easy. I didn't say you killed your wife, did I? <laughs> well, what's the matter? There's a fair chance he didn't. He just took advantage of a lucky break, that's all. The holdup. What are you driving at, Valentine? Hasn't it occurred to any of you that the holdup itself might be phony? What's all this? Yeah, that Ben here is just about the type guy who might have been mixed up with Doris McGee on the QT. The big traveling salesman. Oh, 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 George, you're crazy. That last night he could have come into town from the south instead of the north after throwing away his camera and money and a Canadian dollar. Oh, Buster, it sure must have scared you today when the robber showed up. And of all people, her husband. You're going to let him talk like that, Sheriff? I never even met this Doris. When we searched you today, Tim, you had Ben's fountain pen, the one with the trick flashlight, remember? But if he took it off me last night when he held me up, uh, I mean... Careful, Ben, careful. Don't get tangled up now. If anybody had stolen it from you, they'd have taken it out of your pocket, right? And if so, why didn't they take that solid gold watch you're so proud of? George, that's right. Hey. Of course, Tim claimed he'd found the pen someplace. Sure, uh, that's So it uh, couldn't have been stolen anyway, huh? Wait a minute. Let me think. Never occurred to me. Found it yesterday, you said, Tim. Come on, now. I remember. Sometime yesterday, a last Don't night. Don't listen to him. Uh, how would he know? I'm he... trying to remember. Shut up. Where'd you find it? Where, Tim? Someplace around your wife's farm, maybe. Last night, maybe. Wait. Wait, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, sure, the pen. I picked it up. Sure. I know where. Sure. Sure. Mr. Roberts. No. Look out. Get out of my way. I'll kill you too. Sheriff. Sure. Sure. That doesn't... Sure. George. George, I know Ben Roberts is the murderer, but the only trouble is... Look at Tim McGean's face. Like the cat that ate the mouse. Of course, he did make a sucker out of you, but... Brooksy, stick around. In about two seconds, I'll settle once and for all who's the sucker in this case. are listening to Let George Do It. You will hear the conclusion of our adventure in just a minute. Mr. Valentine, he confessed, so what's the difference? Uh, tell me now. 
Where did you find his pen, Tim? Well, you don't need it as evidence. I'll remember eventually, but last night I was so scared and upset... That you don't remember at all. Well, it must have been around a farm someplace. Uh Uh-huh. You just pretended you knew so that he'd... Well, um... it did the trick. Boy, that guy's a real sucker. (laughs) You're pretty good at taking people in, too. Well... But it's so stupid. If you'd come to George in the first place and told him the truth instead of going out to buy that camera and pretending... Robert's phony hold-up story might never have been broken. Ah, he's right, Angel. The way it worked out. So, now I'm all clear. I pick up my $50 bill and camera from the sheriff and walk out. I gamble my whole savings and maybe five years in prison, and now I'm free and it don't even cost me a cent. Hmm. Whole savings account, huh? Well, here, uh, look at this. Camera's worth over 200 retail, isn't it? Oh, well, sure. I can get at least... Hey, wait a minute. No, give me that. Oh, no. Here's the receipt you signed. I bought that camera for 25 bucks. Get the picture? <laughs> so long, sucker. You have just heard Sucker Stunt, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey is starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Just in case that voice you just heard didn't mean anything to you, that was George Valentine, with his usual commercial for Let George Do It. Now, before you listen to any more, you better make sure you have your winter woolies handy, because this is indeed a chilling tale. It's called The Marauder, and it's all about a guy who wants to bump off a cat. No, I don't mean his wife. I said cat, as in lion, tiger, panther, puma, or alley. Now, this may sound pretty silly, But just hold base a while, then make up your mind. Dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Rafe Saxon. I'm a writer, a very foolish writer, because like all of my breed, I've had a lifelong desire to spend a winter in the woods to get away from the tensions and fears and neuroses of the city, to live simply with simple, normal people. Well, here I am, a tiny deserted resort in the Lobo Range, and, of course, it's all an illusion. I'm surrounded by more tension and fear than I ever knew before. And a friend of mine, the owner of the place, Hans Bjorkman, has become neurotic to the point of insanity, to the point where I can't control him. To the point where all he thinks of is the marauder, the invader, the pirate and cutthroat of the animal kingdom. Mr. Valentine, this man is obsessed by the idea of murdering a mountain lion. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It. Well, if we can only 
to get out of this wind. Yeah, I got a big fire in the fireplace, lady. <laughs> hey, where'd you leave the car? About five miles back, that hill beyond the aspen grove. Oh. Yeah, the road was like glass. <laughs> It's frozen practically solid. <laughs> hey, couldn't climb it, I know. Up one step and down two. <laughs> it's a funny winter this year. Hardly any snow, just ice cubes and hailstones. And here we go. Doors around the porch. Oh, thank you. Hey, I don't think your friend Saxon's back yet. I've been out communicating with nature. <laughs> he's crazy like an Eskimo. Guess he's going to write a book about the South Pole. Hey, is your name Hans Bjorkman? <laughs> uh, me? Oh, heck no, no. He's crazy, too. Everybody is except me. I- I'm just uh, peculiar. <laughs> hey, here, better wipe your feet. Listen. Hey? George, it's a woman. Something's the matter with it. Uh, what's it sound like to you, city boy? Well, it doesn't sound like a baby crying. What was it? Cat? Cat? Yeah, that's it. Cat, puma, cougar, panther, nuisance. Take your pick. Mountain lion. Mm. Oh. That's a bad winter for everybody, I guess. Hey. Sounds hungry, don't he? Yeah. Well, so am I. Come on, let's get inside. Only shut that door quick so Bjorkman don't hear it. You mean hear that wail? Why not? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know, mister. Something's going on I don't get the hang of. But when old Hans hears that long tail out there, he just sort of slides back in his rocker. Yeah, well, search me. I just poke cows for a living. Does Hans own some cattle? No, no, no. A few head and some chickens, that's all. Uh, pairs of them, all in pairs like Noah sitting up in his ark. Uh, but I don't work here, if that's what you mean. I'm waiting for a job for the summer, that's all. Bears hibernate. Why shouldn't we? My name's Peanut. Peanut? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm an uh, indoor style cowboy. <laughs> I work two months, make enough playing bunkhouse Peanuckle to loaf the other ten. <laughs> yeah. uh, why not? I like to mosey around, keep people happy, make them laugh. <laughs> and old Hans, he's he's been good to me a couple of times. So, so here you are, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I wish I knew why. Wish I was smart enough to know how to help the old billy goat. Hey, he's old country and always hard to get close to, sort of proud. He built this place here with his own hands. And give you the shirt off his back, but... Tina, he... is that them? Uh, what? Did Mr. Valentine... Oh, yeah, yeah, they're here. <laughs> Come on down, fatty. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been getting your rooms ready, Miss Brooks. Uh, there's some hot chocolate for you on the stove. What? Oh, thanks. Uh, who's that? Tell Hans I'll be right there. Oh, we're fine, thanks. That his wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good kid if you don't go for much brain. <laughs> you see, Hans just disappeared a couple of years ago and brought her back, and uh, here she is. Yeah, she works her head off, too, when she's not worrying about him. Everybody seems to worry about Hans. <sighs> yeah, it's over her head, too, I guess. I tried to kid her out of it. She don't know what upsets him. Well, nobody knows, except the cat. Oh, here I am. Oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't downstairs when you came in. Hello, I'm Olga. Hello. Uh, how do you do? Well, well what, what's the matter? Isn't my hair straight? <laughs> you see what I mean? Everybody's crazy. She says a thing like that and don't even look in the mirror to find out. Oh, be quiet. Your hair's beautiful. (laughs) I'm afraid Pinocchio gave us the wrong impression, that's all. He called you fatty. Oh, him. Well, she is. (laughs) Well, come on, let's get that chocolate. I guess we didn't expect you to be so young, that's all. What? Oh, gosh, I'm 26 already. <laughs> now, I never have time to fix myself up or... <laughs> oh, Pinochle, stop. Yeah, it. sure, sure. Just an ugly old frow. <laughs> stop what? <laughs> oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's the most awful... <laughs> Hans. Well, <laughs> come in, come in. Well, I'm only kissing your wife, that's all. You don't have to point a gun at me. Huh? Oh. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> oh, there, there's nothing to listen to out there except the wind, darling. Of course. Hello, my dear. Well, these, these are Miss Brooks and Mr. Valentine, the friends of Mr. Saxon. How do you do? It's such a pleasure. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Bjorkman. And I am the host, and I am late, and I let in the cold. There is no excuse. Have you poured me brandy, my dear? How are you, Mr. Valentine? My little place is so hard to get to, I'm afraid. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Well, that's uh, quite a gun you've got there. Yeah, yeah, he uses it to put holes in the broad side of his barn, don't you, Hans? <laughs> you are interested in guns? Good, good. Pinnacle and Saxon, they are boys. They don't understand. My rifle from the mail order house. Here, I show you. When a man has a house and his land, he has a gun. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> just don't wave it around. Wait a minute. Huh? There, there wasn't anything, dear. Well... 
if you're listening for that lion... I didn't hear anything, Valentine. No, Hans. Oh, for heaven's sake... Be quiet! Pinochle, all I was going to say was that I did hear it. Sounded like it came from about the same place as the last time. Mr. Valentine... Be quiet, I said! Excuse me, please. I will see you later. Yeah. Yeah, he is out there. We could hear Mr. Valentine and I. Excuse me. Well, hello, everybody. Mr. Saxon. Are you Valentine? Yeah, hello. How do you like my nervous host here? Put it down, Hans. Put it down. No hunting today. There's nothing out there. You have been outside, Rafe. You must have heard it. No, no, no. Just a little wind in the tree. Hans! Look out, you crazy! Give me that gun. I saw him, I tell you. I saw him. Give me that. And he left the barn. You couldn't hit anything at that range. Let go of me, I tell you. Let go! Yeah. It is my house. It is my gun. It is up to me to kill the Norota. So, stay here, all of you. This time I will get him. He shot past you in the doorway, Mr. Saxon. Maybe it scared you a little, but that's nothing to think. You've seen how he acts. Every day and night for the past week, he's been out trying to find that brute. He doesn't even take time to eat. Well, what's wrong with that? This is his place. He's got a few head of stock to worry about. A hungry lion is dangerous. Why shouldn't he try to kill it? Why should you all pretend you don't even hear it? No, no, listen to me. It's a long story. It isn't what he does, it's how he does it. It's not normal, it's yeah, not... Yeah, yeah, it's too long a story for me to listen to. Wh- what? Uh, Mr. Valentine? I'd rather see what happens myself, thanks. Me? I'm going to go out and help Hans run down his marauder. <laughs> Oh, look, Hans, it's been an hour since I we know. started. Another circle we go in here. Yeah? Haven't even seen a track yet, have you? The ground is so hard. Look at the sky. It will snow maybe later. Huh? Sure, sure, and by then my feet will be frozen. Hey, Hans, how many chickens or whatever you've got is this thing actually... I have nothing has been touched so far. But he is hungry. You can tell. Can you? You're not much of a hunter. I have worked all my life to build what I have. There's been no time for hunting, but I will find him. I will kill him. Ever think of traps or setting out poison? I will kill him myself. I will kill him and see him die. Well, how about calling in one of the state hunters to get him? I will kill him myself and see him die. You will, huh? He has no place in the world. He is a thief. This place is mine. All my life I've worked on it. But at night, he comes... With his flat yellow eyes. Oh, yeah, I have seen him several times besides this afternoon, snarling, hungry, long as a man, crouching in the frozen grass. A thief, I tell you, with no business to come stealing a thief. All right, all right, all right, calm why, down. Why should I laugh and stand by when everything I own is threatened? Man, stop by... it, will you? <laughs> Man's castle is never secure, is it? Uh-huh. That? Huh. You can't. The kitchen door is open. We will not find him tonight. I mean, you can work all your life for certain things and never be sure of hanging on to them. Like her. What did you say? Yeah, standing there in the doorway. Worried about you, I guess. Your young wife. Oh. All right, Olga, we are coming. Uh Uh-huh. She's very beautiful, isn't she, Hans? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, that's a compliment to you. Hans, did you ever hear of a man getting unreasonably mad at something when that something isn't the real cause of his anger? I am tired. Please, you you make so many... Taking it out on something, I mean, like the wrong marauder? What? Taking it out in hatred of a mountain lion. I don't understand. Now, come on, come on, Hans, tell me. Whether you admit it to yourself or not, which one of those guys in there are you worried about? Buddy? With Olga. You know which one it is you'd like to call a thief, a marauder? A sneak who comes into a man's home to steal his no. money? No, stop it! Now take it easy. You can't say things like that! Oh, forgive me. I, she, Olga, is my wife. You do not understand. She is mine. Oh, forgive me. Oh. Yeah, sure, Buster. I'll forgive you. Only which man is it? Which one do you really want to murder? You 
You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. The Marauder, a hungry, dangerous mountain lion. Or is it a man? If your name is George Valentine, you're ready to agree with Rafe Saxon, the man who sent for you when he said this place, this deserted resort in the frozen Lobo Range, is filled with tension and fear. And you'll also agree that the owner, Hans Bjorkman, is obsessed with the idea of murder. Only murder of what? Or of whom? Now, this isn't the kind of place where one sleeps well at night. Even Claire Brooks. Particularly when... What? George. George! Yeah, sure, I'm awake. Come on in. Did you hear that? Yeah, sure. It was a rifle shot. Way off. Uh Uh-huh. And the wind's died down. Could have been several miles. Not in that direction, I think. Well, it's so dark. There's no moon. Mr. Valentine? Well, hello, Mrs. Bjorkman. Wake you up, too? I heard a shot. Where's your husband? Where do you think? The shot woke me up and he was gone from bed. But here, his gun was gone, too. But I found this on the pillow. I know, huh? Oh, here, let me see. Olga, my dear, don't worry. I will be back soon. This time I know where to go. This time I will kill him and watch him die. Signed, Hans. George. Yes, Mr. Valentine. How could he know? What what could he know now that... Oh, well, I don't understand what... Listen. He could know what he wouldn't tell me. He could know which one it is that he wants... The lion... Same direction. You got a flashlight, Olga? What? George, wait. I'm going with you. There's a ladder. Wait for me, too. Hey, come on. Step on it. Call Pinochle and Saxon, too. Listen. George, it was a door slammed. The other side of the house. Mr. Saxon isn't in his room, either. One of them just took off the front way. Come on, they're both gone. We'll catch up with George, them. how can you tell what direction they... Oh, well, they'd go to find him, too. It has to be Hans. He has the only gun for miles and miles, and... Well, if he has found the lion at last... I got a pretty good bearing, I think. Besides, it's snowing a little. Come on, move fast. We got to beat an awful lot of brush in an awful hurry. George, wait. Saxon, I... Have you seen Hans? I Have you... know, I know. I heard it. I'm looking, too. I saw your lantern half an hour ago, moving through the trees. And then I lost it. I think you're headed in the no, wrong... No, not, friend. You are. What? Well, I don't know. I was working late in my riding, and in the room, the crazy hoot owl, I, I thought he was in bed. I came tearing sure, out... Sure, sure. Just give me your flashlight. Follow us with the lantern. All right, Mr. Valentine. He must have really gone off his head this time. Hans! Hans, can you hear me? Oh, save your breath, Saxon. It's still across the field and down toward the little lake, I think. You can see way back on a line with the lights from the house. Ah, snow in the face. Miserable, insane thing to be doing. Olga's a wonderful woman. I didn't You're say wrong. anything about Olga. Well, she loves Hans. I know he's older than she is, but she does. Works her head off to make him happy. I told you I didn't say anything about her. But she's beautiful, all right. But then nature's rough. It's always paired off. But you can't protect a home forever when the ages are that far apart. You know the stuff Hans talks about. What should be done to marauders who try to break up the pairs. To the strays, the lone ones who try to break up... Hey, Peanut, I'll let you. Where are you? By the shore of the lake. Chased out of the house before you did, I guess. 
the lights burned out. Here, get over here quick. Here, 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 give me that flashlight. So what is it? George, what's happened? Oh, I, I, I stumbled. I dropped my light. Look, look at my hand. What? There, yeah, I stumbled on something. Don't you get it? Hans got him. Don't you get it? The marauder. Look. Holy smoke. Look at the size of that mountain lion. So there really was one. Right through the eyes. Hey, hey, look here. He drilled him right yeah, through the Yeah, sure. Eyes. Close range. No wonder. Yeah. But look at the paw. The leg practically blown off. Hans must have had the muzzle practically next to... You want to... this, George? Yeah, give me that lantern. I, I can see something over here. <gasps> Hans! Hans! Yeah, he's... Uh, he's dead, Mr. Valentine. Uh, look, only a few feet away, too. Now, the cat must have jumped him. Uh, they will sometimes, you know, hungry, skinny ones like that. That's why he fired so close, George. But not in time. Not in time to keep himself from bleeding to death, you mean? Look at those claw marks. All on right, his... I got eyes. Ah, no, take it easy, city boy. But we better get him back to the house anyway, don't you think? Snow's getting worse. Sure, sure, it's a bad winter for everybody. Lion and all. Yeah. Here, take this handkerchief. Get some water on it, will you? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. Well, there's nothing we could have done, Valentine. It's like Pinochle says. Hans just slid back too far on his rocker. Nature caught up oh, with him. Oh, shut up. George. I'm all right. I'm all right. Just give me his gun there, will you, Saxon? Oh, here. He's still hanging on to it. Huh? Yeah. Now, uh, here, uh, here, Valentine, you said you wanted this handkerchief wet, but there's almost enough snow on the ground. To cover things up, I know. Huh? Marauder. <laughs> Poor old crazy Hans. Valentine, what in the name I of... don't know, Buster, I don't know. But stand very still, both of you. Only three shells have been fired, but it's hard to keep you both covered in a place like this. Mr. Valentine... Olga, stay where you are. Your husband was murdered. What? George, what are you talking about? Pinochle, where'd you find the water? Huh? Valentine, if you don't know claw marks when you see Be them... Be quiet, will you? Pinochle, the water, answer me, where? Well, why in the lake, naturally. Why isn't it frozen like everything else in this godforsaken country? Well, uh, the branches freeze and fall, that's all. They break the ice. They... I'm not that much of a city boy. Well, how should I know? Olga, what... come here. Hold this gun on him. Whatever you say. Yeah. Hang on to my hand, Brooks. Yeah, be careful, Hey, George. look out. That lake's over your head, Dave. Oh, you know about that, huh? Sure. Here's where the ice is broken. Well, that's just what I got. Now listen, Pinochle. Three shells missing. And that's right. We heard a total of three shots, remember, Brooksy? Over an hour ago, back at the house. That's right, George, but and I the don't... lion screamed after the third shot. You heard it. That's how it happened. Yes. Yes, I remember. Keep that gun straight. It's hard enough to even see people in this crazy place. But wait a minute. Hans killed the lion with a clean shot through the eyes. Close range, right through his brain. How could he have screamed after? He couldn't. So it doesn't make sense that Hans and the lion killed each other now, does it? Hey, well, now look here. Marks around the tree. What? Uh, let me see. A chain or something. Sure, sure, that's it. Here, get a loose branch. Hang on again, Brooksy. Oh, what are you doing? Another real close shot smashed the lion's leg, didn't it? Or was it already smashed and the shot was just to cover up the marks there might be? I don't know yet. I'm just guessing. But I know one of you guys had nearly an hour alone out here after the shots to set the scene any way you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, there is something here. What is it, George? Something that might have been anchored to the tree originally. Something Hans wouldn't ever use. But if somebody else did, then it would prove Hans wasn't jumped by that lion. He was... Oh, listen to him. Listen to him. Riddles. <laughs> he doesn't make... A chain. And a trap, Angel. A steel trap on the end of it. The trap the lion was in ever since yesterday... Since he'd been screaming from the same place. Yeah, look, even bits of fur still on it. So it was murder. Why would anyone throw a trap in the lake? I'll take it from here, Saxon. Just help me out. Are you crazy? If it wasn't murder, it couldn't have been. There's a gun on you, friend. And I guess you're it, aren't you? Saxon wouldn't have got me here in the first place if he was going to pull one like this. Hey, get away from me, old Look out, George! Hey, you... You'll get away! He's running! Stop it, Olga. It doesn't do any good for you to kill him. He's gone. He's gone, Valentine. The marauder's gone. (sighs) 
he beat us here to the house, all right. He can cut the telephone wires. Yeah, yeah. Big daylight in a few minutes. Well, I'll start out. But where? He could be hiding almost anywhere outside. Oh, they'll get him. Don't worry, Saxon. He hasn't even got a gun. And if you ask me, he's running. <laughs> Marauder. Strike and run. I guess he did want to break up the family, didn't he? Kill Hans and then try to get Olga. Pinochle must have had that trap out before you even came here yesterday, Valentine. Yeah, that's right. And then he had to go through with it. But, George, how could you have guessed what not even Hans guessed, that Pinochle was really getting ready to murder him? Wording of that note to Olga, remember? Oh. Hans went out after the lion. Said he knew just where to go, just where to get him. Well, how could he have been so sure? Unless somebody had come to him in the night and told him where it was. Pinochle. And he led him out there until they came to where the lion was, screaming in the trap. Yeah. And then Pinochle had all the time in the world sure, to... Sure, sure, kill them both. The rest was easy. And it would have worked. Nobody would have investigated. The snow would have covered everything. And the human thief, the worst marauder, might have eventually persuaded Olga to... What's the matter, George? Holy George. smoke. I just figured out why Pinochle stopped by here at the house, that's all. Why? He's running, all right. The keys to my car are gone. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Parked around this bend, remember? Look, the snow didn't cover all his tracks. You can see where he came. He was running. George, I'm still trying to figure that business of the shot in the screen. Yeah. I mean, no matter how you add it. Doesn't make sense, I know, Brooksy. Pinocchio laughed. City boy, he said. Well, that was what started me going, because I thought it was impossible. I've just realized even when we knew about the murder, it was still impossible. Look. Look, the car, it's still down there. He didn't take it. Oh, Lord, no, those tracks. Well, it's nothing to... Where are you going? The Marauder, Angel. Well, look at those tracks. Look why Pinochle was running. Something else I should have caught. Lion was in the trap all day yesterday, but Hans saw a lion and fired at it down by the barn around dusk. We just thought he was seeing things. But it was another lion screaming. Hey, there he is! There he is! Dead. He couldn't even make it to the car. Oh, no, easy. Don't look at him, Brooksy. Oh, George. It's all right, Angel. It's all right. <laughs> Dangerous thing to be a marauder, isn't it? To murder a husband or a wife. Nature's the same all over, I guess. Everything in pairs. Pinochle was killed by the lion's mate. You have just heard The Marauder, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
Greetings, friend. Time again for Let George Do It. Oh, which reminds me. How would you like to sit in on a nice little card game? I happen to know four charming fellows who are just dying for a fifth. On the other hand, though, maybe you'd better forget about it, because these boys would not only take your bankroll, they'd just as soon take your life. But it's a pretty good game at that. So while we're waiting for George Valentine to show, let's take a look in on this happy foursome. Well, it's ten o'clock already, gentlemen. Shouldn't we... <laughs> I mean, my watch says ten. Chester has the cards and... Sure, what are we waiting for? We're going to do it. Let's get... No! Going. No. Ames, Salto, this is crazy. It's insane. It was your idea, wasn't it, Norton? Yes, but a man's guilt is no more to be bandied about. Oh, well, get off the words. There's the good name of the man to be thought of afterwards. Let's get it over with now. Now! It's all right. Need a piece of paper. Envelope here in your jacket. Do you mind? Of course I do, if it's got my name on it. Valentine. George what? Valentine. What? Oh, your wife's letter from somebody named Valentine. Uh, if I'd know her friends. Here, here's a blank sheet. Club stationery. Uh, couldn't we get on with the... Dear Mrs. Ames, I am so sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Naturally, I will do whatever I can to help Sincerely, George Valentine. You mean that? Uh, concern. How do you oh, like... For heaven's sake, stop the stalling, both of you. Will you get... All right. Started? I draw one. Go on, draw a card. Me? Go on, Salto. All right. Nine of diamonds... Yeah. Norton. <laughs> Nine of clubs. Nine again. Give me one of those. Jack. Diamonds. All right, Chester. Chester. Huh? Your turn. Draw. Oh, I, I'm all right. Draw. Oh, yes. King. King of Hearts, look! Chester to the King of Hearts! Shut up. You understand, Chester. I card. Yes. Yes, the paper. Here, here. You can use the pen there. Uh, I'm all right. <clears throat> I, Jeffrey Chester, hereby confess one year ago to this date it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. After ten o'clock now, Chester. I'd like to have a drink or two. I'll, I'll have to run down to my boarding house. There's a bill I should pay. Uh, the watchman's spare gun is in the locker room, and it would look better if you did it at the same place that... Leave him alone, Salto. I'm all right. I could run downtown first, then come back, have the drinks, if I could borrow your car, Mr. Ames. Sure, Chester. Let's go over and get you my car. Sure. Thank you. You can mail my confession of guilt to the police. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and let George do it. Where are you, Sylvia? It's a big idea, that letter in my coat pocket. It's Valentine. Who is he? Honey? Oh, there you are. So sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Of all the meddling... Please. Well? This uh -huh. is Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, my husband, Mr. Ames. Oh. How, how do you do, Mr. Ames? Uh, my foot in my mouth. 
Just who are you? Did you have a nice time, darling? Where have you been? Huh? Oh, over to the club. Yeah, they let me in. Just playing a little cards, that's all. Look, Mr. Rames, I had a letter from your wife. My wife is leaving me. What difference does it make? Go on, get out. She's hired snoopers before, my friend. I tell you, Count. Oh, shut up. Listen to me. You were beaten up the other night. Get them out of here. Get yourself out of here. Stop it. No, listen. What's the matter with you, friend? Victor, that was your car, wasn't it? Driving away? Yes. Yes, I loaned it to Somebody needs it for a while tonight. He's got some things to do. Mr. Ames, I know I'm butting in, but your wife has been worried. And Please. I'm, here. I'm going back over to the club. There's nothing anybody can do now except to make things worse. What? Darling! Send him home, Sylvia. I'll take care of myself. Oh. I put your letter in his pocket on purpose, Mr. Valentine. He'll never listen to me or believe in it. It was certainly an understatement when you said he was upset. Yes. But you haven't said why yet. Now, just what's going on tonight, Mrs. Ames? Where's your husband really been? I don't know. Playing cards, I guess. He doesn't generally, but no harm could come out of that, could it? Maybe not. You said he'd been beaten up. Oh, yes, I know he's in danger. Go on, go on. Your husband's a lawyer, isn't he? He was until a year ago. His practice disappeared on him. What do you mean? Suspicion, distrust, whispers. This is a small town, Mr. Valentine. A very nice town. My husband used to be a very nice person. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Dorothy Fullman murder case? Well, yes, yes, I think so, only I don't remember the It was never solved. She was murdered, beaten up. It was horrible. They never even found the weapon. Police, experts, everyone's been over it a million times. It was a whole year ago. They'll never get a confession from anyone. Mrs. Ames, was your husband... My husband was very nearly tried for that murder. Oh, I see. But then if he weren't tried, then... There uh... are people in this town who believe, who really believe that he killed her. Who will always believe it. There wasn't any actual evidence. But the circumstances. Horrible, sordid, awful. Mrs. Ames, just tell me one thing, will you? Do, uh... Do you think your husband killed this Dorothy Fullman? Mr. Valentine, I, I don't want anything worse to happen. I... That's all. <laughs> I say, excuse me. Mm. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? George Valentine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was looking for the club doorman. My name is Norton. This is quite a pleasure. I've heard of you. Uh, Seen your name here and there. Oh, is that so? Uh, See here. Uh, Join me on the veranda for a cup of coffee, will you? Hospitality of our little club isn't I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. I'm looking for a man named Ames. Oh, yes. Victor Ames, splendid chap. Haven't seen him in some time. Might be here later. Uh, We can wait together. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. (laughs) Well, I certainly don't intend to be pushy. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, Perhaps I should be a bit more honest and say there's a little matter I'd like your advice on. I'd still go looking for Mr. Ames. Even if I said the little matter concerned, Mr. Ames? (laughs) You twist my arm. (laughs) Then we can do better than the veranda, I think. People there. There's a lounge in the locker room. All right. Through here? Uh, To your left. Generally closed at night. uh, There we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's the story? (sighs) Nothing so very important, but uh, sit down, sit down. How do you know who I was out there? Well, Ames had mentioned your coming. You said you haven't seen him lately. Try again. <sighs> really, Mr. Valentine, Shh, shh, yeah, Who's that? Hey, anybody in here? Walking up. Blue shirt. Private police? Oh, just a moment. Yes, yes, he is, uh, Mr. Valentine. Let go of me? Well, what are you doing here? Ah, what do you mean? Stop it. Who are you? Hey, hey, what is it? Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I hey, found this man. Break it up, break it up. Break uh, what up, John? I found him in here. I, I left my wallet in, in wallet my locker. All, the... all right, all right. 
Oh, it's you, Mr. Norton. He was snooping, Jimmy. Now my wallet's gone. He took it. He must have it. Oh, brother. If what am is... I supposed to do? Search him. Oh, but he won't have it, really. Uh, that, that's not the way they work. Uh, but uh, he's trespassing. You can lock him up for that. I'll see the steward for search charges. I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. What? I said I'm sorry. You're not going to prefer anything. Good night. Jimmy, my father was the founder of this club. When I issue an order to one of the paid employees, I expect yeah, that... Yeah, 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 sure, sure, issue away. Only someplace else, huh? I'll handle this end. Good night, Mr. Norton. Jimmy, I have never in my life been... Good night. Yes, good night. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, bud, hand it over. What? Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't mean you believe that old school ties gag about... And still you put him out? The wallet, bud. Oh, sure. Mine. Here. Credentials. The works. Good enough. Mm. Well, I didn't exactly figure. Valentine, huh? Yeah, eh? that's right. Only look, Buster. Why? Why'd you treat him like that? Will him like lettuce before you even know what he had because to say. Because I have no use for the high and mighty Mr. Norton. And don't worry, I won't get in trouble either. <laughs> he maybe don't know it, but he's being eased out the side door of this club anyway. All four of them are. All four? Would you clear that up? You ever hear the Dorothy Fullman murder? Well, that nice, dignified man there, that Norton. For my money, he's the one that killed her. All right, so you've got your opinions, Jimmy. It's just an opinion. I'll stick to it, Mr. Valentine. But there wasn't any concrete evidence against either him or Victor Ames. And what did you mean, all four of them? And why did Norton want to stall me like that? That's all he was trying to do, keep me away from something. You're the detective, mister. Uh, oh, uh, excuse me. Huh? <laughs> yeah, hello, Mr. Chester. Oh, Jimmy, just standing here having a couple of drinks. I, I was downtown. Yes, that's done. Looks like you've had enough. Oh, no, no, no. I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. Sure, sure, Mr. Chester. See him? Hmm. Oh, that guy? He's one of them. Say it faster, will you? One of the four. Dorothy Fullman was murdered in her house just over the bluffs across the golf course. Yeah. And never got enough evidence. They never will. But the police did prove that it couldn't be anybody else. It had to be one of the four men mixed up with it. Who are they? Mr. Norton. Ames, big fool, always in trouble. Another man named Salto. He asked me he couldn't have got to first base with it. And Chester there. Oh, I get it. Not much left of Chester, is there? All of them have changed. But he don't even know what he's doing anymore. <laughs> Nobody will confess, no evidence. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here. Now, excuse me, steward, back to business. No, no, I'm right behind you. Huh? That's Victor Rains with him, isn't it? With the steward? Sure it is. Valentine. Yeah, we catch up again, friend. It's a busy night. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, Jimmy, there's trouble in here. What? The card room, the one with the back entrance. I put those cards in there myself just this evening. Valentine, I've got to see no, you alone. Hold it, will you? Go on, steward. Uh, this deck of cards. Uh, some men have been playing in there, apparently, or drawing high man or something. Well, what is it? What's the matter? Uh, well, sir, it's uh, more puzzling than anything else. At a club like this, uh, someone was being dishonest. A rather hasty job, but uh, here you see, this deck has been marked... You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Nine of Diamonds. Nine of clubs. Jack, diamonds. Your turn, Chester. Draw. Yes, I'm king of hearts. I hereby confess one year ago it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. Only a 
your name is George Valentine, all you know is the Dorothy Fullman murder case has never been solved. That there were four suspects, but the police have despaired of ever finding out who her murderer was. Yes, all you know is that Mrs. Ames was worried about the strange behavior of her husband. And more recently, that four men have been playing cards in the back card room of the local club. And that the steward says the deck of cards is marked. No! No, they can't be. Give me Hey, those... hey, take it easy, Mr. Ames. Let's see, Stuart. They're not marked. What's bothering you so much, Mr. Ames? Kind of a crude job. Yes, Jimmy, little ticks on the edges, like this. But the person who did it could tell the cards, all right. Get out of here, both of you, Jimmy Stewart. Hey, hey, slow down, Buster. Look, I've got to see you, Valentine. I've got to see you alone. Have you been sampling some of that stuff Chester uses, Mr. Ames? What's so important about Chester? Chester. Hey, uh, where are you going, Miss Ames? He was downtown. He's back now. Oh, Buster, will the you bar, please? He's here in the bar. He's having those last two drinks. Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Angela. Oh, Mr. Ames, I saw your wife to the station. She said to tell you... Yes, yes, uh, of course. Where is he? What? The little guy, Brooks. He was in here a few minutes ago. He was having a couple of drinks. Yeah, he's gone now. Well, I did see somebody leaving just when I came in. He looked like he could use a little sleep. It's five minutes to twelve. Time for you to clear it up, friend. Where's Chester going? What's happening tonight? Could have been any one of us. I mean, the cards marking them. But I didn't try to save my own skin. I would have gone through it if I'd been high man. What on earth? I'm trying to remember. The watchman's spare gun, that was it. Quit pulling, Buster. What? Yeah, the closet, the back hall. Come on, hurry, will you? The watchman's gun, that was it. Only the cupboard was bare. He's taken it already. Chester. There's certainly no gun in here. We drew. I man. He had the king of hearts. Little Chester, the weakest one in the whole bunch. Didn't even seem to react. What do you look? With I, you? I, I know I'm talking wildly. I'll explain later. We've got to find him first. Hurry. Oh, we're with you, all right. But who's he going to use this gun on? Who's he? Oh. Isn't it perfectly obvious, Mr. Valentine? On himself. <laughs> Just like Jimmy said, house over by the bluffs across the golf course. It's certainly deserted looking for sale, for lease. Chester must be here. It's where he'd come. It's Dorothy Fullman's house, huh? Where she was killed? Yes, in the living room. Found her body there. Beaten to death. Doors open, you see. Chester? Chester! Well, he's not here. The fall guy. Well, we're a long way on the outside of that old crime now, aren't we? Perhaps we beat him here, missed him in the dark... Chester! What do you mean, George? Ames here knows what I mean. This is where it happened. It wasn't a pleasant crime. And inside a man, a terrible thing like that can get bigger in a year. Huh? Mr. Valentine, I didn't kill her. Sure, sure, that's what they all say. But Buster, I'm just finally beginning to realize what a hopeless, crazy thing is happening tonight. Wait a minute, George, listen. Upstairs. Come on. Chester? Where are you, Chester? It's me, Victor Ames! Salto. Salto, what are you doing here? Mr. Valentine's all right, Salto. He knows the whole story now. But I didn't mark any cards. It wasn't me. Then what are you doing here, Salto? Hiding Leave him alone, waiting. Ames. Leave him alone. And never mind who marked the cards. But what do you think, Brooksy? Four men actually drawing to see which one would be a four guy. Which one would confess to a murder? I don't believe it. Oh, yes, it's very easy for the two of you to talk like that. I told them it was ridiculous. Same as Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge wheel. See who gets the bullet. Yeah, they couldn't stand to be pointed at. The suspicion, the shadow of guilt. The crime that would never be solved otherwise. Yes, I told them that, but Ames and Norton kept You were willing that. enough, Salter. You didn't have any solution anywhere to keep yourself from going insane. Maybe you can't believe it, Miss Brooks. Why should you? You don't have a private hell to live in. I don't think that's exactly what she meant, Ames. Sure, I know it's not like in books where people just forget about murder. But to try to dig yourself out of a swamp by drawing, taking one chance in four of being tapped for guilt, just to lay all the ghosts for the others. If we did it, so what? We did it. We've nearly killed each other trying to make each other confess anyway. No, I was thinking about the second part of the bargain. Suicide for the elected guilty one. Yeah, to make sure the police would accept that confession. 
Mr. Ames, you might have gone through with it. You're that kind. But I just don't believe that most men Sick, would... Angel. All right, how about it, Soto? That's why you're here, isn't it? To see if Chester would go through with something that you wouldn't do yourself. That I... I'm sorry, Victor. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have. I went along with it. Of course I did. If I'd been high card, I don't know what I would have done. But... Okay, there's one down. Wet feet. By this time, Chester must be aboard the nearest freight train headed for parts unknown. Chester? He signed the confession. But he wouldn't do it. I know he'd been At drinking, the last but... moment, it's a little hard to pull the trigger. Is that so? You're so sure, aren't you? Huh? Moonlight out there. Window, come here. Look. It's him. It's Chester. But he's not coming toward the house. Just walking. That's the path runs up by the bluffs. Yes, and if anything happens to him, it's our fault, Salto. Come on, step on it. Run! Chester! Chester! What's the matter with him? He doesn't even listen. Oh, look out, George. Now, these bluffs are pretty steep, aren't they? Chester! I'm going to climb up this way, too. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Huh? You what? just stay behind me with Miss Brooks. Valentine. There's another way this whole thing tonight can work. But I'm going to see that it doesn't. George, look, he's up on one of the edges. Stand yeah. still. On. What? A... Norton, get out of here. Leave him alone. Norton, wouldn't you know? Stand still. I'm warning you. I have a gun. Oh yeah, sure. The one from the watchman's locker. He didn't take it. Chester didn't take hey, it. Hey, what's all this? So you did. Sure, sure. You guys wouldn't just make a deal for somebody to commit suicide. You'd get him to write a confession and then murder him. He killed her. He killed our little one. He confessed. George, he's up on the edge. Look at him. Leave him alone. He'll jump, I tell you. Look at the way he's acting. I just followed him. To give him the gun he didn't take. James, listen to me. It will all be over. For all of us. For you inhuman old... Let it happen. If you don't, it'll be the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, look. We can't stop him from here. And he does look like he wants to jump. Okay, so I've been wrong, so I... Valentine! Get out of the way with that gun! Okay, now you're all right, Martin. Stay there, all of you. Chester! Mr. Chester! I'm all right. Uh, Yes? Mr. Chester, now you listen to me. I can't reach you, but... Uh, But get away now. There's something I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Kill yourself. But you were supposed to do it where she died, weren't you? Wasn't that the agreement, Chester, to make it look good? Can you understand me, Mr. Chester? I'm all right. That's it, that's it. Just keep looking at me. It should have been the living room, though. Or were they always wrong? She was beaten, bruised. I remember they said they never found a weapon. Was it really up here that she died? Was she thrown? It would have looked the same if somebody then carried her body back to her house. I'm going to jump, you know. Get back, get back. No, you're not. You're too curious, Chester. This year, since Dorothy Fullman died, must have been the worst for the one who really killed her. Don't you think so, Mr. Chester? What? What do you mean? But admitting it is worse. Some people can't ever do that. They'd rather die than do that. I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. But you don't even want your death to be a confession, do you? Well, they gave you a chance, the little card drawing. You know the masked deck, the marked one, would be found sooner or later. You deliberately left it behind. No, no, no. go away. The world would say your confession was a fraud. You were a poor little patsy. Well, any of them could have marked the cards, Norton, Salto, and... The high man marked them. The guilty man, Chester. All I've said is built on that. When there's a drawing, a man can't make another man take a certain card. So if he marks them, he only marks them for himself. Check? Yes, yes, I understand, To pick his own card. But the lowest card picked tonight was a nine. If a man wanted a low card, that's not very safe, is it, with 52 cards in the deck? You know, it baffled me for a while, until I saw that you really did want to die. She was faithless. She was bad. Get out of my way! Oh, no, you don't. Now, just hang on. You're going to live, Buster. You're going to write a real confession. to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment.
George, it did work out that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, Brooksy, they pieced it together again. That's why Chester went up to the bluffs instead of taking the gun. That's how he had killed Dorothy Fulman a year back. And if the first confession had gone through, if he'd shot himself, nobody ever would have believed it. Well, the other three would have always thought they railroaded the poor little punchy. Trade their private little hells for new ones. Mrs. Ames went still in love with her husband and called you here. Mm -hmm. George, isn't it uh, remarkable what a woman will do for the man she loves? Remarkable. Forgive, forget, protect. I'll remember that. (laughs) Darling. The very next time I'm suspected of murder. Oh! Good night, Brooksy. You have just heard High Card, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin, and brought to you by... Woodbury, 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 for the skin you love to touch. Jerry and Pamela North often drive Bill Wigand to the verge of insanity. However, for all their bewildering antics, they often help him, too. At times, he even goes so far as to ask them for advice. Tonight is such a time, because he's faced with a dizzy situation. Now, as Bill seats himself in the North's living room, Jerry says to him, All right, Bill, now what's this great problem that's puzzling you? It's a case that I'm working on. I know. Somebody crept to the window and shot him in the middle of his dinner. What? Yes, I read about it in the paper. He was dining alone. Who was? Uh, Walter Middleton, of course, dear. Mrs. Middleton's been dead for years, and the son and daughter were out, so he was alone. The butler heard the shot and ran into the dining room, but Mr. Middleton was already dead. It's been on all the front pages. Oh, I only read the funnies. He was rich as anything, so there's the motive. Cigarette, Bill? Uh, no, no, thanks. The son and daughter are the most obvious suspects, so that lets them out. How about some candy, Bill? No, not just now. Why does it let them out? That's too obvious. Fruit? No, thanks. Nuts? Yeah, yeah, I'm beginning to think so. (laughs) (laughs) Bill, is this Middleton case what you wanted to ask us about? Yeah, yeah, it has a screwy angle. I thought it would be just up the north alley. You see, we have two confessions. You mean two people have confessed to the same murder? That's right, and each claims he worked alone. Well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's what I said. And since sense doesn't work in this case, I thought intuition might. How about it, Pam? I have to have something to go on. Uh, Who are these people who confessed, Bill? Not the son and daughter? No, no, they're a couple of friends of the Middletons. Larry Chapman and George Warwick. Oh, can I meet them? Sure, we're holding them at headquarters. Well, let's go. All right. I wonder what's in back of it, Jerry. I know. They heard confessions good for the soul. The dining room window was open, so I just pointed the gun through it and fired. That's impossible, Larry. Why? Because I did. Here we go again. Look, Lieutenant, doesn't priority count around here? I confessed first. But you're lying. Uh, may I ask a question? Go right to it, then. Why did you gentlemen kill Mr. Middleton? Well, well it's I, just that it's I... like this. Well, that is... What I was going I, to right, say hold is hold that... It, hold it, hold it. Now, you, Warwick, why did you shoot Middleton? 
Well, sir, I... I uh... I owed him some money and I couldn't pay him, so I killed him. You took the words right out of my mouth. You mean I put them in your mouth? You never even thought of it. I don't care what you say. I don't care what anyone says. I killed Walter Middleton. I hope to die if I didn't. It's the other way around, George. Uh, This isn't getting us anywhere. Well, why don't we toss a coin? Winner gets the electric chair. Wait a minute, Jerry. Uh, Now, look. If either of you shot Mr. Middleton, you had to have a gun. All right. Tell us where the gun is, and we'll see if it matches the bullet. I threw the gun away. So did I. I I mean, that's what I did. I demand you hold me for murder. You ought to hold him for plagiarism instead. Where did you throw away the gun? Who, me? Either of you. Both of you. I don't remember. I wrapped the gun in some old newspaper and threw it in some bushes. What bushes? Where? That's what I don't remember. Well, Pam, you're doing fine. Have any hunches yet? I have a hunch. They're both lying. (laughs) That's no hunch. It's a logical conclusion based on observation of the facts. You must believe me. I tell you, I killed Walter Middleton. With your little hatchet. Yeah, we know. Now, look. Don't either of you fellas want to change your stories? No. I killed Walter Middleton. He didn't. I did. Okay, okay. Here comes the policeman. Oh, yes, he has David Middleton with him. Hello, Lieutenant Wagner. Hello. Oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Noah. Hello. Hello. There. Lieutenant, I don't know how you're going to like this. M- maybe it's good and maybe it ain't. All right, what's up? Well, you sent me to question young Middleton here and check up on his whereabouts on the night of the murder, so I did. Yes. Well, what do you, what do you think he tells me? He says he killed his father. Oh, that's swell. He, he what? Yeah. He wants to confess. Bill? It looks like you've hit the jackpot. Well, I took your advice, Pam, and released our three uh, murderers. But what if it turns out that one of them's telling the truth? Yeah, we can always pick them up again. We certainly have nothing on either one of them as yet. Besides, if one of them is guilty, this is a better way to trap him. Give him enough rope. But, darling, you know what some people do with rope. What? Skip. Oh, We'll have to work fast before he has a chance. Do you have any plans? I'd like to talk to Helen Middleton. Maybe she can tell us something. Okay. But if she tells us that she's the one who killed her father, there'll be a second murder. And I'll commit it. After all, Larry and George are both very dear friends of mine, and David is my brother. You can't expect me to say anything against them. But if one of them killed your father... Oh, none of them did. I'm sure. Why? Well, I I just know it. Well, then, perhaps you can tell us something to help clear them. They're all under suspicion. But I don't know what to say. I told the police all I know, and and I've tried to answer your questions. But, unfortunately, it hasn't helped us much. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't think of any reason why they should all confess? No. All right. Well, we won't keep you any longer, Miss Middleton. Thank you. I hope you'll pardon me if I don't show you up, but I'm so terribly tired and I don't want to go downstairs again. Oh, that's quite all right. Goodbye. 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 Well, Pam, what do you think? You forget, Jerry. I'm not supposed to think. I'm supposed to feel. You know, intuition. (laughs) Well, then, what do you feel? Bewildered. I don't understand. Oh! I'm sorry, madam. I didn't mean to alarm you. You ought to give more warning when you pop out of nowhere. Not nowhere, madam. I was concealed in this archway. Eavesdropping on our conversation with Miss Middleton, huh? If you wish to call it that, I call it detecting. Are you a detective? Unofficially, like yourselves. Uh, Officially, I'm the Middleton's butler. Oh. Oh, you're the one who discovered the body. Yes, madam. Perhaps you can tell us something. I can tell you a great deal. I'm a profound student of crime. Oh, fascinating subject. Yes. I'll tell you this. You're on the right track. It's not suicide. It's murder. Of course it is. Nobody suggested it wasn't. After all, there was no gun near the body. How do you know? Well, I... How do you know I didn't find a gun and hide it to make it look like murder? But there's no earthly reason why you should. Uh Uh-uh. Jumping to conclusions. First rule of a good detective... Never jump to conclusions. But you just said yourself that it was murder. True. As a matter of fact, there was no gun. But you shouldn't take my word for it. Uh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Ah, uh, perhaps you think I killed Mr. Middleton. Good. Very good. Uh, never overlook anything. First rule of a good detective. I thought you just said that the first yes, rule was never... Yes, very good. However, you're wrong. I couldn't have done it. 
Why? The butler never does it. Not anymore. That went out with the bustle. But I'll give you a clue if you want it. What? In the back of the house. A little bungalow. Young David Middleton's studio. What about it? No one is allowed in it but the young master himself. The windows are all blacked out. My wife does the cleaning here in the main house. But even she's not allowed in there. Nobody is. Doesn't that strike you as significant? Certainly does. What mysteries does that studio contain? One time I tried to find out, but young David caught me. He was very angry. Haven't you any idea what he keeps there? No, but I'm sure it must be important. If you want the key to the mystery, find out the secret of the studio. Okay, thanks for telling us. Come on, Ben. All right. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Uh, uh, Butler. Goodbye. Well, Jerry, let's go and see if we can get in the studio. Oh, don't be silly, Ben. That butler's slap-happy. But there might be something to that story of the studio. Nonsense. But suppose there is, Jerry. We shouldn't overlook anything. First rule of a good detective. I mean it. Well, we'll tell Bill if he wants to investigate, he can. Well, I think we ought to. But, Pam... We're right here. I don't think we should. Oh, Jerry, please. No. Please. No. <laughs> Get in the clump of trees. Come on, Jerry. Careful, nobody sees us. You know, if young Middleton catches us at this, he'd be within his legal rights if he shot us. Oh, I can't see that it would hurt any more than if it were illegal. I mean, if you were shot, you wouldn't care, would you, whether it was legal or not, especially if you were dead. Oh. Let's not let him catch us, huh? <laughs> You're right. Let's not. Let. Be careful. This moonlight's pretty bright. Stay close to the bushes. All right. I don't know why I let you talk me into things like this. Because you're sweet. I think it's your baby blue eyes. They look so sad when you can't have your way. Like a calf's. Well, here we are. Calf's eyes are brown. Somehow that seems irrelevant. Well, now that we're here, what do we do? Let's see if we can find some way to get in. Oh, golly, it seems kind of spooky, doesn't it? It's all dark. Yeah. What's the matter? Oh, wait a minute. I thought I heard something. I guess I was wrong. Well, now, what do you want to do? I think I'll just try the door. Oh, oh Jerry! <laughs> Jerry, how can you laugh? I've been shot. You're all wet. I'm not. I've been shot. Oh. Oh, I, I am, aren't I? I thought it was blood. No, darling. You just walked into a trap. A bucket of water fell on your head. I'm soaked to the skin. What's going on here? Oh, oh, hello, Middleton. My wife decided to take a shower. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. North. I hope you're all right. I guess so. Only I'm... Cold. Well, come on back to the house and you can warm up. I'm sorry about this, but I don't like people to go near my studio. Yeah, so we found out. You know, that's quite an effective booby trap you have there, young fellow. Isn't it, Pam? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, oh, shoot. Jerry, stop laughing and come to bed. <laughs> I can't help it, Pam, when I think of the way you look. Like a drowned cat. <laughs> Before I was a cat. Well, you will go snooping into other people's business. Well, Bill asked us to help him. <laughs> I'm afraid you weren't much help. I guess not. You know, Jerry, in spite of it all, I like that David Middleton. Yeah, he seems to be a nice kid. I... Would like to know what he's got in that studio. Maybe he's hoarding sugar. Oh, now what? I'll answer it, dear. Hello. Yes? This is George Warwick. Oh, yes. I've been trying to get hold of Lieutenant Wigand. Do you know where he is? No, but I think I can find him for you. Good. If you and he come out to my house right away, I'll show you something very important. What is it? I've just discovered a very important clue. 
Now I know who killed Mr. Middleton. Well, I thought you said you killed him. I'll explain everything. Uh, how soon can you get here? Uh, I don't know. As soon as I find Bill. All right, I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who is it, Jerry? George Warwick. You better put your clothes on again, darling. One of our murderers has something to tell us. And this time, it's not a confession. <laughs> This is it. I wonder what he wants to show us. Well, it, it better be good. I don't like coming out in the middle of the night for nothing. I doubt that this will be as good as he promised. Somehow, I don't trust Wait that... a minute, Bill. What is it, Pat? I think there's somebody standing by the corner of the house. Yeah, you're right. Oh, boy, he's shooting at us. Stop. Hey! Hey! brief intermission for a message of special interest to the ladies. If you are not a user of Woodbury cold cream, I think I know why. It isn't because you believe your complexion is already flawless. Doubt if any girl has such a perfect skin she doesn't want to make it lovelier. No, the reason probably is you haven't yet been convinced that Woodbury cold cream can make a real difference in your complexion. But that just proves you haven't yet tried Woodbury cold cream. For using it once, will show you how extra effective it is. You see, Woodbury cold cream isn't just another cold cream at all. It's a complete beauty cream. It actually does everything for your skin. Why not take three minutes tonight to see all it can do? Throw the silky cream over your face and throat. It leaves your skin sparkling clean, glowing. Now pat on more. And this time, let a trace remain on your skin overnight. Tomorrow... Well, you may scarcely believe your eyes. Your skin will have such a radiant, new, smooth look. Now, that's the famous Woodbury Beauty Nightcap. Do it every night. But don't forget, Woodbury Cold Cream is as grand for daytime beautifying. It leaves your skin looking lovelier. Helps your makeup have that professional finish you envied. Woodbury Cold Cream gives such remarkable results because of four special softening, smoothing ingredients. And because of another exclusive ingredient working constantly to purify the cream in the jar in case blemish-causing germs should get in. Try this amazing, complete beauty cream. Get Woodbury Cold Cream tonight. And now back to Mr. and Mrs. North. The Norths and Wygand were approaching George Warwick's house when someone began shooting at them. He's shooting at Stop us. Stop, Payne. Jerry! There he goes. He's running the back of the house. You got your gun, Jerry? Yeah. Good. Go around the other side. I'll go this Okay. You see anything, Jerry? Pam, you shouldn't have followed me. Well, I wasn't going to stay back there alone. Well, all right. There's someone by the back door. Yeah, back, Pam. Who's there? Hello, that's you, Jerry. Phil. Yeah. See anyone, Jerry? No. No, neither did I. What do we do now? Well, I guess we'd better go the other... What's that? Someone's calling for help. It's coming from inside the house. Come on. Here's the door. It's locked. I have to break the glass. Then I can reach in, turn the knob. Look out. Okay. There we are. The call's coming from upstairs. Right. Let's go. I can't see anything. Now, wait. I'm feeling for the light switch. Oh, here it is. Oh, that's better. Now, come on. Hello. Where are you? In here. Sounded like that room there. Right. Hello in there. The door is locked. Break it in. Okay, I'll shoot off the lock. Stand back, Jerry. There we are. Hey, where are you? Over here, behind the bed. But, oh, it's Warwick. With his hands and feet tied. What happened, fella? Larry knocked me down. Tied my hands and feet and ran out. Larry Chapman, eh? Yes. He wore a mask, but I recognized him anyway. He must be the one who shot at us. Probably. I heard the shots. I wondered what was happening. Can you roll over a little so I can get to this other nut? Yeah. That's it. I'll have you loose in a second. What did Chapman want, Warwick? He must have been snooping around and heard me phone you. He's probably stolen the clue. What clue? The gun that killed Walter Middleton. You mean you found the gun? That's right. Well, there you are, all untied. Thanks. Now, what about this gun? 
I had it locked in my desk downstairs. Perhaps he didn't find it. Come on, we'll see. Okay. You see, on the night of the murder, I saw Larry throw a package wrapped in newspaper and some bushes. I didn't think anything of it until today when he mentioned wrapping the pistol in newspaper and throwing it in the bushes. And you went back to the same spot tonight and the gun was still there? Yes. I went back as soon as you released me. Then I went to see Helen. Why? I had to be sure she wasn't involved. As soon as I found out she had a perfect alibi, I phoned the North. Oh, then you confessed before just to shield Miss Middleton. That's right, Mrs. North. But it wasn't necessary. Chapman had already confessed. I know, but he was just making a play for her benefit. He's cut in enough already. Until he came along, I thought my chances with her were pretty good. Now I'm not so sure. Well, here we are. In just a second, I'll open the desk. Ah, it's still here. Yeah, so it is. Let me see it. Here, here. Well, apparently that isn't what Chapman was after then. Maybe he just wanted a chance to shoot us. But why would he want to kill us, Jerry? I don't know. Well, I can't explain it. All I know is that he knocked me down, tied me up, and then I heard him run out the door. And the next thing I knew, there was shooting. Say, wait a minute. Let's see that. What, the gun? No, the paper it's wrapped in. Hmm. What is it, Jerry? Warwick. You say you saw Chapman throw this package in the bushes on the night of the murder. That's right. Well, that's very strange. Why? Well, the murder took place a couple of days ago. But this newspaper the gun's wrapped in is today's paper. What? Why, I, I, I don't understand. I think I'm beginning to. Well, there's some mistake. I'll say there is, and you've made it. Oh, no. You can't think that I... Oh, no. can't we, though? How about that other story of yours? Which story? About Chapman attacking you and tying you up. It's true. He did. Oh, he did, huh? And then he ran out the door. That's right. How do you explain the fact that when we reached the door to your room, it was locked from the inside? I... I, I don't know. According to your story, you couldn't have locked it because you were tied up. Chapman went out through it. Well, I... I it must have... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Jerry, look out. He's grabbing the Stop gun. Stop him, Bill. No, you don't. I've got the gun now. Stand back, all of you. That's it. Don't now, look here, Walt. Oh, you don't can't move. Get away. I'm getting out of here. He's getting away. Yes, darling. I'm afraid he is. And you're sure you haven't any idea where he might go to hide out, Miss Middleton? No, I haven't. All right, thank you. We'll run along. Now, I'm sorry we had to disturb you in the middle of the night like this. Well, that's all right. Good night. Good night. Well, no luck here. We'll have to try something else. You know, Bill, I can't help wondering. About what? If he really was guilty, why did he confess? Oh, that was clever. By seeming to protect Miss Middleton, he threw suspicion off himself. Of course, that's it. Bill, Jerry, I, I just thought of something. You think you know where he is? I think I know, but... Wait a minute. What is it? Look, there's a light under the door in David Middleton's studio. Come on. Oh, why? You don't think Warwick's there, do you? No, but I've just got to find out what's in there. <laughs> you and your curiosity, you know what I got you before. Oh, I'll watch out, Jerry. I know what to look for this time. And we've got a murderer to track down. Oh, you men. Don't you have any curiosity? Besides, it won't take any time. Come on. All right, let's go, Bill. There'll be no living with her until she's satisfied. Well, all right. Oh, you darlings, both of you. Where's Saps? Yeah, I don't know why I agreed. I don't have to live with her. Shh, Bill. We're getting close. Too bad you forgot your bathing suit. Shh. I won't touch anything this time, Jerry. I'll, I'll just stoop down and see if I can see through the keyhole. See anything? Yes. He's in there. Young Middleton? Uh-huh. What's he doing? Sewing. Sewing? Yes. What's the idea? I lost my balance. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost my balance. I fell against the door and I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to... I mean, I didn't mean... I fell. Doggone it. I told you to keep away from here. Oh, Mr. North, too. And the lieutenant. What do you want? I wanted to be able to live with my wife. Huh? Yes, she just had to see what you have in here. Well, now you see. I hope you're satisfied. Donald's? Yes, I make them. Silly, isn't it? I don't think so. I just like to make dolls. Sort of a hobby. There's no law against it, is there? Uh, no, no, not that I've heard. I know. I ought to fool around with shortwave radio or, or electric motors or something. But I'd rather make dolls. Well, what are you waiting for? Why don't you laugh? I don't feel like it. Uh, look, uh, son... Is this where you were the night of the murder? Yes. That's why I confessed. So you'd all stop asking questions about where I was. 
didn't want to have to tell about it. I, I was safe enough. Two confessions before mine, and I could always tell the truth if I had to. But I hoped I wouldn't have to. Oh, you shouldn't feel so ashamed, David. These dolls are beautiful. Why, well, you're an artist. Look, Jerry, all kinds of characters. Yeah, they're absolutely perfect. Look, every little detail exact. Some of these dolls are so tiny, and others are almost life-size. Thanks, Mrs. North. You can have one if you like. Oh, thank you, I would. Uh, this one, this little old man with a pipe. Okay, he's yours. Oh, thank you, David. Jerry, look, isn't he cute? Little wrinkled-up face. Jerry. Hmm? Dolls. What about them? They give me an idea. I think I know how we can catch the murderer. With dolls? Yes, Jerry. With dolls. You see, Miss Middleton, there was quite a scheme. By pretending to shield you... Warwick could throw suspicion off himself. The very confession of murder would suggest he was innocent. And then being found tied up right after we were shot at. It would again make him seem innocent of that, too. And the gun plant would throw the blame where he wanted it. Clever. It's too clever. Mm, anybody who'd work out such an elaborate scheme wouldn't make such stupid mistakes as the date on the paper and the locked door. Besides, he's a slitherer. A what? Uh, a slitherer. There are two kinds of liars. Twisters and slitherers. Twisters figure out three or four twists ahead and lie accordingly, while slitherers just slide into whatever lie seems to fit at the moment. Mr. Warwick is a slitherer. But how do you know? At the jail, Mr. Chapman was always way ahead of Mr. Warwick. He confessed first, and he lied much better. He's a twister. It was he who confessed to throw suspicion off himself. Warwick simply confessed out of jealousy at Chapman's getting all your gratitude. Only a twister would have thought of that first confession. And get this twist. Instead of framing a case against Warwick, he lets Warwick frame a case against him. A case that will fold up and make Warwick seem guilty. You you mean Larry is the murderer? Well, sure. But, but then why did George run away? He saw so much evidence piling up against him, he was afraid we'd be able to pin the murder on him. Chapman's scheme was working. And it was an elaborate scheme, too. Chapman planted the gun in today's paper and put it in the bushes. And after tying up Warwick, he walked to the door, slammed it, and then quietly locked it. Slipped to the window and got out that way. Warwick on the floor behind the bed couldn't see him. I can't believe it. Why? Why would he do all this? Kill father and, and then try to put the blame on George. Simple. With your father's death, you and your brother share the inheritance. And by framing Warwick, Chapman hoped to eliminate him and marry you for your money. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't. Unfortunately, it's true. We haven't told Bill yet. But as soon as he gets here, we're going to tell him... You're that not he... going to do anything. I'm shutting you up now. All right, Chapman, drop that pistol. I've got you covered. That's it. Okay, folks, you can come out from behind the sofa. Helen! And Mr. and Mrs. North? Yeah, what you shot were just dummies. Life-size dolls, which you probably can see yourself now that you take the time. Mr. and Mrs. Proxy. Oh, poor Mrs. Proxy. You hit her right between the eyes. Helen, you... You were in on this. You invited me here, left the front door open so I'd come in and overhear yes, you. Yes, Larry. She didn't want to. But when we convinced her that you'd killed her father, she agreed. Well, you can come along with me, Chapman. We didn't have any proof against you before, but we have now. Thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Proxy. Golly's Jerry. Y you know something? What? We're not such bad twisters ourselves, are we? <laughs> Do you think a film star has an easy life? Well, she doesn't. Making a picture is unusually hard work. She has to be up at dawn to have her makeup on and be ready in time. She works all day under blazing lights. Then there are personal appearances, for every star is busy with war work these days. And off the set as well as on, she has to look glamorous. Well, the beauty care that can keep her skin soft and radiant through all that has to be remarkably effective. And here's what Veronica Lake does the Paramount star now appearing in So Proudly We Hail. She told us... 
I take the three-minute Woodbury Beauty Nightcap every night with Woodbury Cold Cream. The beauty results are thrilling. Well, girls, your skin may not have such hard treatment as a film star's, but if Woodbury Cold Cream can do so much for them, think what it can do for you. That's because Woodbury is much more than just cold cream. It's a complete beauty cream. Jars, ten cents to a dollar and a quarter. That's Woodbury, W-O-O-D-B-U-R-Y, Woodbury Cold Cream. Get a jar tonight. Tune in again next Wednesday evening at the same time for another adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North. For thrills and laughs, be sure to listen, won't you? This is Ben Grower saying good night for Woodbury, 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 for the skin you love to touch. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's prison evidence. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight robbery. Pardon me, uh... Could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Uh... Help! What? Help! I wonder what's wrong with her. Help! I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? Uh... Can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder! Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes. Oh, it's awful. You shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come. Let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No. I, I just saw him lying there in a pool of blood. Then I... I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. <laughs> there we are. Now, if you'll show me the library. He's... He's in there. Oh, yes. I see. He's uh, dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and... I saw a light still on in here. And she looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I, I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head. Close range. Well, I... Looks as if he did it himself. No. No. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I, I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarboe, 7 Dunner Street, City. Do you know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam, 
You've been a widow, in fact, ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will. which leaves everything to you, a repentant husband, Enos Jarbo. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? No, I, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting, and he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write, and I've had it ever since. Is there another key to this desk? No. Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are... I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbeau using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Charbeau. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Charbeau. Oh, the poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I, I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston. And on the way, he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station, a messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman, and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbo. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And goodbye. Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything mm -hmm. she told me. But somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Oh, I think I'll... Pardon me. Uh, would you let me have a light? Yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, come along. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? I've met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute. Watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she's still... Yes, I know it, I know it, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy, I want you to find out what you can about old Enos Jarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. If that man leaves before Scubby gets here, I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. <laughs> Is it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of a big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbo. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. 
But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from state's prison. Ah, pardon me, Scubby. Want to speak to the desk clerk? Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to speak yes. to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank you. Oh, Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have not remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I wanted to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, Governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks. I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office... Because I'm going to be out of town for a few days. And I want to have everything straight before I leave. Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter. Except that Mrs. Jarbo has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me. And I know she'd like me to leave. Oh, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is in uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. But nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbot and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Forged will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note, which Charbot didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And Ella, I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I... even if I have to go to jail to do it. Oh, you're the new man. Yeah, Warden. Well, what's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? Thirty-three. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory. Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What'd I get you for? Cracking a safe. There's four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure, know him well. Great guy. Yeah, sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. And he's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. Thought her name was Sarah. No, oh, no, his wife's Eddie. Sarah was his sister. Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but he left her flat. I don't know what happened after that. And he's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out a few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. And yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy's on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. Hey, Barney. Yeah. Look, you've known me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know, I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, in a big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. Haven't seen her since, though. So. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. 
I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. All right, you get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed rubbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Huh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set? Sure. Mike's with us all the way. Same as before. Hey! You over there! That's us. Come on. Gavin, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once oh, more. Come on, get it going. We ain't got all day. Heave. As soon as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look, bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You all right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. Watch out, Max. The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at it. Pour it out. <laughs> well, we're out of jail now. And for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. Now, tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now, let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned... This Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Martin, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. And that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbeau was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Betsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. 
He and Mrs. Jarboe were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. Hmm. And then Mrs. Jarboe said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jarboe. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> we'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. <laughs> Carter? Mr. Carter? Is that you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure there's no one around? Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarboe has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. Maybe seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me. Does Mrs. Jarbo know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? Uh, there was talk about chloroform and poison. And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm -hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Jarbo. Ella, what are you Barnaby doing McCoy, here? Barnaby Coy, you... Max Herbert, by all this holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Well, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jarbo, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you. I, uh... What are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. You're both lying. Get out of here, both of you. Immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back. Either of you. Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to... Tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah. I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you. So don't try to have it right. right. There, there you go. Sit down. Let go of me. Stop. 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 I'll shoot. No, you don't. No. You let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yep. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But, what? You know me? Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over on the street light. All right. You know me now? Well, Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd pass two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even give us their names, too, well, so I... Well, need... now, Ben. Listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarboe place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me, because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Jarboe. <laughs> Are all the 
men posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. What's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm -hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarbo estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addy, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? That's well, if I point. can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't gonna bother us. Yeah. So, we bet... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering it. Hey, somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were coming up here? Anybody here? Mike! Come on. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? You did, McCoy. Are you crazy? I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Sharpo House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay. Very important. And it's signed, Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, you mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now, I was baby. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept down a bit. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just... Shut up, you just did it. I... Come on, kids. That's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Come on. You gotta get out. I'll take it easy, sir. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max, what are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, and Nick's got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Addie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, you found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then. But you arranged with the guard Mike here to help McCoy escape when the time was right. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him. And between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbeau and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Addy got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbo ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Well, isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor.
Next week at the same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Foot. Then I grabbed her, and I wound my fingers around her throat. <laughs> I squeezed her windpipe tight. <laughs> Tighter and tighter. <laughs> What's the matter, Patsy? Oh, Nick, put the lights on. All right. And I said I wanted to hear the recorded confession you made of that mad murderer who killed his wife. I didn't think I'd have to listen to it in the dark. Well, that's the way we got him to confess in the first place. Oh, I'll take it, Patsy. Okay, Nick. Nick Carter's office. Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Nicholas Carter. This is Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello, Nick. This is John Hamill, the banker's associates. Oh, hello, John. How have you been? Nick, I'm in trouble. I can't discuss it over the phone. How soon can you meet me? Where? On West Street, around the corner from the Greystone building, where my offices are. Please get there as fast as you can. All right, John. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Now, Scubby, you understand exactly what you're to do? Yeah, Nick. Okay, I'll see you later. I've got a date on this corner. Okay, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Hey, look at that car coming up the street, would you? Hey, Nick, watch out! That car is headed right at you! Jump, Nick! Oh. oh. Did he hit you, Nick? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, gee, that was close. It almost seemed like whoever was driving that car did that on purpose. Wouldn't be at all surprised, Scubby. I think somebody is interested in preventing me from keeping my appointment. Hey, look. Baby, I better stay with you, Nick. No. I've got something else for you to do, Scubby. I got the number in that car. Hop down to the license bureau and find out who it belongs to. Then wait for me at the office. Oh, Nick. Uh, sorry, I'm so late. Oh, hello, John. I've been on this corner waiting for you for 20 minutes. Where have you been? Trying to get here without anyone seeing me. Well, why all the mystery? What's up? Wait a minute, Nick. Here, get back in this doorway, quick. Don't let him see us. Well, who was that? Somebody trailing you? I don't know. I never saw him before. Well, then why'd you want to dodge him? You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Nick. Absolutely nothing. Now listen, I don't want the police in on this just yet, if I can help it. A banking firm like mine can't stand any unnecessary notoriety. Well, yes, I know, John, but what's this all about? Well, let me explain... I wanted to tell you out here where I can be sure no one will hear us. You see, Nick, several days ago, I discovered there's a serious shortage on our books. Somebody has been taking money from the accounts, and I'm almost, almost sure I know who it is. I've called a meeting of my four partners. They're upstairs in my office waiting for me right now to have a showdown before the stockholders find out. That's why I ask you to come over here, Nick. You may have to make an arrest tonight. Well, you don't want a detective, John. You want a cop. No, no, no. You're wrong, Nick. I want you. Please come along. Well, perhaps you better wait down the lobby while I go up and see if everything's all right. That is safe for you to come No, out. no, Nick. There's no need for that. All right. I now. want to be in on the showdown. Come on. Anything you say. And if you really feel that something dangerous is in the wind, I think I should go up there first and look around. Then if everything's okay, let you know. No, no. I want to go up now and get it over with. Well, if you insist. I do, Nick. Oh, I know it's pretty late, but I waited purposely till the offices were closed to avoid any publicity. 
This whole business requires the greatest secrecy. Twenty-fourth floor. Oh, this is our floor, Nick. After you, John. Oh, thank you. Kind of dark in this hallway, isn't it? Yes, the lighting isn't any too good here, but I... John. John. John, are you hurt bad? Nick. Nick. What's happened? Why is John? Uh, quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen, John Hamill is dead. John oh, Hamill is dead, but that's terrible, oh, terrible. How did it happen? That's what I want to know. You seem to know him. Who are you? Well, I could ask you the same question. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter, the detective? Yes. Oh, well, my name's Tom Burdick. I'm one of Hamill's partners, and uh, uh, these are the others. Uh, Mr. Carter, I'm Emil Garrick, and this is Arthur Nelson and Alan Cornish. How do you do, Mr. Carter? You're Cornish, huh? Yes, Mr. Carter. What do you know about this? Nothing, nothing. I I was in my office all the time. No, that's not true, Cornish. I saw you go out in the hall just a few seconds before Hamill was shot. That right, Cornish? Yes, I... I did go out for a moment. But when the shot was fired, I was back in my office. But why question me? Why don't you ask Burdick where he was or Nelson McGarrick? Well, I can easily explain where Mr. Nelson and I were. We were both together in my office preparing some papers for tonight's meeting. That's right, Mr. Carter. I was with Mr. Garrick. Which of you men belong to which office? Well, you can see the layout yourself, Mr. Carter. They all open off this L-shaped corridor. First comes Nelson's office, then Burdick's. There, on the long leg of the L. Then on the corner at the end is Cornish's office. Directly in line with the corridor to the elevator. And Garrick's office is around the corner on the short leg of the L. That's right. Hmm. That's out of sight of the elevator completely, isn't it? Sure. You can't even see the corridor from my office. So I see. Then, Cornish, your office is the only one which faces the corridor. I'd like to have a look at it. All right. This way. This is my office, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Peculiar order, yeah? Let's see. Well, what do we hear in this umbrella stand? A gun. A what? what and it's been that? fired very recently. I should say, gentlemen, this was the murder weapon. That's Mr. Cornish's umbrella stand. What do you know about this, Cornish? I don't know anything about it. Well, that gun belongs to Mr. Cornish. That's right, Mr. Carter. I've seen it in his desk many times. I recognize that fancy handle. Say, what are you fellows trying to do? Well, sure, it's my gun. But I haven't seen it for three days. Someone stole it on my desk, Mr. Carter. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because I... I didn't carry a permit for it. I was afraid of getting in trouble. Cornish, I regret that appearances are against you. I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. You won't turn me over to the police? Well, oh, what happened to the lights? Cornish, turn them out. Turn those lights on, somebody. Oh, there you are, Mr. Carter. There he goes, Carter. It's Cornish. He's escaping down the hall. Stop, Cornish. Stop, or I'll shoot. You see, Patsy, I was right with Hamill when he was murdered. What I can't figure out was how he was shot when there was no one else in the hall with us. Don't ask me, Nick. And here's something else. I heard only one shot fired. But Cornish's gun had three empty shells. And to top it all off, here's the bullet that killed Hamill. The mm. coroner gave it to me. Notice how it's all banged up? Yes. How did that happen? I wish I knew. Patsy, if I knew the answer to that, I think I'd know the answer to this whole case. Until we find Cornish. Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Carter? Yes, this is Nick Carter. Oh, this is Alan Cornish. I... I suppose I'm a fool for calling Bob Carter, but I need help. I'm desperate and I can't go to the police. You've got to help me prove I didn't kill Hamill. Why'd you run away, Cornish? Because I was scared. Lucky for me you didn't hit me. Don't worry, Cornish. If I'd really wanted to hit you, I would have. Where are you now? I'll tell you, but you've got to promise to come alone. If you don't... The only thing I'll promise you is that I won't do anything to have to have talked to you. Now, what's the address? 1813 Oak Street. Come right over. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, sit tight. I'll be there. You mean we'll be there. I'm sick of sitting around here. I'm going with you. Eighteen thirteen Oak Street. This is it, Betsy. Gosh, what a creepy looking place. Ah, certainly not very attractive. Well, come on, let's go in. Maybe he's not here. Said he'd be here. Wonder if... The... Well, the door's open. Should we go in? We can't keep our date with Cornish if we don't. Go 
gosh, it's dark in here. Nick, do you suppose it could be a trap? You never can be quite sure, Patsy. Here's the door. Stand behind me. You see anything in there, Nick? Wait till I get my flashlight. No. Nope. Looks deserted. Oh, come on. Let's try another room. Oh, gee, this place gives me the jitters. It's practically deserted. Maybe he's in here. Stand back, Patsy. No, nothing in there. Oh, maybe he got scared after he called you and slipped away. We'll soon find out. There's another door over there. Look, Nick. Is that... Yes. He's hanged himself. Well, Nick, I don't know why he came back to the office again tonight. Cornish is dead. I guess that closes the case. That's see, I'm not satisfied. When I talked to him on the phone, he certainly didn't sound like a man who was going to kill himself. When a man wants to prove himself innocent, he doesn't commit suicide. No, Patsy, there's something about that hanging that's bothering me, and I can't lay my finger on it. You probably figured that was the best way out. To kick over the chair and end it all. Patsy, remind me to give you a raise. And what did I do? I've got it! Look, Patsy, Cornish was a short man. Well, so what? Patsy, Cornish couldn't have hanged himself. Well, why not? Don't you remember, Patsy? The only furniture in that room was a bed. And Cornish was so short, he never could reach that noose from the bed where it was. Of course, Nick. The bed was on the other side of the room. Patsy, Cornish was murdered, which eliminates him as a suspect. Probably he was killed by the same man who killed Hamill. Oh, but who, Nick? Who? I wish I knew. I wish I Hiya, knew. Hiya, Nick. Hiya, Patsy. Well, if it isn't the missing link. Scubby, did you find out anything about that car that nearly ran me down this afternoon? Oh, you bet, Nick. Good. But what a time I've been having. Wait till you hear what I have to tell you. Well, I had to get the license commissioner out of bed to get it, but, oh boy, it was worth it. Hey, do you know who that car belongs to? Tom Burdick, Hamill's partner. Good boy, Scubby. Did you get his address, too? Yeah, some deserted neck of the woods out in Long Island. I've got the address here somewhere. Fine. Come on, Scubby. You and I are going to pay him a visit. You know, Scubby... The more I think of it, the more it looks as if Tom Burdick might be mixed up in this somewhere. Oh, I hope so, Nick. Otherwise, we're using up a lot of gas in this jalopy of mine for nothing. Hey, have you noticed anything funny, Nick? You mean that car that's been trailing us for the last few minutes? That's it. What do you make of it, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. But I think we'll be finding out quickly enough. They're overtaking us. Better step on it. Okay, Nick. Here we go. How are we doing? Not so good, Scubby. They're still gaining on us. Can you give her any more gas? I'll try. There. They still coming up? Yes, Scubby. And fast. That's hey. Scubby. They're shooting at us. You're telling me. Watch it. Here they come. Well, I've done all I can, Nick. This old bus won't go any faster. Well, let's try an old trick, Scubby. When they get close to us, slam on your brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Yeah? They won't be expecting that. It may throw them completely off balance and spoil their aim. Okay, Nick. You say when. Now, pull over. Okay. Oh, boy. That was a close one. Are you all right, Nick? Yeah. Well, we won't see them anymore for a while. Get going, Scubby. we got to make up for lost time. Nick, I've got to hand it to you. You have the darndest way of getting into a cellar. Well, we had to get into Verdict's house somehow. This cellar with its trick entrance from the garage looked like the safest way. Especially with those two vicious-looking dogs posted at both the front and back doors to the house. Well, they sure were big ones, too. I'd hate to meet one of them. Hey, where do you think this is going to lead us to, Nick? We should find a stairway going upstairs. That's not very much mistaken. Yeah? Yeah. Here's one. All right, let's go up. But careful. All right, Nick, you lead the way. I'm with you. Here's the door. I hope it's open. No, darn it, it's locked. I'll soon fix that. There. All right, Scubby, come on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Someone's coming into the room, Scubby. Get back. 
We can hear through the crack of the door. I'll leave it open in a loop. Well, Mrs. Vertigo, I'm certainly glad you called me up. I'm only too happy to be here at a time like this. After all, we're practically neighbors, aren't we? Oh, I just had to talk to someone, Mr. Garrick. I'm so worried about Tom and those horrible things that have been happening at the office. What do you make of all this? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Mrs. Burdick. Tom can take care of himself, if he has to. What do you mean, Mr. Garrick? Oh, nothing, nothing. But he has been acting rather strangely lately. Well, that's just it. I'm so worried. I haven't seen or heard from him all day. He's never been so late coming home from the office. Well, it's after 11. Oh, there's really nothing to worry about, Mrs. Burdick, even in a case like this. Of course, it looks very peculiar for Tom to be missing his way, especially at this particular time. Mr. Garrick, but I'm... you don't think Tom had anything to do with all this sort of... Well, Mrs. Burdick, I like Tom very much. I would hate to think that Tom had anything to do with this murder. Of course, things are... Oh, Scubby, we don't seem to be learning much this way. Might as well go in and let him know we're here. Sure, Nick. Good evening, Mr. Garrick. <sighs> Why, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I just came along with one of my assistants, Scubby Wilson, to talk to Mr. Burdick. We came in this way because we didn't want to disturb the dogs. Oh, really? I... Who are you? Oh, Mrs. Burdick, uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge of investigating Hamill's death. Mr. Carter, the detective? Nothing's happened to Tom, has it? I don't believe so, Mrs. Burdick. I just want to ask him a few questions when he arrives. Well, maybe that's why Tom hasn't come home. Maybe he's afraid of... Uh, maybe that's he now. Wait, wait, I'll go look out the window to see if that's his car. Carter, I must warn you to be careful. Burdick's a dangerous man. Tom! Tom! Nick Carter's here! Please, Mrs. Burdick, come away from that window. Here to see you. you won't do him any good that way, Mrs. Tom. Burdick. Tom! Stop it, you hear me, please. Hey, that's his car, Mr. Carter. Look, he's getting away. Come on, Scully, let's get after him. Okay, okay, I'll go with you, Carter. Hurry up. I want to know why he runs away when he hears my name. I hope this car of yours stays on the road, Carter. Don't worry about it, Mr. Garrick. Carter, I, I didn't want to say too much in front of Mrs. Burdick, but we've all been afraid of Burdick. All right, all right. Scubby, just keep your foot on that throttle and keep after him. Oh, boy, we sure made that one on two wheels. Nick, I'm pushing this crate as fast as she'll go, but we don't seem to be getting any closer. That car of Burdick's could sure step. As long as we hang on and don't lose him, I'll be satisfied. Hey, watch it. We're coming to a railroad crossing. So I see. Well, maybe we can head him off now. If Burdick tries to beat that limiter to the crossing, he's crazy. Look, Carter, I think he's going to try to make it. He can't do it. He'll be killed. Oh, Nick, that nurse that just came out of the operating room is signaling you. Oh, yes. She wants me to go into Burdick. You wait for me here, Scubby. Okay, Nick. Burdick? Burdick, can you hear me? Yes, Carter. I can hear you. Carter, I'm a dying man. Yes, I, I know. I swear to you, I didn't kill Hamill or Cornish. Then why did you try to run me down with your car this afternoon? Carter, I didn't do that. All I know is that for several hours this afternoon, my car was mysteriously missing. I didn't find it again until I started home this evening. Bertie. Why did you run away from your home tonight when your wife told you we were there? And how about the securities we found on you after the wreck? It wasn't you. It was securities. I took them so that... Yes, Burdick? Why did you take them? I took them so I could keep him from stealing them. Who? Burdick, who? Burdick, who's he? Carter, front office, bottom drawer of desk, something will lead you to murder. Yes, Burdick? Who's the murderer? He, he is... Oh. Burdick. Burdick. Oh, poor chap. If you'd spoken sooner... 
you might have lived longer. Nick! Oh, Nick, I got here as quick as I could. Have you found anything yet? I think so. Scubby Burdick wasn't lying to me. I found this in the bottom drawer of the desk in the front office here. A book? Well, is that what Burdick meant? Just look at that title. Studies of Various Angles of Bullets in Flight. Well, so what, Nick? Scubby, that's the way Hamill was killed. It all adds up perfectly. Now I know why I heard only one shot when I found three empty shells in the murder weapon. Three shots were fired, but two of them were fired at a different time from the third. Well, do you know where the other two bullets are, Nick? I do. Follow me out in the hall and I'll show you. Yeah? You see, Scubby, as soon as I found that book in the flight of bullets, I did a bit of looking around, and I finally found them. Well, where are they? In the office here? No, Scubby, in the corridor. Right over there in that dark corner, embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft, about a half a dozen feet from where Hamill was killed. Well, what are they doing over there? Scubby, this was a very ingenious crime. And if you watch carefully, I'll show you just how ingenious it really was. Now, you notice that Cornish's office is the only one facing the corridor leading from the elevator. Yeah. So what? Well, in order to shoot someone coming down the hall, the murderer, if he were in any office but Cornish's, would have to step from his office out into this corridor and be seen. Right? Yeah, right. But our murderer was very clever. I got the answer when I located the book and when I found these embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft. The two missing bullets. Right. Well, hey, they're all banged up. Precisely, just like the murder bullet. And that's what gave me the answer. You see, Scubby, yeah. the murderer never left his office. He stood inside the front office, the one around the corner, on the lower leg of the L-shaped corridor, and aimed at that steel pillar built into the wall over there. When the bullet hit the steel face of the pillar, it was deflected into Hamill's lungs. Look here. You see these marks in the face of the pillar here? Where? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are the bullet marks. Oh, well, gosh, Nick, that's fantastic. Hey, are you sure you're right? Positive. Don't you see, Scubby? That explains the other two shots that were fired. They weren't fired at Hamill, and they weren't fired at the time the murder was committed. They were practice shots used by the murderer to be sure he had the correct angle from which to shoot Hamill. Gosh, Nick, I've certainly got to hand it to you. Yes, but we still have to get the murderer. But how? And who is it, Nick? I rather think that if we step back in the office and wait, we'll find out soon enough, Scubby. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that whoever it is will be in this office within the next few minutes, because after my discoveries, I made a couple of phone calls, and I invited the two remaining partners to meet me here. Shh. Here comes someone now. Oh. Hello. How do you do, gentlemen? Oh, hello, Garrick. I got your phone call, Carter, and I got here as fast as I could. Garrick, have you seen this book before? Mm, studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Why, yes. Now that I think of it, I think I have. Does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. But I remember that one day when I was with Mr. Nelson, he stopped in front of a bookshop and looked at it. Rather closely now that I think of it. Yes, I, I'm sure it was Nelson. Very interesting. Now tell me, Mr. Garrick, when the murder was committed, are you positive that you and Mr. Nelson were in this office together? That's right, Mr. Carter. Can you show me exactly where each of you stood at the time the shot was fired? Well, now let me see. I was uh, here, facing the window, and Nelson was, well, standing uh, right about here by the door. Mm-hmm. I see. Did you notice in which direction he was facing at the time? Yes, I remember. This way, facing the corridor. In other words, the way he was standing, you could see him only in profile. That's right. Well, there's no question but that's how it was done, Scubby. The murderer planted himself in this office so that he could establish a strong alibi. He then took the gun from his pocket, unseen by the other person in the room, who could see him only in profile, and then fired it at that steel pillar. Then as he ran into the corridor with a rest, after Hamill was dead, he dropped the gun into the umbrella stand in front of Cornish's office. Well, Carter, do you mean that Nelson is the one How who... How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, Nelson, you did. Why did you kill Hamill and Cornish? Please, Garrick, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Nelson, does this book look familiar to you? Uh, this book? Uh, no, I can't say that it does. You sure you've never seen this book before? Hmm, now that you mention it, I... May have glanced at it in a bookshop at one time or another, but then I look over a lot of books. I like to browse. I see. Nelson, see how you approve of this story of Hamill's murder. Yes? The killer knew of Cornish's criminal record, and he figured he could embezzle some of the firm's money and pin it on an innocent man. Then when he found out that Hamill was becoming suspicious and was having the accounts checked, he became panicky and afraid that it might not work out the way he had planned. So he decided to kill Hamill. 
Then when he happened to overhear Hamill's conversation with me over the telephone, he hurriedly borrowed Burdick's car without Burdick's knowledge and tried to get rid of me. That's an interesting way out, Mr. Carter. Have you also a theory as to who the killer is? I have. By the process of elimination, it has to be either you or Mr. Garrick or an unknown. And I've already proved that I didn't do it. It must have been an unknown then, Mr. Carter. I certainly didn't kill Hamill. I had nothing to do with the murder. When the shot was fired, I was right here in this room with Mr. Garrick. He can testify to that. He has already, Mr. Nelson. In fact, Mr. Carter, I was standing right here, facing the window when the shot was fired. Oh, no. That's where I was, Mr. Carter. Standing there at the window. Now, now please, Garrick. Please, now, gentlemen, please. please. I... You don't have to argue about it. I know who was at the window, and I know who fired the fatal shot. Scubby, take a look at the flyleaf of this book. Oh, what are they, Nick? They look like the scribbles that some guys draw when they have nothing else to do. Oh, doodles, they call them. Exactly. While I was looking through the various offices, I found some papers with these same doodling marks on them in one of the desks. And these marks were made by the murderer. Garrick, I arrest you. What's up, Nick? He's got a gun! Oh. Well, Scubby, pick up the pieces. Oh, boy. There's the murderer, Garrick. He's also the man who tried to murder you and me last night in the road of Burdick's home. Oh, well, I'll be. You see, Scubby, Burdick has his suspicions about Garrick. That's why we found those securities on him. He took them so that they wouldn't fall into Garrick's hands. He'd suddenly found out that Garrick was an unscrupulous crook. And that was the reason he ran when Mrs. Burdick called him. He saw Garrick at the window and was afraid of him. Well, Nick, I must say he had me fooled when he said that Nelson was standing at the door of the office here when he was really there himself. Yes, in telling us who was in this office, our clever murderer just reversed the positions in which he and Mr. Nelson were standing when the murder was committed. But once I saw the marks on that flyleaf, I knew who stood where. And that's why I had Nelson come up here, to force Garrick's hand. Well, Nick, one way's as good as another as long as you get results. And you always seem to do that. finally decided to come back, did you? Yes, Patsy, it's all over. Well, I think you can go home now. Why, Mr. Carter, are you sure you can spare me? Why not? You've been so busy on this case all night, Mr. Carter, you may not have noticed that it is now a new day. And a good secretary is always on the job the first thing in the morning. Shall I take a letter, Mr. Carter? This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what's next week's story all about? Well, when this case was first brought to me, it seemed so routine and uninteresting that I practically turned it down. But it was far from routine once you got into it, wasn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. So far from it that... I almost got myself bumped off investigating it. It's really the story of a man who thought he was so much cleverer than Nick that he could outwit him every time. I don't suppose he got away with it. No. He found he wasn't really so clever after all. Like practically every criminal I ever met, he gave himself away by being too clever. Well, sounds like an interesting tale, Nick. Not only interesting, but downright exciting. But more of that next week. So long, folks. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by George Gordon. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Body on the Slab or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Beginning Wednesday, November 3rd, The Return of Nick Carter, which is produced in the studios of WOR, will be broadcast over most of these stations on Wednesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Wartime. Remember the new time... Wednesdays at 8.30 Eastern Wartime, beginning Wednesday, November 3rd. This is Mutual.
What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Body on the Slab. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mr. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house. A very run down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Here, I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I have been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game, and he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place, and I attempted to talk him out of it, but I couldn't do it. So about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me, but he refused told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he, he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. Afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm lit. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no. I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure. One will be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. You won all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice of you. You won fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beer. Uh, here you are, stranger. Drink hearty. Uh, excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Well, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs. He'll be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and... Nobody will bother you. Well, if you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Good, you're a smart man, but we couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, mister? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired, Oakson. Give me your arm, mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Please. Well, I'll come along just to be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep. Well, here's your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Sir. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night. Good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm off the side. I'm off the side. <sighs> well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. One little do to give me a look around. Instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable. But. Oh. man were lying on this bed, that blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. If the man were drunk enough or had been drugged, you'd never know what hit him. 
Well, let's look around here. Yes. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh-huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Well, what's this? Well, look at this. Well, what's this? 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 Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. His vest with blood on it. And there's a shirt and a jacket. Both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. <sighs> and I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore either. Now to wait for them. He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his bed, he'd have to be the sleep of the dead. All right. Easy does it. Is he still asleep? Yeah. You hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. The evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with a little mustache? I do. You murder him the way you try to murder me? I didn't know nothing with him. Maybe I wanted to, but I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? No, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, his friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab, if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body. Painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with a dent in the back. The trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scubby got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper and had to leave on a boat till it sailed last night. Scubby gone without saying goodbye to me? Well, he couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scubby. Well, of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scubby's place. Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with. And he had me come clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. You like him, Patsy? I hope so. Well, she'll be in a minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. You're right, Penny. That's the taxi we're looking for. And I know that driver. You do? Yes. John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man. Friend of yours? Hardly. Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me. What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon and the early part of this evening, he's acted like any other cabbie. Taken whatever fares he could get. But the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and all were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. i got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. 
So long, but don't take any wooden nickels. Okay, pal, that's right. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I, I had to. Hey, taxi, mister? Huh? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? What do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car in my own. A friend of yours I... told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, and I saw it. It's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find it. Hey, what's out. the address, mister? Uh, the address? It's um, the, the, the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, but I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, Try one, McDuff. I'll wager it won't be towards second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. So that's the stunt. Picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. Uh, suddenly plenty deserted, way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. So we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets. Then I'll dump Make you a out. move, Hagen, and hey, I'll blow your what, brains out. What the... Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Oh. Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. Uh, I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back. His companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you, if you know all that, why do you ask me, huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. No, uh, well, uh, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Yeah, well, I don't know his name. They call him the captain. He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place uh, about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. Yeah, about my size, maybe. Yeah, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? After I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He was just as alive as you or me. Now we took him to 14 Wanton Place, left him. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to 2nd and 5th. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. If you have, keep out of my way, or you'll go to jail for life. This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzles me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. Because he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. Then you hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it. I hope so, Patsy. If she can only help me that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Bowen? Hello, Mrs. Wallace. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett. Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Oh, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him, if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. 
I think very highly of him. You're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? Why did you say you're calling from, Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the Weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the Weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? Yeah, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many facts. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. Well, by putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. A guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. Yep. You're right. You're right, Nick. They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. And they told me to have the ovens hot by 10 o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, what do you use when you... Make a test like that. Well, they sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes. How does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on this slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fellow. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the up. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body... Begins. Do we have to to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to reduce the body to ashes? Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean uh, even if the body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. And Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure. He's your friend, is he? Come on, Penny. There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. <laughs> Mr. Burnett, to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and certain other articles found on the body. Oh, must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. Nick, here I am. Over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. 
Brought my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm -hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab, drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took him in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Oh, Millie, this is terrible. Oh, my mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I, I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Oh. Nothing I recognize. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Well, I saw her only the day before yesterday. No, fool me, all right. I thought... I hope uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. The chap says as how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, the uh, chap says he won't take less than $50,000. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. Well, he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we can't... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. Arthur, I hoped you'd come. Uh, are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof, then over to your window. <gasps> Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes, they want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. And they'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. <laughs> but what can you do? You're only one against the two of them, and they're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise, if I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. Now tell me. What time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at 8 o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here. Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you made up your mind to pay the ransom the camp wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let him have it, fella. Oh, I warned you. Hey. Oh. Arthur, you've killed them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you are wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Burnett, I, I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't. <laughs> What's the matter with you men? What's the idea? Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace, the time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter! Nick Carter! Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett? I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. 
How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure I don't Perhaps know. Perhaps if he took off his makeup, you might recognize him. There. Do you know me now? Vernon. Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But, Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He, he said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's Arthur... exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced her husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. But that's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who were in reality men in his employ. But... Why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us. But there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. That was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to down both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious expenditure of Nick Carter entitled... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the left-handed killer. Well, 
Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone, or are you going to take me out to lunch, as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Nick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my on your mind. Right. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away, and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. Now, do I have to draw your diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Where have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, He's on ice. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cards. Uh, Well, there are probably hundreds of people I never heard of are carrying my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your card got on a corpse... Oh, now, take it easy, Riley. You know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Let's worry about one thing at a time. Well... You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, I know. With my card in it. Yes. Uh, Here we are. Last box here. Uh, Take a good look, Nick. Well, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, Oh, balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so out from the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, he was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. What did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, look at the prints on his neck. Closely, look at him. Yeah, yeah, well... Lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert. Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. got to be in my way. Hey, now, now, don't be forgetting. You can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. I, we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips Estate on Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints of Stanley Phillips' neck. And apparently neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, You know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um, Oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy... This case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. (laughs) If 
pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Patsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bone. Nick Carter, the great detective, where my brother often speaks of you. He thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, but your brother is dead. He's... He's dead? Yes. (laughs) I'm afraid he was murdered. (laughs) Murdered? Deadly murdered? Now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Of course, Mr. Carter, I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh, who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh, Oh, well, that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter, very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, Nick. There's someone at the window. He's got a gun. I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. I had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves, that's all. Look, Patsy, Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, in love with Rose. They've been wanting to get married, but Philip opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear, with oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Betsy, I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory and the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it had been more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. Well, I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello up there. Hello aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? <laughs> Phew. Climbing this rope ladder's no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. <laughs> Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oopsie-daisy. Oh, thanks. 
Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, it leads to Phillips' laboratory. Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Mm-hmm. Tom Marks seems to have vanished. But he certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. Hmm. Look here on the floor. Hmm. Broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. Desk been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. Well, it still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. Let's see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know... The man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. And using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Wait, the lights have gone off! Patsy. Mm -hmm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. You all right, Patsy? Uh, My head... Somebody hit me. Stay where you are, I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh, they must have been turned off the master switch in the engine room. And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. You were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay, come on. Nick, did they take the note? It's just what I want to find out. Let's see. A flash of light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Hey, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around on a white sink. Carefully now. A little bit. Hey, there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. <laughs> What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'd be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. Well, say, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dark. What? Patsy got knocked down the frigate and got a nasty bump in her head. Say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that board since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now, look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bona fide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, uh, what's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You say you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, w- what kind of a scoundrel is this Tom March? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. Wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Now let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley. We... Wait a minute. There's one thing more you ought to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Do- Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Clark, 
Mr. Carter! Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. All right. Yeah? Put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. Gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well, somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom, and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. Uh, what, what, didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. Well, look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Betsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean... You mean kidnap her? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Coles? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has his case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well, Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, you, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. All right. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's uh, mm-hmm. one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. You and I are going over this estate with a fine-tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, well, be careful you. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. Wouldn't you think they'd put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. <gasps> a machine gun? Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish? Oh, dear. Nick, those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, this catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used the string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. There are plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, Patsy, hmm? take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Patsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. And that every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. <laughs> Nick. Nick. Are you okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? <laughs> Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? 
I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter okay. myself. Sister, come on. <laughs> hey, come on, sister. Come on. Let her go along. Yeah, let her go. Let her go. You got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy will never be washed up on a beach like the dock was. <laughs> good. See you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. <laughs> That'll do it. Hey. Hey, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right. Speak your piece, Mr. Carter, because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll have you behind bars within 24 hours. Oh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bowen? He's worrying about a dame when he's going <laughs> to lose his own neck. Go easy with her. I'm warning you. Uh, Come on, let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yes. All right, lift him up. That's it. I'll get you, fellas, for this. Two, two, three. three. Uh, Let her go. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? They tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard, untied Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. Right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Coles. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Are well, those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Patsy. They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. Oh. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring. And... His killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Yes, look out! Oh, you got it, boy! Get out of here! And I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked them out cold. Sorry I had to plug in the shoulder, Coles, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley. Until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet. As if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht. One of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, huh? did you notice that when Coles lighted your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rosa's room, he used his left hand? See, by golly, he did. Right. Then, then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? 
Well, it can be done under ideal conditions, but this time I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So? This one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter! Oh, thank you, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, no, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I, I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, that cause was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Oh, what's that, Patsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Oh, say, that's easy, Patsy. I know a swell place in town. Right across from the morgue. Come on. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called the Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy. But after all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. <laughs> but I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Schott. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Substitute Bride, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. I was hired to find a blackmailer, and I did. But first I found a badly beaten Adonis, a Jezebel with an accent, and a man who had been an easy mark for murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Easy Mark. I'd spent a dull day on a duller subject, which was don't get caught with your income tax return down at midnight, March 15th. But after calling time for a thick stake designated to bolster the stamina of a private detective, but nevertheless non-deductible, I reluctantly headed back to my office where I found both my conscience and the long-form 1040 still waiting, which meant there was no way out. 
The dull day was going to stretch on into the night. But then I got a break. Because my telephone rang and the call was from one Mrs. Corey Gilbert, a prospective client who wanted action in a hurry. Marlo, you've got to move fast. I just found out that my husband, Ross, will be at 3806 Melrose Avenue in 20 minutes, and I know that means trouble. Well, just for size, Mrs. Gilbert, how do you spell trouble? With a capital B, as in blackmail. There's no time for details now. Just get to that address and find out who Ross is meeting with. Only hurry, Marlo, please. Well, hurry after what, Mrs. Gilbert? I've never met your husband, remember? Oh, oh, yes. Well, he's tall, dark eyes, dark hair, very handsome. And the blackmailer, short, stocky, and repulsive, I suppose. I've never seen the blackmailer. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, where can I reach you? Well, I live at 439 and a half Ogden Drive. Ogden Drive. The phone number is Gladstone 8195. 8195. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, I'll call you. Thanks. Oh, and Marlo. Yeah? Hurry, will you? You see, I... I love my husband. I was a little more than 20 minutes finding the address on Melrose. But when I finally pulled up and parked away from the place, I figured being late didn't matter because... Number 3806 turned out to be an unfinished house set deep in an acre of building materials. I was about to head for a telephone and get an explanation from a confused lady named Corey Gilbert when a lot of noise from what would someday be a living room changed my mind. Then I knew that my client had the right address after all because there in the pale light of a slice of moon taking the last of an awful beating from a thin man with a thick beard and a lot of muscle was Ross Gilbert. Dark eyes and dark hair like she said but no longer very handsome. Don't. Don't hit me again. Stop worrying, Gilbert. I'm almost through with you except for this. A present from Nanette. And just one more from Nanette. That last punch stacked Ross Gilbert onto a pile of rough lumber like he was another one by twelve. And as he slowly scraped to the floor, unconscious thick beard dusted himself off lightly, jerked at his tie and stepped out of the opening reserved for a future front door. I started over to help Ross Gilbert, but then I remembered that my client wanted to know who her husband was meeting and why, not how hard or fast he could swing. So I decided for the time being to play it quiet. When Thickbeard got into his car, I got into mine. followed him all the way to Beverly Hills, where he pulled to a stop in front of the Camden Arms Court. I parked lights out and watched him strut up a flagstone walk and knock on the door of a bungalow number four, which was dark. When he knocked again and it stayed dark, he took an envelope out of his pocket, wrote something on it, and jammed it into the mailbox. Then he got back into his car and started away fast. I walked up to the bungalow and helped myself to Thickbeard's empty envelope. On one side, scrawled in pencil and smudged, was the telephone number Sunset 31676. On the other, payment delivered okay, plumber. Plumber, huh? I shoved the message into my pocket, struck a match, and started looking for a name on the front door. But then a cab pulled up, and a moment later, I had help. I can be of some assistance, Perret? Yes, I, I was just... Oh. Uh. <laughs> Nanette? Oui. Nanette Lamarck. But I do not know you, monsieur. No. No, you don't, uh... I, um, I think if you will stop staring and begin talking, we will do much better. Who are you? Uh, Philip Marlowe, a friend of Plummer's. He asked me to deliver a message for him. Do I go on? Of course, Mr. Marlowe. But please come inside. It is so much nicer there. <laughs> Nanette was so right about it being nicer inside. There were lights. And that made it easier to see that the lady with the thick French accent and the gorgeous waistline was something that could have mustered her own foreign legion. She was narrow green eyes and open red lips, topped by a lot of close-cropped soft brown curls that kept running into each other. And for a dress, she was wearing about a quarter of a mile of draped chiffon that, in the right places, fitted a little closer than her own skin. When I told her what I claimed had been a message from Plummer himself, she purred her thanks and started to mix me a drink. When I brought up the subject of blackmail, she stopped abruptly, spilling a bottle of perfectly good Kentucky Tavern all over the table. Blackmail? What do you mean, Mallow? Extortion, honey. A malpractice of getting a lot for knowing a little that's not nice. (laughs) You are swinging wild now, mon cher. Maybe. 
But if it doesn't bother you, I'll stay right with it. Because I'd like to know why you and Plummer, who have such an easy mark, insist on throwing rocks. What easy mark are you talking about? A tall, dark, and used to be a handsome guy named Ross Gilbert. Ross? Soda, Marlowe? Yeah. But don't make it too sweet, honey. I can't take it that way. Nanette will be very careful not to make it too sweet. There. Tell me, mon cher, when did you last see Plummer? Uh, before tonight, I mean. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was at the fights over at the Legion Stadium last week. Now do I get my drink? Oui, mon cher. You will get your drink in your face, <coughs> liar. Mm. <coughs> oh, tell me, Frenchie. Is that Pearl Handle 32 considered the very latest along the Champs-Élysées? You have lied to me, mon ami. <clears throat> You see, Plummer only arrived in Los Angeles the day before yesterday, for the first time in his life. All right, I made a mistake about seeing Plummer at the fights last week. Now, why don't you put away the gun and we'll talk about Ross Gilbert. Ross Gilbert is a man I hate with all my heart. A man I could kill right this minute. And that Marlow goes for anyone connected with him. So now get out. Oh, without even so much as an au revoir? I reserve au revoir for my friends, Marlow. Good night. Hello? Marlo, Mrs. Gilbert, is Ross all right? Ross isn't here, Marlo. What happened to him? He ran into an ugly beating at that address on Melrose. And something nasty from out of town named Plummer is responsible. Ever hear of him and or an imported Jezebel called Nanette Lamarck? No, I haven't. But what about Ross? What's wrong with him? Nothing that a pound of beefsteak and enough liniment can't cure. But before we worry about Ross, Mrs. Gilbert, one more thing. It's a phone number I found on the back of an envelope that belonged to Plummer. Number is Sunset 31676. What? Somebody you know? Yes, someone I know very well. It's the telephone number of my ex-husband, Emery Marsh. Emery Marsh, huh? Fancy dress designer on Wilshire? That's right. But what's he got to do with all this? Emery only met Ross once in Mexico, a party at Ensenada. Yeah, well, look, Mrs. Gilbert, why don't we postpone collecting Ross until I find out a little more? Where does your uh, ex-husband Marsh live? In Santa Monica, but there's a good chance that he's still at his place on Wilshire. He does most of his work at night. Well, then Wilshire Boulevard's my next stop. I'll try to make it a quick one. Goodbye. Emery Marsh's place on Wilshire was an expensive shop with a single velvet-lined show window that was home for a beautiful mannequin wearing an evening gown that would drop at the first sneeze. And after I spent five minutes thumping on a plush leather-upholstered portal, a light finally clicked on someplace inside. And a moment later, Emery Marsh opened the door. He was tall, 45, sandy-haired, and looked less like a dress designer than I did. So after following his tweed back into an inner sanctum that was comb plywood behind Chinese modern furniture, I decided to play it almost straight. Now, Mr. Marlowe, what can I do for you? Well, it's a little too early to tell. I'm a private detective, Mr. Marsh, and I'm working for your ex-wife, Corey Gilbert. Corey? Mm-hmm. Is she in trouble, Mr. Marlowe? No, no, we're close to it. Tell me, Mr. Marsh, when you were last over to Nanette Lamarck's place at Camden Arms, when was that? Nanette Lamarck? Yeah. I've never heard of her. Nor a man named Plummer? Nor a man named Plummer. Who are they? Well, in the order I tossed them out, a mademoiselle with a touchy temper and a thug who needs a shave. I don't understand. How do they concern me? Well, maybe they don't. But your telephone number turned up on Plummer. Both Plummer and Nanette are tied onto a man who at this moment is probably picking himself up off the floor of an unfinished house at 3806 Melrose Avenue. His name, Mr. Marsh, is Ross Gilbert. Gilbert? Yes, that's right. What do you know about him? Well, very little. I only met him once at the Riviera Pacifico. Riviera Pacifico? The hotel at Ensenada in Mexico. Mm. Matter of fact, it was the same night that he met Corey. Which didn't make you very happy, huh? Uh, no, you've got it wrong. Corey and I were already divorced. The three of us meeting was nothing more than an accident. Oh. And when Ross and Corey parlayed that accident into marriage, were you still smiling? Better than that, Mr. Marlowe. When that happened a month ago, I was grinning. You see, until then, I had been paying Corey $1,200 a month alimony for two and a half years. Mm. And Corey gave all that up for love and Ross Gilbert, huh? Uh, Ross Gilbert isn't exactly a pauper, Mr. Marlowe. No, I guess not. Blackmailing a pauper doesn't add up. Uh, what did you say, Mr. Marlowe? 
I said putting the bite on somebody who has nothing is like sucking a lollipop with a cellophane on it. You get action, but no results, you see? Oh. Now, tell me, why does the word blackmail come home to roost, Mr. Marsh? You wouldn't happen to know who the guilty party is, would you? No, Mr. Marlowe. Hmm. And what's more, if I did, I certainly wouldn't keep that sort of thing to myself. Oh, no, I don't think you would. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Marsh. You've been a big help. I'm glad. And if I can be of any further help, don't hesitate to call on me, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, please. No, I won't, Mr. Marsh. You can depend on it. All the way from Wilshire Boulevard to Mrs. Gilbert's place on Ogden Drive, I kept wondering who wanted how much out of Ross Gilbert and why. About 20 minutes later, when I pulled up in front of the house, I started concentrating on my client, who had to be the woman standing next to a green coupe in the driveway and waiting in double time. Corey Gilbert was long, flowing blonde hair draped over shoulders that at the moment looked like they were carrying the weight of the world. But she was prettier worried than most women who always keep it gay. Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, Mrs. Gilbert? Yes. Your husband's shown up yet? No. Marlowe, what do you suppose Take is Take it happened? easy. Maybe we'd better have another look at uh, 3806 Melrose Avenue, huh? Whatever you say. Shall I drive? If you've got a license. Yes, Mr. Marlowe. I've got a license. Well, okay, let's go. <laughs> The way we took off in Corey's Nash, I wasn't sure whether her license was for driving a car or an airplane. And while she kept her 83 and a half AAA on the accelerator, she talked about her husband and why she was worried. By the time we were near the place, I knew all about the party in Ensenada, their whirlwind courtship, and what a fine guy Ross Gilbert was. When we got out of the car and started over the last hundred yards toward the unfinished house... I'd learned everything Corey knew about the blackmail angle, which wasn't very much. It started last week, Marla, when we got back from our honeymoon. Ross wasn't himself at all. He was worried. He forgot how to laugh. He argued with me over any and everything. Mm. Where does the blackmail come in? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me what was wrong. Then this evening, just before I called you, I overheard him talking on the telephone. That's when I caught the word blackmail and this address. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe Ross will be able to fill in a few of the blanks for us. Oh, he was over here in this room on a pile of lumber when I... Mama must have done a lot more damage than I figured. Ross! Ross! Take it easy. Take it easy, baby. Marlo, what is it? Is he... Is he... I'm afraid he is, Corey. That man! That man! He beat him to death! No, Corey, that round hole in Gilbert's chest wasn't made by a fist. From where I stand, it looks like a thirty-two caliber bullet. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, for some new wrinkles in the mystery field, look on the face of Mr. Jack Benny, eminent producer of the mystery comedy The Lucky Stiff, which opened in New York today. Although Mr. Benny's stars are Dorothy L'Amour, Claire Trevor, and Brian Donlevy, Jack's face is covered with new wrinkles because he couldn't be in New York to sell the tickets himself. He's remaining in Hollywood to appear tomorrow night on CBS on The Jack Benny Show with Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, Dennis Day, Phil Harris, and Rochester. So be sure to listen. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Easy Mark. Gilbert's face went sickly white, and her mouth twisted on the brink of hysteria as she stared at the dead man. I turned her away from it and led her to a window. She did the fastest job of pulling herself together I'd ever seen, and I went back to the body. On the way, I noticed a folded scrap of paper on the floor. It was a page torn out of a desk diary, but all that was written on it was the address of the unfinished house we were in. I looked down at what had once been Ross Gilbert's. Setup didn't make any sense. A victim of blackmail had been beaten up by a total stranger and then, a little while later, murdered. Somebody had killed a goose that was laying the golden eggs and it didn't figure in any direction. Well, I just about decided to go through his pockets when a sound from Corey changed my mind. <gasps> Marlo! Marlo, come here, quick! What is it, Corey? There's someone out there. I saw a shadow move. Get away from the window. Marlo, there, running. Why, it's a woman. Yeah. 
And quite a woman. What do you know? She's crossing the street now. Who is it, Marlowe? Who is she? Character as French as Milani's 1890. Only she's more like nitric acid than salad dressing, Corey. Her name is Nanette Lamarck. She's getting in that car. Aren't you going to stop her? No. I've got a line on Miss Lamarck. I can find her. But she was hiding here. She could be the one who shot Ross, couldn't she? Easily. In fact, right now, she's the odds-on favorite. But she's also cagey, and we'll have better luck if we get her on home ground where she'll talk. Besides, there's a big chunk of this business that doesn't follow. What do you mean? Well, look, the murder came out in reverse. Ross was paying off. So he should have been the killer instead of the corpse. Which means there's more than blackmail involved. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is he's dead and and, and that woman killed him. Maybe. Come on, Corey, let's get out of here. Where are we going? Well, first you take me back to my car and then I got a job for you to do. What kind of a job? Well, I found this page ripped out of a desk diary, probably Ross's. I want you to go through all his things and find that diary for me. There might be something else in it that'll give us a connection. All right. Where are you going? I'm going to pay a call on Nanette. Only this time I'm bringing my own welcome mat. I think I'll need it. After Corey dropped me off, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide, reported the body, and then I got into my own car and drove out to Beverly Hills again to the Camden Arms Court. Annette's bungalow had lights on. I parked down the street and made tracks back through the landscaping to a side window. Annette was playing pinup girl on the arm of a divan. And she watched someone pace back and forth across the room. When I got close enough to hear what was being said, that someone turned out to all be right, Corey Gilbert's right. first husband, People Emery Marsh. Like chickens with their heads off. So Ross Gilbert was shot to death. But I've got to know the truth about one thing, Miss Lamarck. My entire life's work is at stake. Can't you understand? Now hide, Monsieur Marsh. Do not break out into tears, I will tell you. Plummer is merely a private investigator I hired to, to locate Ross Gilbert for me. Now, are you happy? No. Why did such a person have my telephone number? That's what I want to know. I'll be ruined if I'm involved in this mess. My reputation means everything to my business, and... Well, things aren't going too well just now. If I'm connected with a scandal, I'll be wiped out. Well, stop worrying. I saw you with Ross Gilbert three or four times before he disappeared. So I gave your name to Plummer as a, as a possible lead to Ross. That is all. Why did you want to find Ross Gilbert? That, mon ami, is none of your business. You found out what you wanted, so good night. All right. I'll go. But can I count on you to keep my name out of this? Listen, I am counting on me to keep my own name out of it. And I will be very busy doing that. Good night. I plastered myself up against the side of the house and watched Emery Marsh leave. He looked anything but happy over the result of his interview with Nanette, but I figured I had the benefit of experience to work with and less to lose than he had. So I waited until he was out of sight, and then I stepped up to the door, braced myself, and tried my luck. You again. Yeah, and I want to talk to you. Get your foot out of my door. Oh, get out of here. Get out. Not until we've had a nice, quiet chat, Nanette, and I think we'll take up where Emery Marsh left off. What? Look, just who exactly are you, Marlow? Your boy Plummer and I are distant fraternity brothers, but there the similarity ends. Just another chief private detective. Ooh. Okay, baby, if that tough stuff's the only language you understand, we'll talk that. Oh, stop it. Leave me alone. Now, get over there. Sit down. Oh, oh you, you ape. I'd be nice to me if I were you, Nanette, because I'd just love to see a rope around that lovely neck of yours. And what's more, I can almost put one there. You're in a mess right up to your accent. So start making answers beautiful and keep them straight. First, why did you put Plummer on Ross Gilbert's trail? Because he double-crossed me, that is why. Double-crossed you? How? He ran away from me. He was mine, all bought and paid for, you understand? Not exactly. When I met him, he was flat broke. I bought him every decent stitch of clothes that he had. Gave him everything he needed to be a gentleman because we were going to be married. And then he ran out on me and took everything with him that he could lay his hands on. Go on. Nobody does that to Nanette Lamarck. Nobody. So you hired that licensed thug plumber to find him and beat him half to death, right? Exactly. Well, go ahead, baby. The story doesn't end there. Tell me the rest, the good part. About how you waited until Plummer got through with him, and then you went down to that unfinished blueprint out of House and Gardens and killed him. No. No, that is not true. I I did not do that. I I could not. That's no bigger lie than the rest of it. Where's that pearl handle thirty-two of yours, Nanette? And don't reach for it. Just tell me. What do you want with it? I want to see if it's been fired. Now, where is it? Call it, Jack. Oh, fine. Plummer. Miss Lamarck might not like for you to see her gun. Oh, I thought you would never get here. Who's this character, Miss Lamarck? Another private detective. Marlowe by name. No kidding. Well, we got a lot in common, haven't we, Jack? 
Yes, yes, we've each got two arms and two legs, and the name is Phil. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? Well, listen, Jack, you got no business here in the first place. For two cents, I'll chop you down. You're even cheaper than I figured. Why, you... you can put away that big, nasty gun, too, because I got you cold. That envelope you stuck in Nanette's mailbox tonight had a slip of paper inside, one of your old clients. Huh? What What are you talking about? Can't you guess? Hey, you want to see it? Well, yeah, yeah, let's have a look at that. Okay. Take a good look. Come on, drop the gun, plumber. Come on, drop it. My arm! All right, now, fold up. There's your bargain basement detective, Nanette. You didn't get your money's worth, did you? Now, shall we take a look at that pearl-handled gun of yours? It is over there in my bag. Thanks. Mm. Clip's full and that smell sure isn't gunpowder. Of course not. I did not kill Ross. Why, I was not even inside of that building where he was. Yeah, I know, but you... Wait a minute. Say that again. I said I was never inside that unfinished house where he was found. When I drove up, you were already there, so I left. Yeah, yeah, I know. And Plummer's gun is... Uh Uh-huh. Fully loaded. Hasn't been fired either. Baby, you've just given me a great idea. Late hours are a habit with me these days. Come in. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Marsh, I've come back for that help you offered me earlier this evening. I see. Well, the offer's still good. Fine. I think your ex-wife, Corey, is lying to me. She claims you didn't know Ross Gilbert, that you only met him once at that party in Ensenada, but you did know him, didn't you? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I did get acquainted with Ross slightly. We had dinner together a few times. Uh Uh-huh. And you really did favor his marriage to Corey because it freed you automatically from that alimony load you were carrying, hmm? That's correct, Marlow, but I don't And it's also correct, isn't it, that you couldn't afford to go to court to have your alimony reduced because that would let your snobbish clientele know you were going on the rocks. Yes, that's also true. And maybe it's true that you actually engineered the marriage and it backfired on you. Very smart, Mr. Marlow. Just keep your hands at your side. This might go off. Yeah, oh, yes. Well, I expected a reaction, but not quite so soon. Too bad. I'll trouble you for your gun, now that you've got it all figured out. Yes, Marlow, I engineered that marriage. Corey was attracted to Gilbert, but he was broke. I knew that would scare Corey off if she found out. So you and Corey made a deal, particularly with Ross. He wanted to marry Corey. You supplied the cash for his courtship, right? Yes. Only he wouldn't stop there. He kept demanding more. Sure, it figured from the start. Ross wasn't being blackmailed. He was the blackmailer himself, and that made you worse off than before, so you killed him. You're so right, Mr. Marlowe. And remember, the price for two murders is the same as for one. So you've really left me no alternative. I'll give you an alternative, Emery. Uh, Corey! One thing you didn't count on. I really loved Ross Gilbert. Well, I guess that winds it up, Corey. Emery's in the hospital, and Nanette and Plummer are both in the clink. Too bad I only hit Emery in the hand. I never could trust my aim. It's always been bad, in a lot of ways. It was good enough tonight, baby. Lucky for me you showed up when you did. Say, what made you come to Marsha's place, anyway? Well, that page from the desk diary paid off, Marlow. Only we made a mistake. No? It didn't come from Ross's diary. It came from Emery's. I finally remembered his handwriting. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, you tell me something, Marlowe. Yeah. How did you know Emery was guilty? Oh. Well, he made the oldest slip in the book. When he was talking to Nanette, I overheard him say that Ross had been shot. Oh. Emery had no way of knowing that Gilbert was dead or how he'd been killed unless Nanette told him. And for a while, I thought she had. But then I found out that she couldn't have because she'd never been inside the house where we found Ross. So it had to be Emery. Sure. I see. Well, Marlowe, uh... What does a gal say at the end of a night like this? Thanks or something? Just thanks will be enough. (laughs) I got to do my income tax. Can I give you a lift? No. No, I'll walk a while. I've got some thinking to do about marksmanship. But call me sometime later on, will you? Just to see if I'm shooting in the right direction. You can count on it, Corey. Thanks. Good night, Phil.
watched her for a moment as she walked down the street all by herself, deep in her own thoughts, and it looked to me like she was playing it strictly square. I almost wanted to follow her. <laughs> the first time in a long time, I felt like I wanted to get to know a client better. But March 15th can slip up awfully fast, and that long-form 1040 was still unfinished and waiting for me in my office. So I decided to go back and work on my income tax and play it strictly square, too. After all, that's really the easiest way in the long run. Yeah, I keep telling myself. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced by Norman MacDonald. The script by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt was directed by Ralph Rose. Featured in the cast were Sylvia Sims, Lorette Philbrandt, Ken Harvey, and Paul Duboff. The special music was by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... There was a man with a bad heart, a telephone number scribbled on a cash register receipt, and a corpse on the other side of town. But I couldn't see the connection between them until I realized they were all tied together by the same long rope, worth $30,000. Next Wednesday evening, February 2nd, CBS will bring you a moving, powerful drama of a reporter who took an assignment he eagerly sought, only to find it came too close to home. Its title is Mind in the Shadow. Its star is Eddie Albert, and its story tells how the reporter set out to reveal the shocking facts about our mental hospitals and then learned that his lovely young wife might have to enter one. Based on actual documentary evidence of conditions existing today, you'll find Mind in the Shadow, a revealing story of something which could happen to you. Hear Mind in the Shadow, starring Eddie Albert, next Wednesday evening, over most of these same CBS network stations. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, Jack Benny's new address, Sunday night on CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was a man with a bad heart. A telephone number scribbled on a cash register receipt and a corpse on the other side of town. But I couldn't see the connection between them until I realized that they were all tied together by the same long rope worth $30,000. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Long Rope. I'd finally wound up a sour case in which I'd been kicked around, disillusioned, and shortchanged. And in my book, a routine like that calls for relaxation. So I'd spent the morning sleeping and the afternoon in a Turkish bath, being worked over on the table by Nick Takalakis, a non-talking masseur who untied knots in more muscles than I thought I had. He was trying to tear loose my Achilles tendon when the phone rang. It was for me. Nick wouldn't let me up, so I took it lying down. Yeah? Marlowe speaking. My name is Sidney Vanetta, Mr. Marlowe. I've tried all afternoon to reach you. Oh? Nick, what can I do for you, Mr. Vanetta? I've already made your reservation with American Airlines. You're leaving on the 10 o'clock plane tonight, and you're taking with you a set of pearls for a certain buyer in Chicago. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Vanetta. Maybe I can... No, maybe, Marlowe. I've checked thoroughly on you and find you entirely qualified, which is important because the pearls are a perfectly matched set in a rope valued at about $30,000. The buyer wants them, and I made up my mind just this morning to sell. The proceeds will go to my niece. Lucky girl. Indeed she is. 
particularly since I have no respect for her as a woman. She presumes to be a sculptress of all things, but she's my only heir. I'm selling the pearls simply because I know she would, and I can get more for them. Yeah, I... Oh, hey, Nick, wait a minute, will you? Why all the hurry, Mr. Veneta? First, the buyer is leaving Chicago tomorrow. Second, my heart may fail me at any moment. That's the hurry, Mr. Marlowe. I see. Well, I'll take the job, uh, conditionally. But suppose I come out and talk with you. Telephones are deceptive. Very well. Come to 7241 Adams, just below Western. I'll expect you in an hour, at six, sharp. Side door will be open, so let yourself in. Sounds like you're alone out there. I am. I just fired my nurse, a Miss Drew, and as stupid a woman as the earth was ever cursed. But <coughs> well, I shouldn't get excited about it. I've engaged a new one due here at 5.30, but who will no doubt be late. So as I say, Marlowe, when you get here, just let yourself in. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, Nick, you better hurry it up. I gotta see a man about a rope worth 30 grand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A rope worth $30,000. Benetta's place on Adams was a big, fancy, and dirty gray place. Forty years ago, it had been a proud, expensive house. But now it squatted at the back end of a rundown yard like a bitter old man, too tired to move. I found the side door unlocked and went in. The hallway was dusky and had the odor of moldy wool. I called Vanetta's name but got no answer. So I poked on in until I heard the snapping of an open fire. It came from the library. A big chair was drawn up in front of the fireplace and there Vanetta sat. His chin sunk deep in his chest and his eyes closed. I coughed but he didn't hear me, so I stepped close and shook him gently by the shoulder. Mm -hmm. All it took was a gentle shake. He sagged forward and poured out of the chair like stiff syrup. Mr. Veneta was dead. I started for the phone to report the body, but then I heard gravel crunch in the driveway. Someone else was coming in that side door, so I stepped out into the hall and waited. Mr. Veneta, it's... uh... Oh. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, who are you? Steve Temple, I'm Mr. Veneta's business agent. Here on business now? Yes, I am. It's all the same to you. I came to see Mr. Veneta regarding some pearls. So if you'll excuse... Oh. Yeah, the pearls can wait. Their owner's dead. So it finally happened, huh? You're taking the news very well, Temple. I've been expecting it every day for five years. You found him, I suppose? Mm Mm-hmm. We had an appointment at six. He wanted me to fly his pearls to Chicago. Uh, What are you staring at, Temple? What? Why, this uh, bottle of medicine here. What about it? Well, for years, he's kept this stuff beside him in case of an attack. Yet, when he actually needed it, it was over here on the sideboard out of his reach. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Very. He fired Miss Drew, his old nurse, today and didn't expect a new one until 5.30. Say, do you happen to know her name? No one. You mean uh, he's engaged a new nurse? That's right. She's now hour late already. Yeah. Well, for once, that doesn't matter to Mr. Veneta. Say, Temple, are you acquainted with his niece? Vivian Russell? Mm Mm-hmm. Of course. She's a sculptress. There's a studio out on Fountain uh, near Bronson, I believe. She was to get the proceeds from the pearls. I assumed that, although nothing was ever said. She's his only heir. Mm. Where would those pearls be now? I kept them in a wall safe behind that picture there, consistently against my advice. Yeah, sure. Hmm. Opens with a key. Where would that be? He carried it with him on his watch chain. Why? Hey, what are you going to do? I'm going to take a look at the pearls and then have them impounded. Yeah, this must be the key. Now let's open it up. It's there, that uh, velvet case. As big as an overnight bag. Must be some string of beads. It is, Marlowe. Hey, here, let me open it. There. All right. All right. It's nothing but tissue paper. Yeah. It's not too surprising. While Temple called the police and tried to keep the details straight on a natural death and an unnatural theft, I went over the room again with a new viewpoint. All that turned up without an easy explanation was one, a cash register receipt for $1.34 with the phone number Republic 2809 penciled on the back, and two, the peculiar position of Mr. Veneta's medicine bottle, which Temple had already noticed. I dropped the receipt in my pocket and told Temple to wait for the law. He gave me his home address and phone number, and I promised to check in with him later and left. 
The first stop was a phone booth where I dug into the nurse's registries and hit pay dirt on the fourth call. Miss Drew? Yes, we have a Miss Drew. Is she the one who worked for Mr. Sidney Veneta but was fired this afternoon? That's his opinion. Actually, Miss Drew quit. All right, have it your way. Where can I get in touch with her? She's right here where she's been since 3 o'clock this afternoon. What is the nature of your business, sir? Never mind. You've already answered my question. Uh, but look, Mr. Vanetta hired another nurse to replace Miss Drew. Is the new girl one of yours? Absolutely not. Mr. Vanetta will never get another nurse from this registry or from any other that I know of. You're so right. He's utterly impossible to please in any way, and we're through trying. Goodbye. Well, Miss Drew was in the clear. Vanetta began to focus as a pretty odd Johnny. But I was still trying to figure why the new nurse hadn't shown up. When I reached for a cigarette and brought out the cash register receipt with the phone number on the back. So I tried it. Republic 2809. It rang, but nothing happened. I got in my car then and drove up to Hollywood and out Fountain to Bronson, where the only Vanetta air, Miss Vivian Russell, had a studio. It was a converted double garage with a lot of north windows. So her new close-to-the-ground Hudson sat outside in the driveway. The adjoining four-room apartment looked cozy enough. If you liked wading through chunks of marble and eating off of last week's newspaper. Yeah, I was braced for a dowdy Amazon with broken fingernails as I rang the bell. That's why the dainty 118 pounds of taboo-scented blonde, who was clad in ten chartreuse yards of whispering silk cut like lounging pajamas, caught me as flat-footed as a duck when she opened the door. Hi. Did you want something? Uh, yes, yeah, I... My name is Marlowe. I'd like to speak to Miss Vivian Russell. You are. So go ahead and enjoy yourself, Marlowe. Uh, may I come inside? I have some bad news, Miss Russell. Oh, oh, sure. Come on in. Now, uh, shall I sit down or just hang on to something? Suit yourself. Your uncle, Mr. Vanetta, died this afternoon. Oh, his heart finally gave up, did it, huh? Yeah, yeah, but you shouldn't go all to pieces like that, Vivian. Now, wait. He meant nothing to me, but I'm glad his suffering is over. The pearls are missing, too. Well, really? What happened to them? They were stolen. And don't tell me that means nothing to you because you're getting the money, 30,000 bucks worth. What? Uncle Sidney intended to give me the money from those pearls? How do you know that? I'm a private detective, he told me. He was my client. Oh, then you're out of a job. Say, how would you like to work for me, Marla? I- I'm serious. Now I want those pearls back, you know. Now, for 25 a day in expenses, it's a deal. Now, you tell me something. Who did your uncle hire today to replace Miss Drew? The nurse. Hmm. Why, I didn't even know Miss Drew had been fired. How did you know she didn't quit? With Uncle Sidney? <laughs> Try me again. Republic 2809. That doesn't mean a thing. Mm. You know, Marlowe, you've got an awfully good head. Are you speaking as a sculptress or just an ordinary chiseler? And what is that crack supposed to mean? You didn't know you were getting the money legally. You might have taken the pros yourself. Oh, stop it, Marlowe. Okay, client. Well, I'll run along. I've got work to do. All right, but uh, don't forget that all work and no play makes for a dull companion. Yes, and it also makes 25 bucks a day. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. All the way down Sunset to Vine Street, I kept telling myself a buck's a buck regardless. But the idea that I'd been grabbed at stayed with me. Vivian Russell had plenty of motive as a dry land pearl diver, and if that's true, she'd need a patsy just to keep her abreast of the situation. I turned north on Vine and twisted up Beachwood Drive to 2000, the number Steve Temple had given me. He had had two hours of playing 20 questions policeman style, and I figured it was time to check his score. Also, Temple was the man to fill in a few blanks on my new client for me. His place was dark, but I got out anyway and started up the walk to his door. I'd gone about a dozen steps into a tunnel of overhanging shrubs when I heard it. Psst. Hey, you! I turned as a man stepped out onto the walk and came toward me slowly. He was tall, wiry, with a thin, arrogant face that sneered out from under an expanse of forehead big enough for three sets of eyebrows. All shaggy. We're going to have a talk, Mr. Tem... Hey, you're not Temple. Now we both know that. I'm a friend of his. What do you want with Temple? I've got a message for him, but it's personal. Who from? Like I say, it's personal, mister. I'll be back later. Come here. I said I'm a friend of Temple's. If you got a message for him, I'll see that he gets it. Well, okay, then. Tell him that some of his friends are too blasted nosy. No! The guy with the forehead had a great left jab and a pair of hurdler's legs And by the time I untangled myself from the brush and got out on the walk again, he was gone Well, I know it was a waste of time, but I tried Temple's doorbell twice before I went back to my car 
Nothing made sense, except that somebody who knew his way around had stolen a long rope of pearls. And somewhere in the city was a nurse who hadn't shown up on a new job. Beyond that, it was all question marks. Well, I drove down to the filling station on the corner and went inside to the phone. I started to call police headquarters, but instead... Dropped the nickel in and dialed Republic 2809 again. Just on a hunch. Lieutenant well, Ibarra speaking. Ibarra? I didn't dial you, Ibarra. What? And this is Marlo. Well, you got me anyway. Oh, well, listen, Phil, I hear you're on that Venetti case. Yeah. If it'll help you any, the coroner says definitely he died of a heart attack. No homicide involved. Hmm. Thanks, Lieutenant. Hey, but look, where are you now? In a flat on the corner of Union and 59th Street. Why? Well, is that phone number there, Republic 2809? Well, that's a great piece of deduction. You just called it. Ibarra, listen, I found that number at Veneta's place this afternoon. What's going on down there? There's a girl here named Betty Larson. Yeah, she's a nurse, right? No, wrong, Phil. She's a corpse. Oh. Before that, she was a waitress. Just a waitress. Somebody came to a door and killed her for no apparent reason whatsoever. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, Jack Benny will be along on CBS tomorrow night with one of his funniest shows ever. In addition to his regular hecklers, Dennis, Don, Phil, Mary, and Rochester, Claudette Colbert and Vincent Price will pay a call on Jack. And with Don Wilson still wanting a raise in pay and with Jack still trying to starve him into talking terms, you're sure to find the situations full of the hilarity and fast-moving fun that have made CBS's Jack Benny Show the top-rating comedy of all. Yes, remember, CBS also means Catch Benny Sundays. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Long Rope. It was 40 minutes of thick stop-and-go traffic from the time I quit talking to Ibarra until I pulled up near the four stories of faded, sagging tenement on the corner of Union and 59th. But even then, the crazy question that had been weaving in and out of my mind like a 2 a.m. drunk looking for the way to go home was still with me. Why was the telephone number Republic 2809 bracketed by a couple of dead people who, as far as I could see, should have had nothing to do with each other in the first place? And right there for the tenth time running, I drew a complete and unabridged blank. But a minute later, when I climbed out of my coupe and over the bumpers of the half-dozen squad cars that were jammed into the narrow street like so many toy autos that a kid had forgotten about, I quit asking myself riddles and started looking for Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, a quiet man who always preferred fact to fancy. I found him in a cheap but clean uniform crowded room on the second floor, standing a few feet away from the body of Betty Larson, a girl in a bathrobe who had once been something pretty in her early 20s. Well, Phil, the coroner says she was shot twice in the chest at close range. Died instantly. Is that where she fell, Lieutenant, there near the door? Yeah, it looks like she'd just gotten home and into her robe and someone she didn't know knocked on the door. The safety chain was still on when we got here. The window's leading no place. Those chains let a door open just wide enough for the barrel of a gun, is that it? Yeah, but how does all this add with those missing pearls and the rest of that business over on Adams, Marlowe? Not like two and two, believe me. So far, Ibar, the only question is the telephone number. Tell me, where did this Betty Lawson work? Well, we haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, so long, Roger. Yeah, so long. Right now, we only know that she was a waitress who stayed here with her brother, who was some kind of a student. They got along pretty well together. She was single, too. Lived here since... Oh, wait a minute. Mm. Danny Barr. Oh, yeah, Mooney. Ryan's Cafe, huh? Ryan himself runs it. Okay. Uh, I'll check it personally, right? Hey, is that where she worked, Ibarra Ryan's Cafe? Yeah, but it's funny, Phil. She lived here since early 1947. The Mooney tells me she worked that 24-hour hash house just as long, yet it's way over on the other side of town on Western. Western and where, Ibarra? The 2300 block. Should be near Washington. Washington, which is only one block from Adams, and that starts to close the big circle. What do you mean, Marlowe? Well, that the Veneta place is on Adams near Western. Look, Ibarra, how about letting me huddle over a cup of Ryan's coffee before the law steps in, huh? I got a hunch you want to check, Phil? Yeah, yeah, that and a cash register receipt. What do you say? Uh, all right, but play it close, fellow. Ryan probably doesn't know about this yet. No? Unless, of course, he squeezed the trigger. Goodbye, Ibarra. <laughs> It was a half hour getting over to Ryan's Cafe on Weston, which turned out to be a lot of steamed over plate glass, bragging about a 40-cent hot roast beef sandwich and two-foot-high white chalk letters. 
And inside, the motif was the same. Everything that Mr. Ryan sold was a bargain. I slid onto a shaky stool opposite a cash customer who was something dirty in a torn overcoat buried deep in a handicapper sheet and coffee. He looked up once, grinned no teeth at me, then hollered for Ryan in the kitchen, who said that he only had two hands and would be out in a minute. But before those 60 seconds ran out, I looked around, and over in a corner in a collection of trash piled next to a broom, I saw a very welcome piece of paper. It was a brother of the cash register receipt that I'd found on Sidney Vanetta's desk, the one that had tied Betty Lawson's murder onto the rope of pearls. I turned back to the counter just as Ryan started toward me. He was a little bigger and a little better looking than the average ape. And on his right arm, under thick, coarse black hair that was long enough to braid, there was a tattoo of a dancing girl who, if Ryan ever shaved about his wrist, would freeze to death. What'll it be, mister? Coffee? Yeah. And a little information. You know Sidney Vanetta, Ryan? That screwball with a bump ticker over on Adams? Yeah, I know him. Why? What's up? His time on Earth, for one thing, he's dead. Too bad. Should have taken it easier. Mm. Cream? No. Pearls. What'd you say? Nothing. Ryan, who brought that tray up to the Veneta place this afternoon? I did. Sure it wasn't Betty Lawson? I'm positive. None of the girls that go near that place. Veneta was hard to get along with. Now you tell me something. What are you, mister? Newshound, collection man, a cop. Getting warm, Ryan. I'm a private detective named Marlowe. I'm thrilled. Good night. Before I finish my coffee? Before I throw you out. I don't like too many questions. Not even easy ones, huh? Like who murdered Betty Larson? Be- Betty's dead? Yeah. Over in a flat on 59th Street, shot twice with the 32. When'd you last see her, Ryan? Why? Uh, a couple of hours ago, and she quit for the night. Marlowe. The cops got any idea who did it? I don't know. Right now, they're looking for a boyfriend. You're crazy. Betty didn't have a boyfriend. Outside of you? Outside of me. So I'm going over to straighten them out now. Mitchie! Mitchie! Yeah? Get out here and take over. Okay. I gotta move fast. No, you don't, Ryan. Betty's dead, remember? Yeah, but whoever did it ain't. Now, don't try to stop me, Marlowe. You'll get hurt. Look, Ryan, why don't you play smart and... Yeah, what's the use? Go on, start running. You won't get very far. The first time that night, I felt sure of what I was saying. Because even as Ryan had squared himself away to play bounce the private detective, I suddenly noticed a friendly face working hard over a stale donut at the far end of the counter. It was Lieutenant Ibarra. And when Ryan tossed his apron aside, grabbed at his coat, and slammed out the front door, Ibarra turned and nodded at a short man nearby who was idly picking his teeth with the end of a book of matches. At that, the man dropped the matches into his pocket and left. Then Ibarra moved over to me. Didn't mean to cry to hear, Phil, but after you left, we found out that Ryan and Betty Larson used to see quite a bit of each other. Don't apologize, Ibarra. Probably would have cost me a couple of front teeth if I hadn't noticed you. Warm up your coffee, mister? Yeah, please. You, Ibarra? No, Phil, I gotta move now. You see, I don't think Ryan did this. Mm-hmm. I told Mooney to follow him, but not to pick him up. The chances are good that Ryan's heading straight for Betty's apartment to demand that the police find out who killed his girl, so I'm going the other way, to Ryan's house. There may be another woman in this. A jealous one. But no rope of pearls. Huh? No, Marlowe, I don't think so. <laughs> Good night now. Night, Lieutenant. Well, Mitzi, how long have you worked here? A couple of days. But I don't know nothing about Mr. Ryan. I'm a married woman and I... Hey, what do you think you're staring at, mister? Maybe something wonderful, Mitzi. Tell me, baby, do you always wear that kind of a uniform when you're working here? Sure. Ryan says this girl should look neat and clean. It helps business. Anything wrong with that? No, no, no. Matter of fact, it might be just the lead I'm after. What are you talking about? Yeah, and if I'm right, baby, the rest of this case will be a cinch. So good night and thanks. You've been a big help, sweetheart. When I got back to the corner of Union and 59th, I took the stairs up to Betty Larson's flat two at a time, crossed the fingers on both hands and prayed that Ibarra was right about Ryan returning to his girl's place. When I stepped into the room a second later... I knew that I'd never doubt the good lieutenant again because standing next to an open window and staring out at nothing was Ryan himself, numbed and red-eyed. I asked him one question. And although his answer was only a couple of words mumbled between trembling lips, it was all I had to know. Now everything. Betty Lawson's murder, the death of Vanetta, the guy with the forehead and the missing pearls, the whole shebang was starting to fall together. 
baby. Be home, please. Hello? Malo, Vivian. Look, honey, I want you to do me a favor. Get hold of Steve Temple and meet me over at your uncle's place on Adams as soon as possible. I need your help. Goodbye. Well, Marlo, what took you so long? I understood you needed our help and in a hurry at that. I had quite a way to come, Temple. Is Vivian here? Yes, Marlo, Vivian's here, and that means that we can stop counting noses. Now, why do you need our help? Catch someone who stole once and murdered twice? Murdered twice? That's right. You know, it's my guess that whoever stole that rope of pearls also moved Vanetta's medicine out of reach when his heart started skipping beats. Can you prove that? No. No, I can't. But it doesn't matter, really, because the guilty one also killed a party named Lawson. And when you pay for one, Vivian, you paid for them all. I don't follow you, Marlowe. Who are you talking about? I'm not sure, but this much is certain. Vanetta called me at five. When I got here at six, he was already dead and the pearls were gone. Now, I figure that whoever took them argued with them first, which makes that person, one, somebody who knew Vanetta, and two, responsible for the old man's death. Then the new nurse couldn't possibly have been the one who stole the pearls. No, but the new nurse could have been the one who overheard everything while standing right here. Haven't you been able to find this nurse? Uh, Not yet. But sooner or later, honey, I'm sure we'll catch up to him. Him? Yes, Temple, uh, I said him. Nurse Larson is a male with a lot of forehead and few ethics. The person you killed was a sister Betty, a waitress, and don't move, Temple, or I'll be glad that I was forced to put holes in you. Temple's the one? He stole the rope of pearls? Yeah, but this nurse Lawson, who saw him do it, got in touch with him, right, Temple? It was filthy blackmail. But you were going to stop by a filthier murder, and you almost did, because somehow or other you got the right room in the right house on Union and 59th, but the wrong party. Isn't that about it, Temple? Yes, Marlo. That's about it. Oh, leave me alone, Temple. Now, Marlo, you don't shoot me without going through Vivian first. Dear Vivian, Sydney's precious niece was going to have the pearls all to herself. Don't move, Marlo. It'll cost Vivian her life if you do. I doubt that very much, Temple. Larson. That's right. Joe Larson, forehead and all. Now, you, Temple, step away from that girl or I'll tear you to pieces. No, Larson, no, no. Now, we can still do business like you said in that note you sent me. I'll split with you. Shut up. You forget two things, Temple. First, you tried to kill me. And second, you did kill my sister. Now, why don't you run for it? Or are you afraid? Which is it? Come on, Temple, talk. I... I am afraid. Well, Marlo, that just about winds things up. Yep. Joe Larson sent up for attempted extortion, and Temple... Sent up for good. Mm Mm-hmm. Say, Marlowe, when you called a while ago and said that you wanted Temple and me to help you, did you know then that Temple was the murderer? No, I didn't, Vivian. Then I only knew that whoever had killed Betty Larson had mistaken her for the new nurse, and that the actual nurse was Betty's brother, Joe. Where did you get hold of that, Phil? Well, it started in Ryan's Cafe, Barra, just after you left. I had nurses on the brain, I guess. And when I took a good look at the waitress there, I suddenly realized that her white uniform, white shoes, and white cap could easily confuse a guy like Temple who also had nurses on the brain. Well, um, I can see a killer making a mistake about appearances, all right, but I still don't understand how it is that the telephone number of my uncle's nurse turned out to be Betty's apartment. Because a nurse did live there, honey. Betty's brother was a medical student, part-time male nurse, and full-time bum. You see, Ryan, who brought food to Uncle Sidney, knew that he needed a new nurse, and he sold him on the idea of Joe Lawson because he wanted his girlfriend's brother to have a job. Oh, I get it. Say, I know what I'm going to do with those pearls. Sell them? To the highest bidder. Oh, no, I'm going to break up that set. Break up the set? Yeah, I'd like very much to get a pair of earrings out of them. Oh, and uh, for each of you, uh, a set of cufflinks. Good night, gentlemen. When Vivian got into a car aimed it toward a collection of chipped rocks on Fountain near Bronson, and waved goodbye. It was nearly three o'clock in the morning. No. After I said so long to Ibarra and started back to my apartment on Franklin, an idea hit me for the first time. A pearl is the result of the irritation of an oyster, a disease. And when you string a lot of diseases together, the result is frequently a plague. (laughs) But it's from plagues like that that I make a living. That's what I get for reading books. 
I wonder if I'll ever go any place where I can wear pearl cufflinks. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Junius Matthews, Louis Van Ruten, Faye Baker, David Ellis, Lillian Byeth, and Ed Begley. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra is played by Jeff Corey. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... A corpse that wouldn't stay dead, a pistol with a silencer on it, and a fortune in a black satchel spelled death for the big city boys when they finally got together in lonesome Arizona. Population 802. Stars light, stars bright, and that's no optical illusion. The brilliant, gleaming list of stars on CBS tomorrow night. Van Johnson's the star on the Prudential Hour drama. Spike Jones will positively appear in a sketch getting the war paint off Bob Hope's latest movie. Jack Benny will have Claudette Colbert and Vincent Price as his special guests. Amos and Andy, Dashiell Hammett, Sam Spade, and Lumman Abner are the next bright stars in line. Then Helen Hayes, first lady of the stage, starring on her Sunday night electric theater followed by Hollywood's own Eve Arden in the wonderfully comic series Our Miss Brooks. In the next to closing, another bright comedy, Life with Luigi, and the whole star lineup, topped off by the world's most brilliant adulpates, the experts on It Pays to be Ignorant. Jack Benny's program will come to you over all of these same stations, and the others in this vast array of stars will be heard over most of them. Top writers, top directors, and top stars of American show business come to you on CBS. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, camels are the favorite cigarette of people in all walks of life. Among them are singing stars, actors, announcers, people whose voices are their fortunes, people whose cigarette must be mild. Make the camel 30-day test and see how mild a cigarette can be. Puff after puff, pack after pack. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we make homicide pay for a hundred a day. Oh, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> oh, you should catch me on a bad day. Nothing. <laughs> Am I going to see you tonight? Not if you keep turning out the lights. Who turns out the lights? Oh, well, what difference does it make? It's fun. I'll expect you at eight and you'll be here. Honey, honey, of course. How's business? Oh, about as dull as 50 miles of dirt road. We'll have dinner home. Bless your little pointed head. And your empty pocketbook. Uh Uh-oh. What? Mr. Diamond? Uh, Yes, sir, come right in, will you? Uh, Pull up an old bank book and have a seat. Thank you, Client? Well, keep a good thought, honey. You may be gorging yourself at 21. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> I'd uh, like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, I'd love every minute of it. I charge 100 a day in expenses. All right. 
He reached for his wallet. While he was counting his money, I was looking at him. This was the biggest man I'd ever seen. I was getting a nosebleed just trying to see over the second button on his vest. He had a pair of shoulders that looked like the mayor should lay a cornerstone for them. And the muscles under his coat stood out like smuggled shot puts. My name is Collins. I'm B.E. Rollins, private secretary. Oh, is that the B.E. Rollins? Yes, he's a very wealthy man. Well, there's an understatement. He wants to retain you to find his brother, Martin. He does, huh? Would you mind coming with me? Mr. Rollins would like to see you in person. Well, tell me a little more about Rollins' brother. I'd rather let Mr. Rollins do that himself. No, I'd rather hear some of it from you first. I don't want to see Rollins if I'm going to turn down the job. Very well. Mr. Rollins' brother Martin was released from prison five days ago. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, he sent a letter threatening Mr. Rollins' life. Oh, and your boss wants me to find his brother before he makes good the threat. Is that it? That's it, exactly. Well, why doesn't he call the police? Show them the letter and get the protection he needs. It'll certainly be a lot cheaper than hiring me. Mr. Rollins doesn't want any more bad publicity. There was enough of it when Martin was sent to prison. And why did Martin get sent to prison? He embezzled $100,000 from the company funds. Did Rollins try to save him? He was guilty. Mr. Rollins prosecuted him to the full extent of the law. Was the money ever recovered? No. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. You won't take the job? Oh, now you've guessed. But why? Mr. Rollins is prepared to pay you handsomely. Well, I don't doubt it at all, but it's too pat. Martin's killing mad because his brother sent him to prison. Rollins receives a threatening letter, but won't call in the police. Yet he wants Martin found. Why? I told you. He doesn't want any more bad publicity. So I take the job and maybe find Martin. Then B.E. Rollins is a potential killer in the house. What's he going to do? Try and keep his mind off of things by letting him shrink heads in the basement? Remember, Mr. Diamond, they are still brothers. So were Cain and Abel. You mean you think Mr. Rollins intends to kill his brother and that's why he wants you to find him? Well, that's a little crude, but it's certainly a possibility. That's utterly absurd. Uh, maybe so, but no one would blame him. You better try Hearthstone of the Death Squad. Now you're being ridiculous. Mr. Rollins is a highly respectable businessman. His reputation is spotless. Well, then this looks like too good a time for him to start getting dirty. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. He got up and started to say something, but changed his mind. He turned and walked to the door, ducking his head as he went out. Someday, he was going to forget the duck and take the whole wall along with him. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call. Yeah? Is a man named Collins in your office? Well, he was. He just left. Did you take the job? Well, who's this? If you didn't take the job, you're fortunate. If you did, you'd better catch up on your insurance payments. Oh, I think so, huh? I think so. This is a family matter, so leave it that way or you're liable to get yourself killed. Look, would the Sherlock and me show if I deduced your name was Martin Rollins? Hello? Hello? When I brushed Collins out of my office with a quick no, I wouldn't have taken the job he'd offered me for a share in Manhattan Island. But when somebody starts threatening me, it's like telling a five-year-old kid to stay away from the cookie jar. The quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me not to and try pushing me around. I looked up the Rollins address, and in 20 minutes, my cab pulled up in front of a big old English house that looked like the summer training camp for the U.S. Mint. Yes? Why, Mr. Diamond. Uh, tell him Mr. Rollins I want to see him, will you? Come in. I'm happy you've changed your mind. Just tell him I want to see him. He's in the garden. This way, please. We went through the big house and out through the glass doors into the garden. B.E. Rollins was sitting in a chair, feeding the birds. He was reaching his late sixties with the sour look of a man who didn't want to. As he threw the breadcrumbs out on the gravel walk, a big diamond on his little finger flashed in the afternoon sun. Mr. Rollins? Huh? Oh, Collins. <laughs> Who's that with you? The detective you sent for, Mr. Rollins. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pull up that chair and sit down, young man. Oh, thank you. Just feeding the little birds. Here, birdie, birdie. <clears throat> Been doing it for some time. Oh, swell. Well, what are you standing around for, Collins? I want to talk to this detective in private. Yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be in the library. I won't need you. Here, you feed the birds for a while. Makes you feel good. Oh, sure. Hey, birdie. Birdie. 
What changed your mind? A phone call. I think it was from your brother, Martin. He told me not to work for you. And you don't like being intimidated. Hmm. Good. I think we'll get along, young man. Tell me, uh, have you got the letter he sent you? Have it right here. Read it. I'll take over with the birds for a while. Oh, thanks, sir. Hmm. My dear brother, I spent five years hating you, but I learned a trade. I used it drawing blueprints for your shroud. Signed, Martin. Well, this will never get the Pulitzer Prize. Martin always did go in for the dramatic. Well, do you think you can find him? Was this the first you've heard from him since he went to prison? Yes. I will admit the letter has me worried. Aside from the dramatic, Martin has always been a hothead. Since boyhood, he's envied my get up and go. We never got along. It was even too much for my mother. She died very young. Mm, probably overworked from knitting straitjackets. Don't be flippant, young man. Well, will you take the job? A hundred dollars a day and all hospital expenses. Fine, fine. See Collins. He'll take care of the fee. Now, uh, uh, tell me one more thing. Can you think of anyone who might know where your brother is? Only one, and I'm not sure if he's even still in New York. She was going with Martin when he was caught. I only met her once, but I will say, if nothing else, my brother showed good taste. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, that's nice. What was her name? Carter. Virginia Carter. Lived someplace in the village, I think, but that was five years ago. All right, thank you. Now, uh, what about your secretary, Collins? Can you trust him? Collins is above reproach. He's been with me for 15 years. Knows everything about me. Almost a member of the family. Does he know anything more about Martin? No more than I do. Now I'm getting tired, and I want to finish feeding my birds. Good day, young man. Here, birdie. Birdie! I left the old man sitting with his friends. He'd have one good deed to take along with him anyway. I went back to the glass doors and a butler showed me the way to the library. But the cupboard was bare. Collins wasn't around. Collins! Collins! The shot had come from the direction of the garden and I went back out in a hurry. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond, over here! What's wrong, Collins? It's Mr. Rollins. He's dead. B.E. Rollins was sitting in the chair with a bullet hole just over the heart. His head was resting on his chest, and he still held the breadcrumbs in his hand. He seemed to be smiling like he knew he was going to be able to feed the birds for a long time now. Martin did it. He did? I saw the whole thing. I thought you were supposed to be in the library. Well, I started out of the library and came around the other way. As I rounded the corner of the house, I saw Martin standing behind that tree. I started to yell, but he fired and climbed over the wall. Mr. Rollins was dead when I reached him. That's called homicide. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's what noted throat specialists reported in a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days. That's how mild camels are. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos. And see for yourself how mild camels are pack after pack. See how well camels get along with your throat week after week. Yes, that's the sensible test of cigarette mildness. For only by steady smoking can you judge the day-in, day-out mildness of a cigarette. Start your own camel 30-day test today and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. You'll find out why people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hi, Walt. Well, the great private detective. What do you want the police force to do for you now? 
Get rid of one of their stupid sergeants. Now, I don't oh, like... It is. Okay. Okay, yeah. This is Mr. Collins, Walt. Lieutenant Levinson, Mr. Collins. Hello, Mr. Collins. How do you do, Lieutenant? Uh, the body's in the garden. B. Rollins, huh? Yep, big time. Rollins Investments. That's right, Lieutenant. Any idea who killed him? Well, Mr. Collins here says it was Rollins' brother. That's right, Lieutenant. I saw Martin shoot Mr. Rollins. There he is. Gee, on such a nice day, too. Isn't Otis a dream? Oh, though? such a one. Well, right over the heart. Otis, you go... What are you doing, Rick? It was a letter from his brother. A letter? Sure, I read it myself. I... Holy Ike, it's gone. We searched the whole garden for the incriminating letter and came up with a big fat zero. Then I remembered something that the old man had told me about Martin. Something about a girl named Virginia Carter. I questioned Collins, but he didn't know her. So I put the old mind to work and became my usual shrewd self. I went back in the library, grabbed a phone book, and found the only Virginia Carter listed. It was a wild, long shot. But I grabbed a cab, and 40 minutes later, I was standing in front of her door. When she opened it, I got the quickest scalding in history. Hello. Oh, but you have a hard time finding something to wear in July. Do you like it? It's French silk. Love it, love it. What's on your mind? Now, uh, uh, Virginia Carter? Mm-hmm. Now, if you'll stop panting long enough, maybe you'd like to tell me what you want. Well, I'd like to know about Martin Rollins. Oh, I have not seen him in years. Maybe you've got a picture of him? I've got lots of pictures. Mm-hmm. Maybe there is one of Martin someplace. Well, let's uh, look through the whole flock. I've got lots of time. Before I let you in, you better tell me your name. I don't want you to steal anything from me. Maybe if anybody stole something from you, they get their fingers burned off the elbows. Mm-hmm. You can come in. She opened the door and walked ahead of me like she'd just oiled her sacriliac. She led me into the living room and sat down. The shades were drawn... I had a hard time finding the couch. Right here. Oh, well, well how, do, uh, how do we look at the pictures with the magic lantern? I thought maybe you wanted to relax for a minute. Well, uh, put something in a glass. I'll cool down. I don't drink. I never keep the stuff around. Hmm. Well, that doesn't leave you much of a feel. Or what do you major in? Cigarettes. Have a camel? Oh, yes, any time. I haven't got a match. Well, just hold on to it. It'll light up. I think I'd better get the pictures. I'll be right back. Just make yourself comfortable. Mm hmm. Hoop de doo, hoop de doo. Ball de doo, can start with this. If Martin isn't in this pile, I've got lots more. You're not in a hurry, are you? Mm, no, not a bit. Good. This might run into overtime. There was one trouble with the setup. Looking at the pictures with her sitting close was like trying to read a mail order catalog in front of a blast furnace. She handed me one picture at a time, describing each guy in the photographs. I've seen draft boards with smaller clientels. Several times she stopped and looked at one of the pictures like Diamond Jim eyeing a ten-course meal, then passed the guy to me. After two dozen photographs, I started thinking she was the reason for the rise in the vitamin market. And I was just going to mention an old snapshot I had of myself when she thumped one of the collection with a polished fingernail. Martin Rollins, here he is. Well, he figured to show up sooner or later. How long ago was this taken? Well, I could not say exactly, but I guess about six years. Mm -hmm. well, you should keep a file. How'd you get along with Martin? All right, I guess. He had money and he showed me a good time. What else do you know about him? He has a brother with a checking account at Fort Knox. Hmm. Any unusual habits? Yes, but they wouldn't help you find him. Oh, yes, he used to play a saxophone. A hobby? No, not exactly. He played around town with several other small bands. He was a nut on jazz. Did he make money at it? <laughs> I guess so. Well, thanks, baby. I'll stop around again sometime and take a look at your parlor. I'll spin a nice soft web. Mind if I take Martin with me? Mm, not if you bring back a picture of yourself. Maybe I'll just bring my camera. You can take it. Good. 
That's why I keep the room so dark. I like to develop things. I hated to leave, but my hair was on fire. She'd given me one lead. Martin was a musician of a sort, and sometimes he made money at it. I started to cross the street to catch another cab, and I was halfway there when I heard the car. That was an old trick. You drive by fast, open your door, and if anyone is in the way, he winds up with a face full of automobile. I picked myself up and thought about chasing him, but he was so far down the street, I couldn't even get the license number. I grabbed a bug-eyed cabbie and had him take me to local 802 of the Musicians' Union. I went in, and a little short guy with a twitch looked up at me from behind a big desk. Something I can do for you, Pop? Hmm. Bad twitch. Yeah, too much bop. Tell me, uh, do you know a Martin Rollins plays the sax? Has he got a card? He makes money. Then if he ain't, he better have. Let's see if he does, will you? I'm an old friend. I like to get in touch with him. You look like a cop. And I've got a shiny little badge. Oh, uh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll see what I can find. Cop, huh? Now look what you've done. you got me twitching more than ever. Between twitches, he found what I was looking for. Martin had just renewed his card. It didn't show a home address, but his mail was being sent to one of the swing joints on 52nd Street. I said thanks and left him in the middle of another twitch. I walked out on the sidewalk, looked at the long gray shadows stretching out from the tall buildings. One of them moved and ducked around a corner. I was being followed. Fingers, can I bother you for a minute? No, oh, but you can talk to me. Move well, in, lean on the piano. Yeah. You know a Martin Rollins? Well, sure, he blows here. Which one is he? He's off tonight, got a phone call and took off. You know where he lives? Yeah. Well, here's five. Come down and remember the address. What do you want him for? Here's another five. What difference does it make? Solid. It's got a little pad on 5th Street, 59 East. Now, don't put me on, Dad. You got troubles? I'm going to ask him. Crazy. I like his style. And when you got time, drop back and listen to the band. I don't think I could stand the altitude. <laughs> Crazy guy. I went out fast, and ten minutes later, I was standing in front of Martin Rollins' apartment. I tried my knuckles and waited. I tried again and put my ear to the door. I didn't hear it at first because it was so faint. A light scraping sound like rope over wood. I tried the door. I had been right on both counts. It was a rope and it was rubbing on wood. Brother Martin was making the sound effects, but he was doing it the hard way. He was on the other end of the rope, hanging by his neck. He was turning slowly like a weather vane in a soft breeze. The chair was tipped over at his feet, so I picked it up and sat down to think. I started to get up when something in my stomach jumped up and kicked my mind to high gear. I looked up at the dead man and what I saw through the suicide theory right out of the window. Sitting in the chair, my head was just on a level with his shoe tops. If he had used the chair to stand on, he would have still needed a ladder just to tie the rope to a beam. I've seen a couple of guys who hang themselves, but never one who jumped four feet in the air to do it. I shoved the chair under him just to make sure. He cleared it by a good foot. I started to think of all the people who had been connected with the case, and the phone rang. I knew Martin would have trouble answering, so I helped him out. Hello? Hello, Martin. Well, uh, he's tied up right now. Who is this? Well, hello, honey. Still collecting pictures? Uh Hello? Hello? Hmm. Antisocial. Well, Mr. Diamond, did you bring your camera? We'll play spend the bottle some other time. How did you know my name? But 
You gave it to me this afternoon. You're a bad liar, baby. And look out, I'm coming in. Now, wait a minute. I'm expecting someone. Well, if it's who I think it is, you better hide all the rope in the house. Now, move it out of the way. Oh, I... You heard from Collins yet? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, get out of here. Collins, Rollins' secretary, just killed Martin Rollins. He stretched his neck out so far, he started looking like an ad in National Geographic. What? Yes. He strangled him first, then stood on a chair and hung the body to a rafter. How do you know Collins did it? Because he forgot he's a foot taller than most guys. He gave Martin a boost and left him hanging too high. What's that got to do with me? Well, I think Collins knew I'd come to you. I think he promised you the moon if you fingered Martin Rollins. He wanted to get Martin, but he wanted someone else to do it for him. He knew old man Rollins would remember you and tell me. You're crazy. Oh, well, we'll see. How much did Collins promise you? He didn't promise me a thing. You don't think he's going to let you go on breathing when he finds out the law is after him? You're the only hole in his story. Wait a minute. He just left Martin waiting for oxygen. He's probably on his way here right now. He didn't say anything about killing Martin. I want to get out of this mess. Now, that's better. Tell me everything you can. Well, he met me about three months ago at a party. We started to see each other. One day he told me he was... In some kind of trouble and asked me to help, and I said I would. He told me that he had been in a deal with Martin and that Martin had gone to prison for it. So Martin had come back and wanted his share, is that yeah. it? Yes. He promised me 50... It all happened in the time it takes you to change your mind. He must have come in through the kitchen and started shooting. She went down like a diver with a bends and died on her face. He was trying for me when I jumped to one side and knocked over the only light burning in the room. He came close, but the flash of his gun gave me his position, and I threw enough lead to start a pipeline. He stumbled back into the kitchen, but he was dragging it. I heard him drop, and I moved in after him. The moonlight slanted down through one of the windows and splashed out on the hard floor. He was lying in it, on his back, like he wanted to get that far anyway. Don't try again, Collins. I still feel like shooting. Forget it. No reason to kill you now. Before you close your eyes, tell me something. Better make it quick. Why didn't you go out and get Martin Rollins yourself? Why hire me to find him? I didn't want anyone to know I was looking. You were the alibi. With Rollins dead and Martin a suicide, you'd swear Martin... Killed the old man. Because Rollin showed me the letter? You forged it? Yes. Yes, I shot Rollins and took the letter. And you planted that phony call to my office? Yes. Well, you nearly got away with it, Collins. You just forgot how tall you were when you hanged Martin. I thought sure Martin was the one who was trying to run me down. I'm a rotten driver. <laughs> how bad is it? You... Must have been a good cop. I caught all three. It should be raining out. Too nice a night to die. Not a cloud in the sky. Must be nice to look at. No. No, no. Keep standing up. You'll never see it from down here. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camel's costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test. Not just a puff, not just a sniff. Smoke camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a tribute to the men and women who have served our country, 
the makers of Camel cigarettes send gift cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week, the Camels go to veterans' hospitals, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Des Moines, Iowa. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Bowling Air Force Base, Washington, D.C. U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg as Virginia and Ted Osborne as Rollins. Tom Tully was Collins. Arthur Q. Bryan as Lieutenant Levinson and Wilms Herbert Otis. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert. The rich flavor and natural fragrance will tell you why P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite, and it's crimp cut to smoke cool and even. Get Prince Albert. It's the National Joy Smoke. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Can a cigarette be? Martha Tilton knows. H.C. Opinza knows. Vaughn Monroe knows. Yes, so many stars whose voices are their fortunes know it's camels for mildness. They choose camels because they know that camels get along with their throats. Make the 30-day camel mildness test and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, back here behind the socks. Careful the clothesline. I thought you were a detective. Oh, it's been a rumor for some time. Do you always do laundry in the office? Only on Fridays, honey. Uh, have a seat, Miss... Uh... Caspery. Well, I'll be right with you, Miss Caspery, as soon as I ring out these... Uh... <laughs> as soon as I ring them out. Go right ahead. Ah, ah there, there. Mm -hmm. All right, Miss Caspery, what can I do for you? It's Mrs. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what's it all about? My husband's going to kill me. Just frisky, has he got a reason? I... I found out he's been stealing from his partner, and when I faced him with it, he threatened me. Has he done anything more than threaten? Last night he went out and said he'd be gone for most of the evening. I... I went to bed, and about an hour later, I thought I heard somebody start upstairs. I got frightened and put pillows in my bed to make it look like I was sleeping. Was it your husband? I, I hid in my dressing room and watched, and then the door opened. It was too dark to tell, but I'm sure it was Phil. He came in and had a knife, and... He jabbed the pillow several times before he realized it it wasn't a real body. Couldn't he see? What do you mean? Well, there's some things a guy remembers. Even if you slept in a diving suit, you'd have a hard time hiding them. 
I like lots of covers. Mm, yeah. Now, you said Phil. Is uh, your husband Phil Caspery, the gambler? Yes, he and Max Bruno are in business together. Yeah, I know. The rooftop club. An iron claw with a cover charge. Uh, this morning, Phil said he was going away on a business trip, but I don't believe him. I'm afraid he's going to try killing me again. I want you to come around about eight and protect me. Here's a hundred dollars. That should cover it. Well, thanks, thanks. We might be up late. Maybe I should bring a good book. Oh, you'll strain your eyes. I like dark rooms. She got up then and walked slowly across the room like a big cat that had just finished eating its keeper. She stopped at the door and smiled a promise. I thought how Samson must have looked with a crew cut. Around one, I stopped in at the corner of 51st and Broadway for a bite of lunch. I killed part of the afternoon at the newspaper morgue, looking up the past files of one Phil Caspery. No convictions, but a bundle of arrests. The partnership with Max Bruno had earned some big type from time to time, and it seemed that Mr. Caspery's partner, Max, was quite a favorite with the local authorities. They'd nailed him twice. The first time, Uncle Sam sent him away for missing too many March 15th. The second was when I remembered. A rookie cop caught him with a gun. The parole board said shame and sent him up for the rest of the stretch. I went back to the apartment, dressed, and by 8 o'clock, I was ringing Mrs. Caspery's doorbell. The skin of my back crawled up and sat on my head. Whoever was dying was doing it the hard way. The door was locked, so I gave it the benefit of one of my shoulders. It was one of those heavy panel jobs with a will of its own, but finally the hinges got tired and gave up. I stumbled into the living room and came up with my thirty-eight. The screams had stopped, and I knew the only reason she had given up yelling was because she'd given up living. She was sprawled on the bed. But she didn't look anything like she had that afternoon. The killer had made sure of that. He'd used a knife. And now, she just didn't look like anything. I took a quick look around, found no one, so headed for the phone on the nightstand to call homicide. He must have been standing behind the door. When I turned, he gave it to me. Oh! He used something heavy enough to split a block of cement. It caught me across the nose, and I went down like an express elevator. While I was thinking the floor looked silly, trying to be a funnel, he nailed me again. Mm. Oh, and this time he pushed back the ceiling and let the night in. It's easy to relax after a good beating. You just bleed a little and grow weak. When someone tries to shake you out of it, it's like trying to sober a drunk that got mulled on cleaning fluid. Come on, Rick. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Snap out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Come on, kid. You're a mess. Oh, I'm stuck in the confetti. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. We have a party or something? Yeah, it looks that way. Wake up. You're still running around with the squirrels. Oh, oh my. Take a look at that, uh, that bed, Walt. If I appear untidy, it makes up for things. We cleaned it off. Now try and sit up. The ambulance will be here in a minute. Oh, well, get me a bat, will you? If I can find the guy who crowned me, I'll give you another customer. We got him outside, but I can't say I blame him. And who you got? Caspery. He says you knocked off his wife. Uh, what? He called us. Said hmm. he came home, found the body, and found you tiptoeing through the corpses. Yeah. Well, maybe he told you his wife came to see me today and gave out with a hundred bucks to protect her from him. No, as a matter of fact, he didn't. Well, then don't stand there on your swollen bunion, Walt. He's got me in line for a murder rap, and I don't like it. Don't blame you. Otis, bring in Mr. Caspery. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get in there, Caspery. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, take it easy. Here he is, Lieutenant. Caspery, Diamond here says he'll trade you a seat in the electric chair for his pushed-in face. I don't get it. Well, stick around, Phil. It'll catch up with you. Hold it a minute, Rick. I've had my face turned into an ad for taffy machines. I've got a right to glow. Look, why the chit-chat, Lieutenant? You've got your killer. That's what Diamond thinks. He says you fit the job. He's a dirty liar. Says your wife retained him to protect her from you. 
For why? She found out you were robbing your partner. You made one try for her, but you missed. You graduated, Diamond. Now you're a filthy liar. <coughs> All right, Rick, lay off. Okay, but I'd like to play some more. I want some answers. Then why don't you ask his partner? You know him, Max Bruno. All right. Let's all go see Max Bruno. A prowl car on Park Avenue is as conspicuous as an outside shower at a girls' camp. A crowd of people watch Sergeant Otis herd us into the back seat. Even if you aren't guilty, you feel like you've got the Chrysler building tucked away under your coat. I waved goodbye to a good-looking blonde with a poodle, and we took off for Bruno's office. It was an old building on 6th Avenue... And a goneth named Tony Garcia with a big bulge under his arm met us at the door. What is this, a convention? Hello, Tony. Tell Bruno I want to see him. The whole party or just you, Lieutenant? I'm enough. Sure. What's the matter, Casper? You look sick. You get tagged for speeding? You can tell, Max, it looks like he built the frame just the right size. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. We want to see Bruno. I'll find out if he's in. We know how to turn a doorknob. Look out. Okay. Oh, what is this? They wouldn't wait for an introduction. Hello, Max. What do you want, Levinson? A couple of questions. You in some kind of trouble, Casper? What do you think? Well, what are you getting rough with me for? Oh, are you dirty double Shut cross? up. Well, what's eating you, Diamond? Well, that's a good one. Now, look. You look, Max. And you keep your mouth shut, Casper. Not when I'm being framed. I'm going to yell my head off. Framed? Don't know nothing about it, huh, Max? I don't know what you're talking about. What is this? You framed me with that killing. Killing? Don't come on with that bitch. You know what I'm talking about. Hey, Casper, in the hall, Otis. Yes, sir. Uh, come on, Casper. I'll get you for this, Max. So help me. Come on, you. Will somebody tell me what's going on Rotten here? liar. I swear to you, if it's the last thing I Ow! do, I'll get What's happened to him? Max, you don't know? How am I supposed to know? Yes? Somebody just killed his wife. Tony. Yeah, boss? Wait in the hall. Yeah, boss. Casper knocked off his wife, huh? Well, he didn't say it was Casper. Look, Casper is my partner. At least he was. You split? Yeah, a couple of days ago. Why? I've been checking for a couple of weeks. casper has been holding out on the take. How'd you find out? His wife called me and told me. Oh, really? wonder why a wife would incriminate her husband like that. Yeah, she was scared, scared stiff. She found out what he was doing, and he told her he'd kill her. So she didn't know what to do. She called me. You knew her pretty well, huh? Not too well. She figured I could give her protection. I told her to see you, Diamond. Well, now, that was uh, very nice of you, but... What did you do about Casper when you found out he was robbing you? Told him to get out, have the money back by tomorrow morning. You tell him his wife tipped you about him? Are you crazy? Of course not. Said I'd been checking on him for a long time, that the books didn't tally. And what did he say? He said he didn't do it. What'd you expect him to say? Well, uh, are your books short? Two hundred thousand worth. Okay, Max, we'll be talking to you. Wife's dead, huh? About as dead as she can get. See you around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he told you how I've been robbing the till. Yeah, he did. Well, uh, let's go. What's the matter, Casper? You give it up? I'm framed. That's it. Let's go. Oh, by the way, what did you do with the murder weapon? Don't be surprised if you wake up some morning and find it sticking in your back. Get him out of here, Otis. Come on, you. Come on. <laughs> Well, well, Levinson did it again. Suspect in custody. What do you do for an encore? Sleep. You want me to drop you off an emergency? You could use a new face. No, I'll grab a cab and go to the apartment and clean up. Got to see Helen later. Okay, but stay off the streets. Somebody's liable to think you're dead and bury you. Oh, that's a good one. Night. Good night. Hey, cabby. Yeah? Where to, Mac? Holy yike. What's the matter? Oh, don't scare me like that. I got a nervous stomach. Why, well, they could sell your face for 60 cents a pound. Okay, so good housekeeping shuns me. 553 East 51st and step on it. What are you rolling the window down for? I want to see if it's still bleeding out. Thirty-five cents. There you are. Thanks. Let's take a ride instead. Huh? Don't move. 
Hey, what's going on? I told you we're going to take a ride. With a gun in my back I don't recognize, but you should have worn your other head, Tony. Move. <laughs> okay, okay. What's the matter? Doesn't Max give you enough to eat? <laughs> That's because I don't think you're funny. All right, all right. You're Tony Garcia and you make people bleed. Right, boy. Hold it. Now get in the car. You're bending the suit. Get in. You drive. Okay, but I'm a better pedestrian. Where to? Washington Bridge. I don't swim any better than I drive. You won't have to. You're out for high diving. Get going. Come on, come on, hurry it up. I thought we were going to a funeral. Hmm, that's a good one. What's it all about, Tony? Don't get nosy. Enjoy the ride. It's a new car. We rode like that. Tony sitting half-turned with a big forty-five in his fist, pointing right at my stomach. I drove south across town, trying to figure it out. Max Bruno's killer getting ready for a job. Why? Why me? What did I know that could get Max Bruno in trouble? Turn here. I turned and the Washington Bridge wasn't far away. I could see it stretched out across the river like a long coffin lined with bright candles. I eased down on the accelerator, and by the time we reached the bridge, I was doing a good 60. Slow down. We were near the toll gate. I took my foot off the accelerator and then jammed down on the brakes as hard as I could. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. You know, smoking is a day-in, day-out pleasure. We like each cigarette to taste as good as the one before. And we like the cigarette we smoke to be mild, to get along with our throats for a good long time. So it's good sense to test a cigarette over a period of time, not just a puff of this cigarette or a sniff of that. Yes, make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough test. Smoke only camels for 30 days as you normally smoke, and you'll see how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. You'll see how mild camels are week after week. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's real proof of cigarette mildness. Make your own camel 30-day test, the sensible test, and see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. We had hit the bridge railing and stopped cold. The steering wheel had caught me in the stomach. I opened my mouth to make my lungs work. It was like sucking air through a bent straw. I didn't know how long I sat there before I finally made it, but a slow, dripping sound made me remember Tony and look over. He was halfway through the windshield, and the dripping wasn't a broken radiator. His life was running out all over the hood. I got out of the car before the guards got to it. I had to have time to figure the whole thing out, and I didn't want to hang around for a lot of long explanations. I walked until I lost the crowd that was collecting. I took in long breaths of fresh air until my head cleared, then spotted an empty cab heading back to town, flagged it, gave the cabbie the address of the rooftop club. I needed answers. 
And the best person to give them to me was Max Bruno. Late edition, get your late edition here. Read all about it. Read all about the Casper murder. Woman found dead in her apartment. Husband held for murder. Hey, boy, boy, paper. Yes, sir. Gee, what happened to your face? I shaved with a rake. Yeah? Gee, that's pretty funny. Holy. What's the matter? This picture. That's the dame was knocked off tonight. Caspery dame. Oh, so that's it. Huh? Here's a buck, thanks. Wow. Take my advice, mister. See your analyst. You'll get rid of them bells. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, did you get to 415 at the George Washington Bridge? Yeah, about ten minutes ago. Tony Garcia ran into the bridge railing. Some other guy with him. How'd you hear about it, Rick? Well, I was the other guy. What? Yeah, Tony was going to show me the bottom of the river. Are you nuts? Not at all, no. And have you seen the evening papers? No. Well, there's a picture of Mrs. Casperi on the front page. So what? Well, so this. The girl in the picture isn't the same girl who came into my office this afternoon. Well, who was she? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, Well, Rick. well, no, no, no. Don't you get it? That's why Tony was supposed to gun me tonight. No, I don't get it. Oh, Walt, somebody wanted to frame Phil Casperi. They sent a girl to my office posing as Mrs. Casperi. So I'd swear she suspected that Phil was going to kill her. When I found the wife dead, she was cut up so bad I couldn't tell the difference. Well, then why kill you? To prevent what's just happened. Get me out of the way before I saw the evening papers. Then Max Bruno was lying about Caspery taking the money. Sure. There had to be a motive, so he cooked up the story about Mrs. Caspery calling him and telling him about Phil and the money. Then Bruno's our man. Oh, Walt, you're such a good boy. I knew you'd get it. Check your hat, sir. Maybe I'd better throw it in the door first. Uh, give me a pack of camels. Yes, sir. Who's running the place for Mr. Bruno? Mr. Caspery, but he isn't in yet. Well, depends on what you're talking about. How's the floor show? It's all right, if you got an imagination. Hmm. You know, you better keep moving. You'll catch cold in that get-up. Oh, well, don't let it fool you. The bustle's really a hot water bottle. I went in and sat at the bar... The dance floor was in the other room, but you could see it through the long glass windows. I was sitting there trying to figure my next move when the floor show started. line of cuties came out, the hat check girl was wrong. You didn't need an imagination. They were wearing just enough to make a bathing suit look like a sleeping bag. They tripped over each other getting off, and the lights went dim, and a white spot circled the piano. She came out in a green satin evening gown. I've seen grapes with looser skins. I didn't know what time it was. She knew what time it was. She was pretty good, too. But she was better this afternoon in my office when she told me she was Mrs. Caspery. I got up and went back to the hat check girl with a warm bustle. Maybe you need a shot. Even the old ones stick around for the last show. Honey, where can I find that singer's dressing room? I thought you looked healthy. Uh-uh, Mr. Bruno wouldn't like it. Well, maybe we don't let Mr. Bruno in on it. Oh, ten bucks. You'll have to shove bamboo under my nails before I talk. She told me how to find the singer's dressing room. I thanked her and gave her a pat on the... You know, it was a hot water bottle. I walked by the bar again and listened while she poured it on. I've heard singers with better voices, but this one had the difference. She went into the last few bars, and I headed for her dressing room. I wanted to get there before she did. And unless that green satin gown was a breakaway, she didn't figure for an encore. 
I got in and sat down to wait. It was a quick minute before she showed up. Down, do oh, da, 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 shut up. You're flat. Oh, you get out of here. Go on, get out. Now, relax, baby. I got something to say. You want to listen or do you want to get shoved around? You just try it. I'll get some of Max's boys to let the air out of your muscles. Open your mouth and you'll be tripping on your teeth. I... Get away from that door and sit down. Not until you get your eyes full of fingernails. You little... <gasps> now, get this. I don't like marking up dames' complexions, but you're making it easy. Who sent you up to my office? Was it Max? Why don't you ask him? He's good at answers. Well, so was his boy, Tony. He got dead trying to figure it out. Maybe you'd like to guess. Uh, wait a minute, Diamond. One scream from me and everybody in the joint will be in here on your back. Honey, honey, if you open your mouth, I'll shove your foot in it. Uh, if, if I tell you... Do I get squared with the law? You're an accessory before the fact. I can only give you a head start. Just give me long enough to find a healthy climate. Now, you're killing time. Come on. I want to know who built you up to fit Mrs. Caspery. Was it Max Bruno? All right. It was Max. Phil found out he was holding out in the gambling take. So he dissolves the partnership by killing Mrs. Caspery, making Phil the patsy. Neat, huh? Yeah. Like a sack full of brains. Go on. Answer it. Who is it? Open up, baby. It's me. Max, look out. Diamond's in here. Sorry, baby, but twice makes me a punching bag. I didn't want to hit her, but it was the only way to keep her tongue in. She dropped like a wet wash in an earthquake, and I jumped to the door. Max was halfway down the hall. He had a gun in his hand, and he used it. The slug threw up the wall by my ear, and before I could try my luck, he was around the corner. I thought about the hole his Luger had made, and I wondered why I was still chasing him. I turned the corner and found myself in the bandstand. Max turned fast and tried again. I was across the crowded dance floor and the panic busted loose. What's going on here? I shoved aside a drunk who thought it was the 4th of July and went to the bar like I needed the exercise. Dead man's got a gun! Your own. Max was nearly to the front door when he turned around for another shot at me. He didn't see the little hat check girl standing behind him with her arms full of coats. He backed right into her, and they both went down together. Max stumbled up, tangled, and on a sordid wardrobe. He squeezed first, but he was wearing too many coats, and he missed again. I didn't miss. Max doubled up like a tired ice bag and got himself a face full of carpet. He was pretty dead. The hat check girl looked at me for a minute and leaned over to Max. She said something that endeared her to me forever. Check your gun, Mr. Bruno. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. In repeated surveys, the brand named most is Camel. Yes, according to these surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camels' costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day Camel test, and see how enjoyable a cigarette can be. See for yourself why people say, once a Camel smoker, always a Camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test, then you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, it's a pleasure for me to make this weekly announcement, ladies and gentlemen, because each week the makers of camels send gift cigarettes to a most deserving group of people servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Fargo, North Dakota, and Alexandria, Louisiana. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see.
Tonight's Adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Wilms Herbert. Men, whether you buy the handy pocket tin or the big one-pound tin of Prince Albert, you're in for real smoking joy. P.A.'s Choice Tobacco has a rich taste and delightful natural aroma. It's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. And it's crimp cut for smooth, even, cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around ten o'clock, I left the Cafe Tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. But before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> I made a dry run down the boulevard Barkeel, and sure enough, the stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. Uh, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? <sighs> Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then. Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend, but very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? You have the dough with you? Certainly not. There's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Uh, shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan, at the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. 
Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Moody, Moody. Yeah, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work nights. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. I always wants to know what happened. What oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, no, that's Morgan. Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosions, salvaging operation... Of coast of Rossell Hard. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. <laughs> no, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Uh, why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tornay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tornay was arranging for me to give someone a massage uh, at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? i got reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! <laughs> I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Jordan. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Yes. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fedor Brahms. Well, nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan, but I can guarantee you he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms on top. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? I'm sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Mala wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. 
But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yeah, a few. Oh, oh what are these? Well, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's, maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter, and it read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address, 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh. Please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes. Everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. Shh. I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild, and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier had mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium. And Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? The telephone book. Uh, same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Yeah. Uh, me and Philip Tony, my bodyguard. We've already met twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside our phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three? Well, count them. 
Beta Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, Maybe you're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe I better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I've... I'm beginning to see what you mean. Seems there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent of your promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. Will you hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there? Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. <clears throat> yeah. Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm gonna show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs trying to decide what I was going to tell fate of Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough... I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut, and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator, and we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there, there he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man. He rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I am afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He is missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my doll. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look them up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three-thumb you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminate. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, Jordan? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. 
Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open air market on Farnan Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I gotta find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. <laughs> I went to the open-air market on Ferran Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Jordan! I'm coming in, Tournier. Yes, yes, of course. I I thought you were in jail. Well, weren't we all? There, uh, there is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd start leveling with me, Tournier. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky. But I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. John Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus, Fader, and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Russell Hud. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fader Brahms again, or Svensson, or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fader Brahms. Sure I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Oh, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck, and I heard oars fading into the fog. It was Angus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get him together. You you know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner, and I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. It wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Oh, uh, Sam Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got... Uh... What, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Sika and Elmo Dar in half an hour, I'll produce them. Jordan, go home and go to bed. Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, Jordan. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. <laughs> Sam was in no cooperative mood. 
But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it. A quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. A pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Zubaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, the Sharon again. Why here? We, we, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. Feather Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, Fader of Brahms. They're all the same man. Oh. Uh -huh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes. Make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Maury. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Maury, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Maury, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, oh no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Jordan, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. 
Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan, and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> I had spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. A guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front pay phone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the pay phone? Oh, shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh, and there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? Uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Oh, especially... Now listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Tom and King. Tom and King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Enough, sir. I will show you what I think of the cafe tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin. Now we go bye bye. Come on. Stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar, out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine. I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. 
Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I've forgotten about you. I am a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, uh, Willoughby, told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh. Well, uh, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I... sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, very, very. <laughs> uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hide behind every lamppost. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... Uh, if you'll be... excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk, and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one in sight except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. Hey, hey, hey Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you got to remember. I left you here to watch the money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. Then I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. We'll have a look. What do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had to look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Dreckel, the Cairo police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Greco. Where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. One moment. I must make a full report. Now. How much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but If somebody... you please, I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you, Mr. Buyer. Now, if you'll just Now, leave... Mr. Jordan, did you strike No, I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch, that... I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Oh? Oh, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. It is not at all cooperative. What? Uh, so? Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. Yes, I will handle everything at once. Of course. Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? Well, don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, oh, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino, shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan? Here you are, Greco. 
And you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? She has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Hey. Ah, another gun, George. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Ah, two ships missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. So planned if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances, you, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. <laughs> Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour each Sunday evening is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> my way to an ace high straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack who didn't wait for me to answer. A loud Egyptian named King and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my straight. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic recently fired turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sabaya sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, sir? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the Friday yes. phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tom and King started a phony one-man riot in the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tom and King. And the third? Well, after I got rid of King... <sighs> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, Jordan. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Sabai speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught a mouse, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. I'm surprised. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you for the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam had changed his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen. As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Hey, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. I could phrase it a different way. See, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things on my mind. Like murder? Please, worries. 
Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. Mm, it's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. Would uh, 100 pounds be sufficient? 100? That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Right, well, then. Uh... Give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell Noah? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, Maxie. Uh, oh, hi, Rock. Watch your 13. Come on up, watch it. See? 13. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Of course, something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fish to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know it. Ace is dead? Yeah. 23 this time, watch it. What do you know about the killing? I tell you, Rock, uh, watch it now. 23 coming up. 23, just like I said. Come on, what do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who are his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He spent her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband show up. You know what the husband's name was? It's the, uh... No, I forgot. Four this time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King, that's it. How'd you know? I didn't. Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Thing. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back-to-back -back with a King. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of fiascas, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. <laughs> You like my rock? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thing of it. Ah, no, not interested, sorry. I see you bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother me. Effendi, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait, wait, come back. By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. And across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. By, by Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this, uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but he had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No, no, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque Al-Azhar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm I was wrong. It was the Ahmed Ibn Tulun. Stupid of it, though. Oh, but think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. 
You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. Well, I found Tom and King's address. A large brownstone modern apartment house. But King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe Tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, surveys. Ah, just a minute. You said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten dollar beer. Ten dollar beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace eye straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. Then I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabi at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. Who is it? The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I can't... Sorry, Blue Eyes, i got to talk to you. Who did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight, it's... Oh, well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but uh, you see, my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh, why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? <sighs> to, uh, to find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. You had better go, Mr. Jordan. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Uh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? A camel stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer... I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry-up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam is Rocky. Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King at 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? Uh, this is news, Jordan. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain Sam, that? if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time. Still following me. The veiled native woman who limped. But this time I figured I knew who she was. She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cards collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. This time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step, I picked up another native bent on mayhem. There we went. The veiled woman, followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims, right through the bizarre pirate.
Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top-flight adventure mysteries. Rocky Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler. Top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the beggars and the snake charmers and the street vendors of the crowded bazaar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path. I pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and 30 more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let go! Let go of me! Turn around! Turn around and face me! No! No! My veil! Coming off quick and everything with it! Yeah! Look her over, folks. She's not a native, and she's not a woman. He's Uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, well, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. Oh, this is most convenient. <laughs> I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Miss, and what's Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. Natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The husband doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. Oh, no, but... So you I... killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angels, planning to kill her after I left. You're a little slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Well, just to you... clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen. Your shy little nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. <laughs> I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, Nelson, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh. What? Oh, Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam me. Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail? No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I told you. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dragged him to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Sabaya started pounding on the front door. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open window. Gordon, you here. Where's Milton Queen? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Draco, get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Draco. Uh, uh, all right. Don't, don't worry, Draco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about Angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. She's passed out. I must have stepped on a sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She's suffering only mild shock. You know, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it. Rocky 
Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Kearns, Johnny. Great Plains Guarantee. Oh, hi, Ralph. Johnny, you're 52 years old. I am? Eight months ago, you married a lovely 27-year-old girl. Now I'm with you. A month later, you took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on a chief of police's salary. I did, huh? And who did I name as beneficiary? Your beautiful wife. Who else? So? So, three days ago, you were shot to death. Eh, I had a feeling it wasn't going to last. And 24 hours later, your wife files a claim on the policy. My friends tried to warn me she was fast. Well, there's the setup. What do you think? The same thing you probably do. In that case, you got just 56 minutes to catch the plane. The town is Greensport, Missouri. And watch yourself. What do you mean? From what I hear, Johnny, it's a wide-open town. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the open town matter. Item one. $84.60, $84.60, transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greensport, and taxi to the Townhouse Hotel. I was hoping for a chance to shower and change, look around long enough to get my bearings, and then edge into the case gradually. But it didn't work out that way. The case was already there and waiting for me, right in the lobby of the hotel. All dressed up in a shiny black suit, squeaky black shoes, and a neater-than-neat little black bow tie. Oh, am I glad to see you, Mr. Dollar. Are you? Oh, indeed, yes, I am. I just breathed a great big sigh. Relief, you know, when I heard you tell the clerk your name. That's how I know you're you, you know. You mean there's been some doubt? But of course you'll want to know I'm me, so I... well, I'll swear I had a card in one of these pockets. Well, uh, maybe you could just tell me who you are, Mr. Uh... Uh, Potzer, Averill P. Potzer. I ought to have a card, though, to make it more official. Oh, never mind. I believe you. I must have given them all away. Don't worry, though. I'll get some more printed to see that you have one before you leave. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Potts. And now I... Oh, wait, Mr. Dollar. You want to talk to me, of course. Will I? Yes. I'm the agent here for the Great Plains Guarantee Company. I'm the one that sold that policy to the fellow that's dead. Oh, so that's it. Of course. (laughs) He wasn't dead then, you understand. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Feeling pretty lively, as a matter of fact, but with a new young wife and all that. I imagine so. But now Uh, just... Mr. Dollar... You've got to do something about that woman. Oh? Oh, she's driving me crazy. She wants her money, she says. $50,000. And she seems to think I'm carrying it around in my pocket. She's, uh, kind of anxious, huh? I'll tell you how anxious. Chief Blake was shot about two in the morning. And at three that afternoon, Marty, that's Mrs. Blake, was down at my office after a claim form. Yeah, I understand it was sent airmail special delivery. Well, she insisted on it. Made me take it straight to the post office as soon as she'd signed it. Pretty cold-blooded about it, huh? (laughs) Well, I've heard Marty Blake called a lot of different things in this town at different times, but never (laughs) cold-blooded. You follow me? I, uh, think I'm ahead of you. You know what I mean, all right, when you meet her. I can hardly wait. Man, oh man, wow. Item two, a dollar and fifteen cents taxi to the suburban home of Edgar Blake, former chief of police of Greensport, now deceased. On the strength of Potzer's description of the widow, I added a shave to the shower and change, and I hoped I looked a little fresher than I felt. The house was a rambling two-story job set back from the street. Well-kept shrubbery, nice lawn, quiet neighborhood, and plenty expensive. I wondered how Blake had been able to afford it. I was halfway up the walk when a man came out the front door. He wavered down the steps, then stopped and waited for me, rocking slightly on his heels. A copper. I can tell him a block away. You're a copper, right? Wrong. Private eye, maybe? No. Insurance investigator. 
Insurance. That's what I just asked her about. And you know what she did? Oh, threw you out, probably. Right. Said I was drunk. Oh, ridiculous. That's exactly what I said. Ridiculous, I told her. Ridiculous. But you know something? She was right, I am. No, I can hardly believe it. Well, it's a fact, though. At least a little bit. My name's Crayley, Joe Crayley. I'm a reporter. Greensport Daily Herald. Johnny Dollar. Hiya, Joe. Insurance, huh? And he did have some, or you wouldn't have had any reason to be here. She was lying. No comment. Who's a beneficiary? <laughs> Still no comment. It's her, of course. Little smarty Marty. His ever loved little wife. How much is she going to make on the deal? Ah, uh, sorry, Joe. I... No comments. All right, let her lay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell me something, Joe. Uh, suppose I want a little action. Want to get into a poker game while I'm here. Find a crap table, maybe. Any idea where I could go? Sure. Anyone a half a dozen different... <laughs> How long you been in town, Johnny? Mm, about an hour. You wised up pretty fast, didn't you? Well, I didn't know it was a secret. The town is wide open, isn't it? It is. But I wouldn't go around poking into things if I were you. A guy could get hurt, you see what I mean? Maybe a guy did get hurt. Blake, you mean? What makes you think so? Well, if somebody wanted to keep the rackets going, the police chief would be a natural target, wouldn't he? Not necessarily. Meaning? No comment. What was Blake's salary, Joe? Six thousand a year. On six thousand, he was living in a house like this? Wait till you see Marty. She's even more expensive. So that's why Greensport is wide open. The police chief was in. No comment. Yeah. Well, he's out now, that's for sure. Uh, Joe, I'll probably be talking to you later, so... Yeah, yeah, do that. Just ask anybody. Joe Crayley, the alcoholic that works for the Herald. I'm always around somewhere... Well, how do you do? Mrs. Blake? Yes, what can I do? Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the insurance company. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Come this way. I'm a little surprised, really. I hardly expected them to pay off so promptly. Well, in that case, you won't be too disappointed. Disappointed? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't come here to pay you anything. Then why did you come? I'm a special investigator, Mrs. Blake. What does that mean? The company would like a little more information about your husband's death. I told them all about it in the claim I sent to them. I know, but sometimes oh, it's necessary. so that's the pitch. They're trying to squirm out of it. Why do you say that? Because they sent you here, that's why. And because they always do. I know how those companies operate. Oh, you've had experience with them before. No, I haven't. But I'm a real smart girl, Mr. Dollar. And I know a fast shuffle when I see it coming. And a smart girl ought to know better than to yell before she's hurt. Why else would they send out a special investigator? I told you why. They want some more information. What information? What is it they want to know? The details, that's all. Exactly how your husband was killed. I told them all that in the claim. I know. He was look. shot to death with his own gun right here in his own house. Do you mind showing me how it happened? Oh, for the love. Now, look, there won't be any payment until I file my report, Mrs. Blake. All right. You win. When you go after something, you really go after it, don't you? Well, that's what I get paid for. Oh. And what about something you personally wanted? Well, that would depend on how bad I wanted it. I see. Would you like a drink? No, 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 thanks. You won't mind if I have one. Right ahead. Looking at you. Right. Now, uh, if you wouldn't mind... Yeah, I know. Stick to business. All right, come on. Happened over here, by the stairway. Mm -hmm. I see. Right here. This is where he fell. This is where he died. His gun was lying on the floor beside him. Middle of the night, wasn't it? About two in the morning, we'd been asleep. Why did he come downstairs? I heard a noise of some kind. It woke me up. I shook Ed and told him about it, and he came down to see what it was. He was armed? No. His gun was there on the hall table by the front door. Is that where he usually left it? Yes. Whenever he came home, he always took it off and put it there on the table. Then anyone who knew him would probably know they could find it there. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So uh, what happened? Well, like I said, it went on downstairs and I walked out of the bedroom into the hall. Were there any lights on? Well, not down here. I turned on the hall light upstairs. Did you hear your husband say anything? No, all I heard was the shots. 
four or five of them. Then I heard someone run out the front door. And what did you do? I called out to Ed, but he didn't answer. Then I ran downstairs and found him lying here, dead. Did you get a look at the prowler or whoever it was? No, it was too dark. And he ran out as soon as he fired the shots. How did he get into the house? The detective said he forced the lock on the front door. I guess that was the sound that woke me up. And then he used a gun that was inside the house that he may or may not have known was inside the house. That's what the police figure. All right. What do you figure, Mrs. Blake? The same thing, I guess. I don't know any more about it than they do. I thought you might have some theory of your own. I'll string along with them. Uh Uh-huh. Just an accidental prowler who got panicky and snatched up a gun that happened to be lying around handy. I guess that's about it. Any idea at all who the prowler might have been? Of course not. Do you suppose it could have been somebody besides a prowler? Somebody who came here for the express purpose of murdering your husband? It had a lot of enemies, of course, because of his job. What about his friends, Mrs. Blake? What do you mean? Do you suppose one of his friends could have done it? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been admiring your watch. Hmm, real nice. Set in diamonds, emerald band. Must be worth around $2,000. Very nice. Well, thank you. And this house, the furniture, that car out there in the driveway. On a police chief's salary, Mrs. Blake. I... I wouldn't know anything about Ed's financial affairs. Who runs the rackets here in Greensport? What rackets, Mr. Dollar? Was your husband in on them? Sure you won't have that drink? All right, Mrs. Blake, play it your way. I thought the insurance company was probably convinced that I was the one who killed him. They're not convinced of anything yet. But they think I did it, don't they? No, but they think 24 hours is pretty fast for a grief-stricken widow to shoot a claim into the office. I am not grief-stricken, Mr. Dollar. So I've noticed. Do I have to be? Is there some clause in the policy? No, you don't have to be. (laughs) You think I did it, don't you? I think there's a strong chance you did. Then I think you need a little straightening out. I'm listening. Uh Uh-uh. Why should I make it easy for you? Go see Dave Sherman. Talk to him. Dave Sherman? The city attorney. See what he says before you get all lathered up. See if he thinks I'm guilty. All right, I will. And then we'll talk. And if you're nice enough to me, maybe I'll even cooperate. You never know. Do you? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's very gratifying, gratifying encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Tomorrow, a smash in the teeth opens things up and an airtight alibi gets air-conditioned with bullets. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dow. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dave Sherman, Mr. Dollar, city attorney. Oh, yes. I've been trying to reach you, Mr. Sherman. Yes, so my office tells me. It's the uh, Ed Blake case, I suppose. That's right. Well, I've already told my secretary to make all the records available. It's not the records I'm mainly interested in, Mr. Sherman. I want to talk to you personally. Oh, why? Because I've been informed that you're able to furnish an alibi for my number one suspect. Marty Blake, huh? That's right. Who informed you, Mr. Dollar? Marty Blake. Oh, the lovely widow herself. Right. Well, I guess we'd better have a talk. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes, if you're dead set on lighting a fuse in this town, I may as well give you some matches. 